Project management is highly sought after across industries. Wherever there are projects, there is a need of qualified and skilled project management professionals. According to Project Management Institute, it is expected that there would be around 22 million new project management job openings through 2027. Thus, project managers are indeed needed in a wide variety of industries. Hello everyone and welcome to this session. You are currently watching an Edureka project management full course video. Well, I'm certain by the end of this video, you will have a thorough understanding about project management all the way from theory to practical applications. Now, if you love watching videos like these, then subscribe to Edureka's YouTube channel and click the bell button to never miss out any updates from us. Also, if you want to learn more about project management after watching this session or wish to obtain Edureka's project management certification course, then please see the link in the description below. Now let's begin with our agenda where we'll have a brief overview of what we will cover in this project management full course video. Well, we will start with the project management basics where we will learn what project management is and why should we learn it. And we will also cover the very basics that you must and should know about project management. Next, we will get introduced to some project management certifications after which we will start with our curriculum with project scope management. Now it's time to delve deep into the technical concepts of project management. We'll start with the project time management, after which we will see what is project cost management followed by project quality management. Next, we will go ahead with understanding project resource management. Once this is done, we will then get introduced to project communication management and project risk management. Following that, we will look at project procure management and learn about project stakeholder management. After all that, we will then learn about agile project management. Well, we really do hope that this session helps you secure a job in the industry. So to promote this intention, the first thing we will focus on is a career in project management and getting certified. And the best certification is PMP certification. At last, we will also cover some of the best practices of project manager before heading over to project manager interview questions with answers. So stick till the end. Now let's begin with our session with our first topic. Introduction to project. Firstly, let us understand what is a project. People have been undertaking projects since the earliest days of organized human activity. The hunting parties of our prehistoric ancestors were projects. Let me explain this with an example. There were temporary undertakings directed at the goal of obtaining meat for the community. Large complex projects have also been with us for a really long time. The pyramids and the Great Wall of China were in their day of roughly the same dimensions as the Apollo project to send men to the moon. We use the term project frequently in our daily conversations. For example, in a conversation, anyone could say my main project for this weekend is to straighten out the garage. Going hunting, building pyramids and fixing faucets all share certain features that make them projects. There are many written definitions of a project. All of them contain some key elements. For those looking for a formal definition of a project, the Project Management Institute defines a project as a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or even a result. The temporary nature of projects really indicates a definite beginning and end. The end is reached when the project's objectives have been achieved or when the project is terminated because its objectives will not or cannot be met or when the need for the project no longer exists. So a project also has distinctive attributes that really distinguish it from ongoing work or business operations. They are basically very temporary in nature. They are not an everyday business process and definitely have a start date and end date. This characteristic is extremely important because a large part of the project effort is really dedicated to ensuring that project is completed at the appointed time. To do this, schedules are created showing when tasks should begin and end they can last for minutes, hours, days, months, or even years. Projects really exist to bring about a product or service that really hasn't existed before. 
in this sense a project mostly is extremely unique unique means that this is new that has never been done before maybe it's been done in a very similar fashion before but never exactly in the same way so let me explain this point with an example the ford motor company is in the business of designing and assembling cars each model that ford designs and produces can be considered a project the models obviously differ from each other in their features and are marketed to people with various needs an suv serves a different purpose from that of a luxury car the design and marketing of these two models are unique projects however the assembly of the cars is considered an operation that is a repetitive process that is followed for most makes and models in contrast with projects operations are ongoing and repetitive they involve a work that is continuous without an ending date with the same process repeated to produce the same results the purpose of operations is really to keep the organization functioning while the purpose of project is to really meet its goals and conclude therefore operations are ongoing whereas projects are unique and temporary i hope the difference between operations and projects are clear to you a project obviously has goals and objectives that are supposed to be accomplished it is these goals that really drive the project and all the planning and implementation efforts undertaken to achieve them sometimes projects end when it is determined that the goals and objectives cannot be accomplished or when the product or service of the project is no longer needed and the project is cancelled now that we've clearly discussed what is a project and also have mentioned the differences between project and operations let's move on and check out the project characteristics so when considering whether or not you have a project in your hand there are some things to keep in mind firstly you'll have to question yourself ask is it a project or an ongoing operation second if it is a project who are the stakeholders and third question you'd ask yourself is what characteristics really distinguish this endeavor as a project project has three characteristics firstly as i've already mentioned before projects are temporary in nature that is they have a definite start and end point okay second thing is projects are completed when the project goals are achieved or it is determined the project is no longer viable so once the end point is reached the project is considered done the third one is projects are unique that is it is attempting to achieve something new now a successful project is one that meets or exceeds the expectation of the stakeholders consider the following scenario the vice president of marketing approaches you with a fabulous idea he wants to set up kiosks in local grocery stores as mini offices these offices will offer customers the ability to sign up for car and home insurance services as well as make their bill payments he believes that the exposure in grocery stores will increase awareness of the company's offerings he told you that senior management has already cleared the project and he will dedicate as many sources to this as he can he wants the new kiosks in place in 12 selected stores in a major city by the end of the year finally he is assigned you to head up this project your first question should be is it a project this may seem very elementary but confusing projects with ongoing operations happens pretty often projects are temporary in nature they have definite start and end dates result in the creation of a unique product or service and are completed when the goals and objectives have been met and signed off by the stakeholders using these criteria and keeping these points in mind we can examine the assignment from the vice president of marketing to determine if it is really a project so the first question that you would ask yourself is is it unique yes because the kiosks do not exist in the local grocery stores this is a new way of offering the company's services to its customer base while the service the company is offering isn't really new the way it is presenting its service is the second question is does the product have a limited time frame the answer would definitely be yes the start date of this project is today and it will end by the end of next year it is definitely a temporary endeavor third one is is there a way to determine when the project is completed yes the key scores will be installed and the services will be offered from them so once all of these are installed and operating the project will come to an end the last question that you would ask yourself is is there a way to determine stakeholder satisfaction and again the answer is yes the expectations of the stakeholders will be documented in the form of requirements during the planning processes these requirements will be compared to the finished product to determine if it meets the expectations of the stakeholder now if the answer is yes to all of these questions 
then we have a project. Now that we've discussed its characteristics with an example, let's move ahead and check out the project constraints. On any project, you will definitely have a number of project constraints that are competing for your attention. Some of them are cost, scope, quality, risk, resources, and time. Cost is the budget approved for the project, including all necessary expenses needed to deliver the project. Within organizations, project managers have to balance between not running out of money and not underspending because many projects receive funds or grants that have contract clauses with a use it or lose it approach to project funds. Poorly executed budget plans can result in a last minute rush to spend the allocated funds. For virtually all projects, cost is ultimately a limiting constraint. Few projects can go over budget without eventually requiring a corrective action. The second constraint is scope. So scope is what the project is really trying to achieve. It entails all of the work involved in delivering the project outcomes and the processes used to produce them. It is basically the reason and the purpose of the project. The third constraint is quality. Quality is a combination of the standards and criteria to which the project's products must be delivered for them to perform effectively. The product must perform to provide the functionality expected, solve the identified problem, and deliver the benefit and values as expected. It must also meet other performance requirements or service levels, such as availability, reliability, and maintainability, and have acceptable finish and polish. Quality on a project is controlled through quality assurance, which is basically the process of evaluating overall project performance on a very regular basis to provide confidence that your project will satisfy the relevant quality standards. Then we have risk, which is defined by potential external events that will have a negative impact on your project if they occur. Risk refers to the combination of the probability the event will occur and the impact on the project if the event ever occurs. Now, if the combination of the probability of the occurrence and the impact on the project is very, very high, you should definitely identify the potential event as a risk and put a proactive plan in place to manage the risk. Then we have resources. You can think of resources too as a constraint, right? Because here you're required to carry out the project tasks. They can be people, equipment, facilities, funding, or anything else capable of definition required for the completion of a project activity. Finally, the most important constraint is time. Time is obviously defined as the time period allocated to you to complete the project. Time is often the most frequent project oversight in developing projects. This is reflected in missed deadlines and incomplete deliverables. Proper control of the schedule requires the careful identification of tasks to be performed and accurate estimations of the durations, the sequence in which they're going to be done and how people and other resources are to be allocated. Any schedule should take into account vacations and holidays. Now moving on, if you know the basics of project management, I'm sure you must have come across the term triple constraint, which traditionally consisted of only time, cost and scope. These are the primary competing project constraints that you have to be most aware of. The triple constraint is illustrated in the form of triangle to visualize the project work and see the relationship between the scope or quality, schedule or time, and cost or resource. Your project may have additional constraints that you must face and as the project manager, you will have to balance the needs of these constraints against the needs of the stakeholders and your project goals. Let me explain this with an example. If your sponsor wants to add functionality to the original scope, you will very likely need more money to finish the project, or if they cut the budget, you will have to reduce the quality of your scope. And if you do not get the appropriate resources to work on your project tasks, you will obviously have to extend your schedule because the resources you have take much, much longer to finish the work. You get the idea, right? The constraints are all dependent on each other. Think of all of these constraints as the classic carnival game of whack-a-mole. Each time you try to push one more back in the hole, another one pops out. The best advice here is to rely on a project team to keep these moles in place. Now that we have discussed constraints in detail, let us talk about must-have areas of expertise in a project team. Now by standards, we mean guidelines or preferred approaches that are not necessarily mandatory. In contrast, when referring to regulations, we mean mandatory rules that must be followed, such as government-imposed requirements through laws. 
it should go without saying that as a professional you are required to follow all applicable laws and rules that apply to your industry organization or even the project i'm sure you must be aware that every industry has some set of standards and regulations right knowing which ones really affect your project before you begin your work will not only help the project to unfold smoothly but it will also give you an opportunity for effective risk analysis some projects require specific skills in certain application areas application areas are made up of categories of projects that have common elements they can be defined by industry group like pharmaceutical financial etc department like accounting marketing legal etc even in technology like software development engineering etc or obviously management specialties like procurement research and development these application areas are usually concerned with disciplines regulations and the specific needs of the project the customer or the industry now let me explain this with an example most government agencies have specific procurement rules that apply to their projects that wouldn't be applicable in the construction industry The pharmaceutical industry is interested in regulations set forth by government regulators whereas the automotive industry has little or no concern for either of these types of regulations. You need to stay up to date regarding your industry so that you can apply your knowledge effectively. Today's fast-paced advances can leave you far behind quickly if you do not stay abreast of your current trends. and also having some level of experience in the application area you're working in will give you an advantage when it comes to project management while you can call in experts who have the application area knowledge it doesn't hurt for you to understand the specific aspects of the application areas of your project now that we have discussed the areas of expertise let's move ahead and understand the project environment so what would be the right environment for you to accomplish the goals that you've set for your project Now obviously there are many factors that really need to be understood within your project environment. At one level you need to think in terms of cultural and social environments that is people, demographics and education. The international and political environment is where you really need to understand about different countries, cultural influence etc. Then we move to the physical environment. Here we think about time zones. Think about different countries and how differently your project will be executed whether it is just in your country or if it involves an international project team that is distributed throughout the world in five different countries of all the factors the physical ones are the easiest to understand and it is the cultural and international factors that are often misunderstood and ignored how we deal with clients customers or project members from other countries can be very critical to the success of the project so let me take an example the culture of the united states values accomplishments and individualism Americans tend to be informal and call each other by first names even if having just met. On the other hand, Europeans tend to be more formal using surnames instead of first names in a business setting even if they know each other well. In addition, their communication style is much more formal than in the United States. And while they tend to value individualism, they also value history, hierarchy and loyalty. The Japanese on the other hand tend to communicate indirectly and consider themselves part of a group not as individuals. The Japanese value hard work and success as most of us do. How a product is received can be very dependent on the international cultural differences. For example, back in the 1990s when many American and European telecommunication companies were cultivating new markets in Asia, the customers cultural differences often produce unexpected situations western companies plan their telephone systems to work the same way in asia as they did in europe and the us but the protocol of conversation is very different right call waiting a popular feature in the west is considered impolite in some parts of asia this cultural blunder could have been avoided had the team captured the project environment requirements and involved the customer It is often the simplest things that can cause trouble since unsurprisingly in different countries people do things differently. Another example would be date formats, right? What day and month is 2-8-2019? Of course it depends where you come from. In North America it is February 8th while in Europe it is 2nd August. Clearly when schedules and deadlines are being defined it is most important that everyone is clear on the format used. Project managers in multicultural projects must appreciate the culture dimensions and try to learn relevant customs, courtesies and business protocols before taking responsibility 
for managing an international project. A project manager must take into consideration this various cultural influences and how they may affect the project's completion, schedule, scope and cost. Moving on to the next part of the session, we will be discussing about interpersonal skills. Last but not the least, you also have to bring the ability into the project to manage personal relationships and deal with personal issues as they arise. Here we are talking about your interpersonal skills. Project managers spend 90% of their time communicating. So this is one of the most important interpersonal skills, communication. This is why they must be good communicators, promoting clear, unambiguous exchange of information. As a project manager, it is your job to keep a number of people well informed. It is essential that your project staff know what is expected of them, what they have to do, when they have to do, and what budget and time constraints and quality specifications they're working towards. If the project staff members do not really know what their tasks are or how to accomplish them, then the entire project will grind to a halt. If you do not know what the project staff is or often is not doing, then you will be unable to monitor project progress. Finally, if you're uncertain of what the customer expects of you, then the project will not even get off the ground. Project communication can thus be summed up as knowing who needs what information and when and making sure they have it. All projects require sound communication plans, but not all projects will have the same types of communication or the same methods for distributing the information. For example, will information be distributed via mail or email? Is there a shred website or are face-to-face -face meetings required? The communication management plan documents how the communication needs of the stakeholders will be met, including the types of information that will be communicated, who will communicate them, and who will receive them. The methods used to communicate, the timing and frequency of the communication, the method for updating the plan as the project progresses, including the escalation progress and a glossary of common terms. The second one is influence. Project management is about getting things done. Every organization is different in its policies, modes of operations, and underlying culture. There are political alliances, differing motivations, conflicting interests, and power struggles. Here, a project management must understand all of the unspoken influences at work within the organization. The next obvious skill that you must have is leadership. Leadership is the ability to motivate and inspire individuals to work toward expected results. Leaders inspire vision and rally people around common goals. A good project manager can motivate and inspire the project team to see the vision and value of the project. The project manager as a leader can inspire the project team to find a solution to overcome perceived obstacles to get the work done. Moving on, we have motivation. Motivation is a constant process that the project manager must guide to help the team move toward completion with passion and a profound reason to complete the work. Motivating the team is accomplished by using a variety of team building techniques and exercises. Team building is simply getting a diverse group of people to work together in the most efficient and effective manner possible. This may involve management events as well as individual actions designed to improve team performance. Recognition and awards are a very important part of team motivations. They are formal ways of recognizing and promoting desired behavior and are most effective when carried out by the management team and the project manager. Consider individual preferences and cultural differences when using rewards and recognition. Some people do not like to be recognized in front of a group. Others really thrive on it. Then we have negotiation. Project managers obviously must be able to negotiate for the good of the project. In any project, the project manager, the project sponsor and the project team will have to negotiate with stakeholders, vendors and customers to really reach a level of agreement acceptable to all parties involved in the negotiation process. Then we finally have problem solving. It is the ability to understand the heart of the problem look for a viable solution, and then eventually make a decision to implement that solution. The starting point for problem solving is problem definition. Problem definition is really the ability to understand the cause and effect of the problem. This centers on root cause analysis. If a project manager treats only the symptoms of a problem rather than its cause, the symptoms will perpetuate and continue through the project life. Even worse, treating a symptom may result in a very huge problem. Now, for example, Increasing the ampere rating of a fuse in your car because the old ones keep blowing 
does not solve the problem of an electrical short that could result in a fire. Root cause analysis looks beyond the immediate symptoms to the cause of the symptoms, which then affords opportunities for solutions. Once the root of a problem has been identified, a decision must be made to effectively address the problem. Solutions can be presented from vendors, the project team, the project manager, or various stakeholders. A viable solution focuses on more than just the problem. It looks at the cause and effect of the solution itself. In addition, a timely decision is needed or the window of opportunity may pass and then a new decision will be needed to address the problem. As in most cases, the worst thing you can do is nothing. All of these interpersonal skills will be used in all areas of project management. Start practicing now because it's guaranteed that you will need these skills on your next project. Now let's move ahead and discuss the history of project management. In the history of project management, we can chart all the major developments and events in the discipline as far back as there are records. Although there have been some form of project management since early civilization, project management in the modern sense began in the 1950s. So let's start from way back to 2570 BC, when the Great Pyramid of Giza completed. The pharaohs built the pyramids and today archaeologists still argue about how they achieved this feat. Ancient records show there were managers for each of the four faces of the Great Pyramid, responsible for overseeing their completion. We know there was some degree of planning, execution and control involved in managing this project. Then in 208 BC, there was the construction of the Great Wall of China. Later still, another wonder of the world was built. Since the Qin Dynasty, construction of the Great Wall had been a large project. According to historical data, the labor force was organized into three groups soldiers, common people, and criminals. The Emperor Quinn ordered millions of people to finish this project. Then in 1917, we have the Gantt chart developed by Henry Gantt. One of the forefathers of project management, Henry Gantt is best known for creating his self-named scheduling diagram, the Gantt chart. It was a radical idea and an innovation of worldwide importance in the 1920s. One of its first uses was on the Hoover Dam project that was started later on in the 1931. Gantt charts are still in use today and form an important part of the project manager's toolkit. Moving on to 1956, we have the American Association of Cost Engineers that was formed. Early practitioners of project management and the associated specialities of planning and scheduling, cost estimating, cost and schedule control formed the AACE in 1956. It has remained the leading professional society for cost estimators, cost engineers, schedulers, project managers, and project control specialists ever since. American Association of Cost Engineers continued its pioneering work in 2006, releasing the first integrated process for portfolio, program, and project management with a total cost management framework. Then in the 1957, the critical path method was invented by DuPont Corporation. CPM is a technique used to predict project duration by analyzing which sequence of activities has the least amount of scheduling flexibility. DuPont designed it to address the complex process of shutting down chemical plants for maintenance and then with maintenance completed restarting them. The technique was so successful it saved the corporation $1 million in the first year of its implementation. Then in 1958, the, the program evaluation review technique was invented for the U.S. Navy's Polaris project. The U.S. Department of Defense's U.S. Navy Special Projects Office developed PERT as part of the Polaris Mobile Submarine Launch Ballistic Missile Project during the Cold War. PERT is a method for analyzing the tasks involved in completing a project, especially the time needed to complete each task and identifying the minimum time needed to complete the total project. In 1962, United States Department of Defense mandated the work breakdown structure approach. The U.S. Department of Defense created the WBS concept as part of the Polaris Mobile Submarine Launched Ballistic Missile Project. After completing the project, the DOD published the work breakdown structure it used and mandated the following of this procedure in future projects of this scope and size. WBS is an exhaustive hierarchical tree structure of deliverables and tasks that really need to be performed to complete a particular project. Later adopted by the private sector, the WBS remains one of the most common and useful project management tools. 
In 1965, the International Project Management Association was founded. IPMA was the world's first project management association, started in Vienna by a group as a forum for project managers to network and share information. Registered in Switzerland, the association is a federation of about 50 national and internationally oriented project management associations. Its vision is to promote project management and to lead the development of the profession. Since its birth in 1965, IPMA has grown and spread worldwide with over 120,000 members in 2012. Moving on to 1969, the Project Management Institute that is PMI launched to promote the project management profession. Five volunteers founded PMI as a non-profit professional organization dedicated to advance the practice, science and profession of project management. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania issued Articles of Incorporation for PMI in 1969, which signified its official start. During that same year, PMI held its first symposium in Atlanta, Georgia, and had an attendance of 83 people. Ever since then, the PMI has become best known as the publisher of a guide to the project management body of knowledge that is PMBOK. Considered as one of the most essential tools in the project management profession even today, the PMI offers levels of project management certification, certified associate in project management, and project management professional. We'll talk about PMP later on in the session. In 1975, Prompt Two method created by Simpac Systems Limited. Development of Prompt Two was in response to an outcry that computer projects were overrunning on time, estimated for completion, and original budgets. As set out in feasibility studies, it was not usual to experience factors of double, treble, or even ten times the original estimates. Prompt two was really an attempt to set down guidelines for the stage flow of a computer project. In 1979, the UK government central computing and telecommunications agency adopted the method for all information systems project. Also, in 1975, the Mythical Man Month essays on software engineering. Was released by Fred Brooks. So, in his book of software engineering and project management, Fred Brooks' central theme is that adding manpower to a late software project makes it later. This idea is called Brooks' law. The extra human communications needed to add another member to a programming team is much more than anyone ever expects. It naturally depends on the experience and sophistication of the human programmers involved and the quality of available documentation. Nevertheless, no matter how much experience they have, the extra time discussing the assignment, commitments, and technical details, as well as evaluating the results, becomes exponential as more people get added. These observations are from Brooks' experiences while managing the development of OS/360 at IBM. Then, in 1984, the theory of constraints was introduced by Dr. Eliyahu M. Goldratt in his novel *The Goal*. Theory of constraints is an overall management philosophy that is geared to help organizations continually achieve their goal. The title comes from the view that any manageable system is limited in achieving more of its goal by a small number of constraints, and there is always at least one constraint. The TOC process seeks to identify the constraint and restructure the rest of the organization around it by using five focusing steps. The methods and algorithms from TOC. Went on to form the basis of critical change project management. Then, in 1986, Scrum was named as a project management style. This was definitely the game changer. You must all be aware of Scrum. It is an agile software development model based on multiple teams working in an intensive and interdependent manner. In their paper, the new new product development game, Takeuchi and Nonaka named Scrum as a project management style. Later, they elaborated on it in the Knowledge Creating Company. Although Scrum is intended for management of software development projects, it can be used to run software maintenance teams or as a general project and program management approach. In 1987, a guide to the project management body of knowledge was published by PMI. So, first published by the PMI as a white paper in 1987, the PMBOK guide was an attempt to document and standardize. Accepted project management information and practices. The first edition was published in 1996, followed by a second one in 2000 and a third one in 2004.
the guide is one of the most essential tools in the project management profession today and has become the global standard for the industry. In 1989, earned value management leadership elevated to Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition. Although the earned value concept has been around on factor flows since the early 1900s, it only came to prominence as a project management technique in the late 1980s to early 1990s. In 1989, EVM leadership was elevated to the Under Secretary of Defense for Acquisition, thus making EVM an essential part of program management and procurement. In 1991, Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney canceled the Navy A-12 Avenger 2 program because of performance problems detected by EVM. The PMBOK Guide of 1987 has an outline of earned value management subsequently expanded on in its later editions. In 1989, Prince Method was developed from Prompt 2. Published by the UK government agency CCTA, projects in controlled environments became the UK standard for all government information systems projects. A feature of the original method, not seen in other methods, was the idea of assuring progress from three separate but linked perspectives. However, the Prince method developed a reputation for being too unwieldy, too rigid and applicable only to large projects, leading to a revision in 1996. In 1994, Chaos reported first published. The standardish group collects information on project failures in the information technology industry with the objective of making the industry much more successful than it already is, showing ways to improve its success rates and increase the value of IT investments. The Chaos Report is its biennial publication about IT project failure. In 1996, Prince 2 was published by CCTA. An upgrade to Prince was considered to be an order and the development was contracted out but assured by a virtual committee spread among 150 European organizations. Originally developed for information systems and information technology projects to reduce cost and time overruns, the second revision became more generic and applicable to any project type. In 1997, critical chain project management was invented. We've already discussed this. CCPM is based on methods and algorithms drawn from his theory of constraints introduced in his 1984 novel titled The Goal. A critical chain project network will keep the resources levelly loaded but will need them to be flexible in their start times and will switch quickly between tasks and task chains to keep the whole project on schedule. In 1998, PMBOK becomes a standard. The American National Standards Institute recognizes PMBOK as a standard in 1998 and later that year by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. Moving on to 2001, the Agile Manifesto was written. In February 2001, 17 software developers met at the Lodge Snowbird Utah Resort to discuss lightweight software development methods. Here they published the Manifesto for Agile Software Development to define the approach now known by the same name. Some of the Manifesto's authors formed the Agile Alliance, a non-profit organization that really promotes software development according to the Manifesto's 12 core principles. In 2006, Total Cost Management Framework was released by AACE International. Total Cost Management is the name given by AACE International to a process for applying the skills and knowledge of cost engineer. It is also the first integrated process or method of portfolio, program and project management. AACE first introduced the idea in the 1990s and published the full presentation of the process in the Total Cost Management Framework. Moving on to 2008, the fourth edition of PMBOK Guide released. The fourth edition of the guide continues the PMI tradition of excellence in project management with a standard that is easier to understand and implement with improved consistency and greater clarification. The updated version has two new processes, not in the previous version. And in 2009, a major Prince 2 revision was incorporated by Office of Government Commerce. A major revision has seen the method made simpler and more easily customizable, a frequent request from users. The updated version has seven basic principles that contributes to project success. Overall, the updated method aims to give project managers a better set of tools to deliver projects on time, within budget and with right quality. In 2012, the ISO 21500 2012 Guidance Standard for Project Management was released. 
In September 2012, to be exact, the International Organization for Standardization published ISO 21-500-2012 Guidance on Project Management. It is the result of five years' work by experts from more than 50 countries. The standard is designed for use by any organization, including public, private or community groups, and for any project, regardless of complexity, size and duration. In 2012, the fifth edition of PMBOK released. The fifth edition of Guide, published in December 2012, provides guidelines, rules and characteristics for project management recognized as good practice in the profession. The updated version introduces a 10th knowledge area called Project Stakeholder Management and also includes four new planning processes. In 2017, the sixth edition of PMBOK Guide was released and moving on in 2021, the seventh edition of PMBOK Guide will be released. The seventh edition, unlike the other editions, will have different performance domains. It will have additional topics like models, artifacts, and it has many other new principles that have been incorporated into it. Now that we know the history of project management, let's move on to the next part of the session and discuss why project management. Firstly, project management allows you to increase and work on collaboration. With clear roles, responsibilities, and standardized templates, project management helps teams to form quickly and work very well together towards a particular goal. Collaboration with other teams or business units becomes easier as everyone is speaking the same language and using the same tool. The second reason is because of effective project planning. A well-developed project plan creates a realistic timeline, improves resource management, provides a baseline for tracking as the project progresses, and leads to accurate budget estimates. In addition, data from previous projects is a valuable input into future project planning. The third reason is it has standardized ways of working. In the absence of clear approach to projects, individuals will get creative and develop their own ways of working, leading to multiple styles in one organization. A standardized project approach supported by the right tool will increase transparency in project selection, simplify project planning with templates, help team members to move very quickly between projects, improve collaboration within and between teams, and eventually improve visibility and reporting. The fourth reason is it allows you to successfully change management. Change management increases the end-user adoption of a solution created by a project. Now, for example, using a company intranet or new document management software. When included in the project planning and throughout the project, Change management makes it easier to deliver real business value from projects. Change management also reduces the impact of scope creep or uncontrolled changes to the project. Involving key stakeholders and users from the outset reduces the likelihood of delivering an unusable product. Project management will also enable better risk management. Using project manager processes, teams can identify potential risks way before the work even actually begins. If these risks affect the project during execution, the team is better placed to detect and address the problem as early as possible. And if project management practice is involved in the most effective manner, you can definitely see an improved quality. Project management helps to align outcomes with stakeholder expectations, gather feedback on a regular basis, and leverage new technologies to deliver better quality solutions. Documented processes also help to reduce errors and rework. There'll also be an improved reputation. In time, successful project teams gain the recognition of their colleagues and managers. Organizations also benefit from an increased standing among their competitors and future clients. Leadership is the most important aspect in project management. Project managers unite the team behind a clear vision and keep everyone motivated. Project managers can coach and mentor the team as needed so they can do their best work. Finally, it will incorporate new organizational capabilities. Improving project management processes is not just about financial gains. Organizations can also transform internal culture and the ways of working. Modern work is best described as a set of self-managed tasks. Introducing project management really helps organizations shift to focus on goals, metrics, and processes to support the execution of these tasks. Moving ahead, we will understand who really is a project manager. Project managers are organized, passionate, and goal-oriented people who understand what projects have in common, 
and their strategic role in how organizations succeed, learn, and change. Basically, project managers are change agents. They make project goals their own and use their skills and expertise to inspire a sense of shared purpose within the project team. They enjoy the organized adrenaline of new challenges and the responsibility of driving business results. They work very well under pressure and are comfortable with change and complexity in dynamic environments. They can shift readily between the big picture and the small but crucial details, knowing when to concentrate on each of them. Project managers cultivate the people's skills needed to develop trust and communication among all of a project stakeholders. It sponsors those who will make use of the project's results, those who command the resources needed, and the project team members. They also have a very, very broad and flexible toolkit of techniques, resolving complex interdependent activities into tasks and subtasks that are documented, monitored, and controlled. They adapt their approach to the context and constraints of each project, knowing that no one size can fit all the variety of projects. And they're always improving their own and their team's skills through lessons learned reviews at project completion. Project managers are found in every kind of organization as employees, managers, contractors, and independent consultants. With experience, they may become program managers or portfolio managers. And the demand of project managers is increasing exponentially all around the world. For decades, as the pace of economic and technological change has quickened, organizations have been directing more and more of their energy into projects rather than routine operations. Today, senior executives and HR managers recognize project management as a strategic competence that is indispensable to business success. They know that skilled and credentialed practitioners are among their most valuable resources. So now let's discuss some of the skills of a project manager. Firstly, the project manager should become a very strategic business partner. He or she must also encourage and recognize the valuable contribution of others in the project. He or she must respect and motivate stakeholders and even give them insights time to time. He must stress on integrity and accountability of the project. He or she must also fully be invested in the success of the project and he must definitely have the talent to be able to work in the gray areas. The high level of skills and responsibilities of project managers has garnered high salaries. According to PMI's ninth edition salary survey, the annual median U.S. project manager salary was about $108,000. So here's a list of annual medium salaries by certification status and experience. As you can see, the project management professional will allow you to completely skill up and the median salary is about $111,000. PMP with less than one year of experience gives you a median salary of about $95,000. PMP between one to five years of experience gives you around $104,000. The median salary of PMP professional with five to 10 years of experience will give you a median salary of $120,000. Moving on, PMP professionals with 10 to 20 years of experience should expect a median salary of about $124,000. And finally, PMP professionals with over 20 years of experience can easily expect a median salary of $133,000. Now that we've also discussed the salary of a project manager, let's move on to the next part of the session and discuss project management tools. As you may have noticed, projects can be sometimes really complicated. You plan, schedule, and monitor to make sure all elements of the project are running smoothly. The more tools in hand, the more manageable the project and your task can be. Project management software can contain all the tools that are needed to help project managers and team members with every aspect of their projects. When that project management software is cloud-based, data and collaboration can happen in real time which really provides a more accurate picture of the project and helps in decision making. Plus, project management software often contains many of the major tools for managing projects, like the ones that we'll be talking about. The first one is real-time dashboards. Now, project dashboards gather metrics from all parts of the project. Those numbers are then displayed in easy-to-read charts and graphs, giving managers or a team member a live look at the project progress and data. Dashboards can also assist in reporting. Running a project means reporting to the project sponsors on the progress of the project. Graphs and charts can be filtered to deliver just the data you need for targeted reports. 
The next tool that can really be handy in a project is online Gartt charts. These charts are great tools for planning because they display your task list graphically over a timeline. Each task has a deadline which creates a line marking the start and finish of that particular task. These tasks can then be linked if dependent. Ideally, you can share the Gantt with your team and track their progress as they update their statuses. With some of these Gantt charts, the bar between the start and finish dates will fill in as the team works on their tasks. And if you need to change the schedule, you can simply drag and drop the bar to reflect the new due date. The next tool is task management tools. There are several task management tools that allow you to create to-do lists for yourself and assign tasks to your team members. These tasks can sometimes have notes, files, links, and images attached that relate to the task. And team members can dialogue and collaborate at the task level. You can also automate email notifications to really know when a task is completed and to remind people of impending deadlines. The next tool is timesheets and workload tools. In terms of managing the people working on the project, which can be a project by itself, there are timesheets. These are online documents that make it easy for each employee to track and record their hours worked, and they can be filed to the manager when complete for sign off. When it comes to managing the workload, resource allocation tools really allow you to see at a glance if you've allocated your resources properly across the project so that everyone is working and the workload is properly balanced. In some cases, you can run reports from your workload management software too. Now that we've discussed some of the tools that a project manager could use to really get an insight of how well the project is doing, let's move ahead and talk about one important part of project management that is its life cycle. So there are three steps to this life cycle. The first one is initiation. The second one is planning. Third one is execution. And the last one is closure. We'll be talking about each of these in detail. So whether you're working on a small project with modest business goals or a multi-departmental initiative with sweeping corporate implications, an understanding of this management cycle is essential. The first one is initiation. First, you'll have to identify a business need, problem or opportunity and brainstorm ways that your team can meet this need, solve this problem or seize this opportunity. During this step, you figure out an objective for your project, determine whether the project is feasible and identify the major deliverables for the project. Clearly, it is worth it to do what it takes to make your voice heard early before the strategy is set in stone. There are some project management steps for the initiation phase. Firstly, undertake a feasibility study. That is, identify the primary problem your project will solve and whether your project will deliver a solution to that particular problem. The second one is identifying scope. Define the depth and breadth of the project. The third step is to identify deliverables. That is, define the product or service to provide. The fourth step is to identify project stakeholders. Figure out whom the project affects and what their needs may be. The fifth step is develop a business case. Use the criteria that I just mentioned to compare the potential costs and benefits for the project to determine if it moves forward. Finally, develop a statement of work. That is, document the project's objectives, scope and deliverables that you have identified previously as a working agreement between the project owner and those working on the project. Now, in the life cycle, the second step is planning. Now, once the project is approved to move forward based on your business case, statement of work or project initiation document, you move on to the next step that is planning phase. Now, during this phase of the project management life cycle, you break down the larger project into smaller tasks, build your team and prepare a schedule for the completion of assignments. Create smaller goals within the larger project, making sure each is achievable within the time frame. Smaller goals should definitely have a higher potential for success. There are some certain steps that you will have to follow in the planning phase too. The first one is to create a project plan. Identify the project timeline, including the phases of the project, the tasks to be performed, and the possible constraints that we discussed in the previous part of the session. The second step is to create workflow diagrams. Visualize your processes using swim lanes to make sure team members clearly understand their role within a project. The third one is to estimate budget and create a financial plan. This is really important. You will have to use cost estimates to really determine how much to spend on the project to get the maximum return on investment. The next step is to gather resources. Build your functional team from internal and external talent pools 
while making sure everyone has the necessary tools to complete their tasks. The next is to anticipate risks and potential quality roadblocks. Identify issues that may cause your project to stall while planning to mitigate those risks and maintain the project's quality and timeline. The last step is to hold a project kickoff meeting. Bring your team on board and outline the project so they can quickly get to work. So now moving on, you've received a business approval, developed a plan and build your team. Now is the time to get to work. The execution phase turns your plans into actions. The project manager's job in this phase of the project management life cycle is to keep work on track, organize team members, manage timelines and really make sure the work is done according to the original plan. There are some steps that you'll have to follow in the execution phase of the life cycle too. The first one is to create tasks and organizing workflows. Assign granular aspects of the projects to the appropriate team members, making sure team members are not overworked. Then you will have to brief team members on tasks. Explain tasks to team members, providing necessary guidance on how they should be completed and organize process related training if required. The next step is to communicate with team members, clients and upper management. Provide updates frequently to project stakeholders at all levels. Also, you will have to monitor quality of work. Ensure that team members are meeting their time and quality goals for tasks. Finally, manage budget. Monitor spending and keeping the project on track in terms of assets and resources. If you have a properly documented process already in place, executing the project will be much easier. Finally, in the last step of the life cycle, we have closure. Now, once your team has completed work on a project, you enter the closure phase. In this phase, you provide final deliverables, release project resources, and determine the success of the project. Just because the major project work is over, that doesn't mean the project manager's job is done here. There are still some important things to do, including evaluating what did and did not work with the project. So he'll have to firstly analyze project performance, determine whether the project's goals were met and the initial problems solved using a prepared checklist. Then you'll also have to analyze team performance, evaluate how team members performed, including whether they met their goals along with timeliness and quality of work. Moving on, you will also have to document project closure. Make sure that all aspects of the project are completed with no loose ends remaining. And here you'll also have to provide reports to key stakeholders. Moving on, you will have to conduct post implementation reviews where you conduct a final analysis of the project, taking into account lessons learned for similar projects in the future. Finally, accounting for used and unused budget. You will have to allocate remaining resources for future projects. By remaining on task, even though the project's work is completed, you will be prepared to take everything you've learned and implement it for your next project. Now that we have discussed the various project management tool, let's go ahead and check out the project principles. Now that we've discussed the life cycle, let's go ahead and talk about the project management principles. There are 12 project management principles. The first one is stewardship, where you're expected to be a diligent, respectful and caring steward. The second principle is team. Build a culture of accountability and respect. The third one is stakeholders. You will constantly have to engage stakeholders to really understand the interests and needs. The fourth principle is value. You will always have to focus on value. Throughout the project, it is really important to keep up the value. The fifth principle is holistic thinking. Recognize and respond to the system's interactions. The sixth principle is leadership. Here you'll have to motivate, influence, coach and learn. The seventh principle is tailoring, where you will have to tailor the delivery approach based on the context. The eighth one is quality. It is important to build quality into the processes and results. That is the outcome. The ninth principle is complexity. You will have to address complexity using your technical knowledge, your experience, and also the learning throughout the project. The tenth principle is opportunities and threats. You will have to address opportunities and threats throughout the entire process. The 11th principle is adaptability and resilience. It is important for you to be adaptable and resilient throughout the project. The last principle is change management. You will have to enable change whenever it is required to achieve the envisioned future state. Now that we have discussed the 12 main principles in project management, let's move ahead and check out the performance domains in project management. The first performance domain is team. The second one is stakeholders. Third one is the project lifecycle itself. 
The fourth one is planning. The fifth one is navigating uncertainty and ambiguity. The sixth one is delivery. The seventh one is performance. And the last one is project work. So these are all the roles and factors that contribute to the project success. So let us understand what's the project management life cycle. As you know, we have been regularly using a term called initiating, planning, executing, monitoring and control and closing. So one side, if I look at these are my five process group. But if I try to look at from a different perspective, initiating is something when I start my project. That stage is initiating stage. The activities which are there in initiating stage are activities such as finding out the business case. That means business reason why we are into this project. Working with sponsors to get the charter document created. Find out what are the customer's requirement. Finding out who the stakeholders are. These are few of the activities done in initiating. Then comes of planning. Planning is like preparing a proper plan of each of those items what we have to deliver. Planning would also mean talking about the individual knowledge area plan, also working out on the three key things, which is scope, time and cost. So we'll prepare their baseline. The baseline means approved and signed version of scope. That's scope baseline. Cost baseline is like approved costing of the project. Similarly, you have a schedule baseline, which is an approved time from the management. And the word baseline means that these are certain plans which are approved by the management. And after the baselines are done, any changes to be done in that plan will have to follow a change request process to the management. Project manager is an authorized person who can carry out those changes. But once the baselines are signed, the authority of change goes from project manager to the senior management. The particular word which we are using in a senior management who's responsible for maybe responding to the change request that's called as change control board. In short, we call that as a CCB. Once we have completed the planning, we would have a project management plan in hand. And when we are going to be in execution, we would be executing what has been planned. Sometimes it's also called as Plan, do, check, act, PDCA. Check and act is like uh, monitoring and control. D is like do, do means execution. P is like planning. Project management life cycle is also a kind of plan, do, check, act. That means there is a continuous improvement what is required. The monitoring and control, actually that's something which is continuously going on from the time you start the project. So in nutshell, I'll consider the monitoring and control to be a regular feature irrespective of what stage we are in. We would be continuously monitoring and tracking on what's getting delivered and how we are doing it. So this is something I consider that as a regular feature. When I talk about of the fifth line item here, which is closer, closer means towards the end when we are able to give the deliverables to customer. Customer is accepting the deliverables and we are closing that project. That's the time we are referring to the closing here. Closing also would mean administrative closer, financial closer, any such open items what we are going ahead with. If there are any ambiguities between customer and project manager or the project and you feel like that's not resolved and something which is still hovering and pending, even in closing stage, we would prefer to speak to the sponsors, document those things if it is still maybe not getting addressed because project has to close on the given times. So if at all there is a situation wherein with mediation also we are not able to resolve it, then we document those changes so that the PMO or the other members can deal with it if required. Initiating, planning, executing and closing. And in between I'm talking about of monitoring and control, which is a continuous activity which happens. So these are the stages which are going to be continuously going on one by one. In pharmaceutical industry, the name of the various life cycle items would be discovery, screening, preclinical development, registration, post submission activities. So that could be a name of the various life cycle stages. If I talk about of a software development life cycle, you will have stages such as requirements gathering, analyzing, designing, coding, testing, deployment. So these are going to be my various stages in the software project lifecycle. 
if i compare the same with the construction industry the stages of project life cycle would be feasibility concept detailed scope detailed design procurement construction commissioning handover and close so that means the life cycle stages are followed in every industry however the name could be different in each of those life cycles when we talk about there may be various phases for us so these phases can vary from industry to industry but what is more important when we talk about of the phases that they may be established based on various factors in an industry which could be from management needs which could be from the nature of a project so these are few factors which would be influencing the different phases and more than anything else we also try to use a word called phase gate that means whenever a one particular phase comes to an end we call that as a phase gate gate means there is a review supposed to happen so there is a person standing it who would like to know why you are moving have you done the deliverables yet have you not completed the deliverables so the word gate in terms basically relate to end of a phase and second phase is starting up and we would like to cross check our deliverables our performance and the reason of using phase gate word is basically this helps as a decision point i would call that as a go or no go should i proceed or should i terminate that kind of a decision is actually taken up at that level so every phase gate we have a choice to relook at whether things are getting delivered as they were desired or there is something to be done separately so these are few things what we would be paying more importance when we talk about of project management life cycles when i talk about of initiating we said initiating is the beginning initiating is like when project is getting final and we are finding out various resources we are finding out purpose of the project why are we getting into this project what's the benefit this can bring into our organization that's something which is done in the initial stage itself wherein we do mainly two activities first is finding out the business justification and preparing a charter document and the second is identifying who the stakeholders are so these are few things which are done in the beginning itself for the initiating when we talk about of planning we try to get into the details of every planning mainly scope time and cost but this is a planning to be done for all the 10 knowledge areas rather we would better call that as a planning of all the 49 processes how we are going to be using those processes where we need to customize what needs to be customized i'll give a small example let us talk about of a process called as plan communication management which is part of planning in order to understand what generally we do in this process please ask a few questions and you'll get to know what kind of a planning is required question number 1 what needs to be communicated question 2 how this needs to be communicated question 3 who will communicate this fourth at what frequency you will communicate fifth what format will you communicate sixth who should be receiving this communication see when i start asking all these questions these are something what are supposed to be getting discussed in the each of the planning processes here so the questions what i asked are the questions we generally ask during plan communication management and the strategies and the answers how we are going to be doing this who is going to be doing this all this gets documented and that is something which is basically the plan of uh, my communication we call that as a communication management plan so this is a maybe a rough idea for us to relate on how is the planning done for each of those processes there now how will you do control cost how will you do control schedule or any of the other processes that also gets discussed in the planning itself so basically the planning process group is carrying the skeleton of how are we going to be doing the remaining set of processes as well and of course we try to do a deep dive in terms of gathering requirements breaking the requirement into smaller more manageable line items called work package then trying to estimate it from the time perspective cost perspective and preparing the baselines so all these kind of a jobs are actually done in the planning so when we complete our all processes of planning that is where we are ready with a document called as project management plan and this becomes the basis throughout for project performance project appraisal and for team performance and team appraisal moving next we are clubbing monitoring and controlling and execution 
And as we said, the monitoring and control is a continuous process which has to be done starting from the beginning itself. Now the process is what we have to use for executing the project and doing a monitoring and control. Monitoring and control is to do with tracking, looking into the milestone, what was agreed and how is the progress. And more than anything else, when we are into the monitoring and control, we are actually continuously looking for compliances to our project management plan. And at the same time, in monitoring and control, the one big thing what we do is like comparing our project management plan and the current progress to understand are there any gaps? Are there any items which call for an action now? And this action could be initiated in the form of a change request. Very commonly, this is called as a CR in many of the organizations. So the process of initiating a change request, giving it back to the change control board also is the process which is done in the monitoring control process group itself. And the deliverables what we are producing, that's part of our definition as well, that the project is supposed to be delivering unique product, service or result. So even verifying that deliverables are meeting customer's specifications and requirement, giving it to the customer so that customer is accepting the deliverables, which we call that as the accepted deliverables. So even those activities are also done in the monitoring and control. And last note, the list is like closer, wherein we are trying to do a formal closer of our project, including procurement, including all other activities. This generally happens in three situations. First situation, when project is coming to an end, which is I would call that as a normal closer. Second situation, when a phase is coming to an end. And third situation, when project is getting terminated in between, then also we'll have to come to this situation. Few key activities, what we do while we are in closer is basically releasing the resources. When you start your project, you may take resources from various teams inside of your office or even from maybe few outside vendors. So when we come to the closer, we also release the resources. And before release, we wanted to make sure any lesson learned, whatever we have, which is not documented so far, will document and we'll try to archive these documents and ensure the payments are scheduled and the formal sign offs have happened with the clients and vendors. So that's something which is done towards the closer. And finally, we might raise a project report as well. So that's the activity which is done in the closer side. Now, the activities what we carry out in each of those phase, this may vary from industry to industry. Let us talk about of the activities when we start. So when you define, when you develop this kind of an activity, we call that as an initiating. Planning talks about of maybe starting from initiating till about monitoring and control. That means till such time, deliverables are not handed over to the customer. All that kind of activities, I would consider that as the full planning, which is going on consistently. Then comes up the execution, monitoring and control. Truly speaking, that begins when the project starts and it only ends when the project finishes. The efforts might increase when we are towards the deployment and we are about to start delivering many things to the client. So that's the stage. Maybe the resources would start uh, going to be coming down. So that means once we have started doing the deliverables, maybe we are very close to the monitoring and control phase. After that phase, there is a decline in terms of the resources requirement. There is a decline in terms of the total manpower requirement from that perspective. So that's a consistent decline we have. And in the last, the stage, what we call that as the closing stage. When we have delivered, we have handed over the deliverables to the customer. That's the stage we come towards closing, which is called as finish. Now, as I said, the name of various activities or the phases would vary from industry to industry, but the basic methodology, the basic understanding that remains the same throughout. So that's the main thing what we wanted to cover up here. And this dotted line represents the consistent monitoring which happens. Now, there are different project management methodologies if we talk and discuss on that. Methodology is what? Methodology is a system of a practices, techniques, procedures, and rules used by those who are involved in project. Okay, I'll ask you a simple question. Suppose I give you a project to build a small house. 
in 100 square foot area what strategy you will follow can you answer that if i ask you you have no experience imagine you have no experience in building the house i have given you a team of laborers i have given a team of electricians i have given a team of plumbers i have given a team of everyone who is required to build a building a small house and you are the project manager to build that, that house in a certain time span so what tools and techniques and procedures will you follow to get it done what what you will do being a good project manager one of the important things you always keep in mind is that a proper planning is required project planning is something which is the most important part in any project almost every project in the world which has been happened in the past or which is happening 60 to 70 percent time people spend in project planning 60 to 70 percent time why because if your planning is robust if your planning is good if your planning is having every minor details then there is no chance that project is going to fail because you have taken consideration all the factors environmental factors internal factors external factors budget factors manpower factors cost plus factors if you considered all the scenarios in a proper planned manner then the chances of failure project is very less now before planning definitely work authorization is required because work authorization means you are authorized to get the work done suppose i ask you to build up a house in a particular area and you did all the planning but you have not researched whether this is a land where house can be built up or not it is government approved or not the all planning will go waste right so first and the foremost thing is that you need to you need to be sure that this project is going to work and you have a proper authorization to get it done then you spend good amount of time in planning the project and finalizing what needs to be done how it is has to be done what is the roadmap for it then designing work into a breakdown structure so you divide whole scenario into multiple parts for example if i ask you to build up a software first of all you understand the requirements from the client then you divide the project into minor smaller parts one part can be for example in a telecom domain company if i ask then in telecom to domain company you will divide the project into multiple parts what should be the tariff what should be the customers what should be the billing rates what should be the different environments which are required for it what infra you are requiring for it so are you going to do the project for 100 people are you going to do this project for a 1000 people or 10000 people based on that you will procure the infrastructure once you have an infrastructure in hand then you will discuss whether I need a database which is no SQL or SQL database, whether I want this data to be stored remotely, what authorization factors I need to put in, what encryption factors I need to put in. So you'll take every small step and break down into minor pieces. Then on those minor pieces, you'll do a schedule planning. Schedule planning means, okay, first part of the project means acquiring the infrastructure has to be completed in two weeks. Second part of the project, installing the operating system, Linux or OS, Linux OS or Windows OS is a second step that comes under schedule planning. Third step is installing the softwares which are required for it. Let's say Python programming or R programming or Unix shell scripting, what is required? Third step of planning. Then how many people are working on this particular module of tariff for how many days? How many people are working on billing for how many days? So what you're doing, you're planning each individual subsets in detail. Then definitely financial planning is required because everything depends on that whether your budget is allowing it or not so you need to take into consideration whether you are not overshooting the budget or your budget is within the limits so that you will complete the project in time so keeping in mind the budget also is an important factor for example if you if suppose you are creating a software for a telecom company and you you are imagining that in the beginning you are going to get only 100 users then there is no point in buying the expensive hardware there is no point in buying the ibm mainframes for getting it done then you'll preferably go to aws cloud you'll preferably go to azure cloud you will go to gcp cloud so financial planning is an important factor and to reduce the cost generally all the startup companies they go with a cloud environment because in cloud environment pay as you go service applies it's like a rental you take a amazon you go to amazon you take any ec2 cluster and Suppose you're using for one day, you are paying for one day, you're using for one month, you are paying for one month, you are using for one minute, you are paying for one minute. And those costs are not very high, but you are getting the complete infrastructure from the companies who are already working on this, right? So you might have heard the word pass, right? Financial planning is an important part which you do by thinking the scale of a project. For example, if you are 
creating a telecom software and you think that okay this software is going to be useful for 100 people in the market initially definitely will not go for a mainframes or the servers which are costly in nature you're not going to buy and do the huge investment on the servers you will not create a data center at your own office premises you will go to the cloud solutions you'll go to aws you'll go to gcp you'll go to azure and buy the cluster over there or storage over there or services from the aws because those are mostly cost effective and very easy to handle right okay so there are various pm methodologies project management methodologies in the market so you can think of a traditional way of doing if you talk about 15 years back people were working on waterfall model part cpm ccpm we'll discuss in detail what are these then there are not a lot of pmi techniques came like pm bock method so pm bock method is what is generally asked in pmp examination so when you appear for pmp examination they will religiously follow pm bock methods then there are different agile methods different scum methods kaban xp aipf there are chain management methods ecm xpm there are process based methods and others so we have a traditional method so traditional method was very much straightforward and it's a traditional method because there are a lot of drawbacks in that and we move to different methods nowadays so i'll discuss what is traditional method so waterfall method was the one of the oldest methods in software development or any kind of a project let it be manufacturing project or a telecom project or any kind of a project where we gather the requirements from the end user then we design it then we finally implement it and then once implementation is done we verify everything is in place and then we maintain it so that's a typical traditional waterfall model in the older times if you talk about 20 years back companies were using this model to build a project now what is the drawback in that suppose you come to me i am a person who is owning a software company and you come to me that okay i need a telecom software and you gave me your requirements that I'm looking for 100 customer initially. I want this tariff. I want this billing. I want this. All details of the customers are there in front of me who are looking for the telecom provider and build a software for me. Suppose I start building it. After two weeks, you come back to me and say, okay, my customers are looking for this value added service as well. Let's say MMS facility in the phone. And during the requirement gathering, you have not told me. Today you come back after two weeks and say I want a MMS facility. I'll say okay, I'll take care of it. Don't worry. Then after two more days you come back and say okay, I want the messaging services also. Instead of calling, I want messaging services also. I said okay. Then after a few more weeks you come back and say I want free internet for the users on the connection they give they they get. So what what I am doing every now and then I am changing the requirements from the end user, getting the requirements from the end user. I'm changing my design. At the time of implementation, I go back and change my design. Then again, design changes. I go back to implementation. Again, implementation happens, design changes, and the project will never end. Customer expectations will never end, and my project will never end because my requirements are changing every now and then. That's the biggest drawback of waterfall model. If your requirement analysis is not freezed, if the design is not freezed during the implementation part, you'll face a lot of difficulties because you will not be able to met out customer expectations for the change requests right so this is a basic drawback with a waterfall model that if the requirement gathering is not complete and not signed off the project will definitely fail in the upcoming time because customer expectation will rise and change and you'll not be able to cater that during the later parts of the project easy it's a easy method Definitely simple and easy to use because it's very straightforward. Good for executive and management control. Identifies the project requirements from the start. Specific deliverables for each stage. Best for a short term project. So this model works well when the project is pretty small. Let's say website development. So website development is a very straightforward process. If you are a small company and you're looking for only 10 pages website. Definitely this model will work because you know all the requirements in hand. You know what needs to be done and you freeze it and you get it done in a two weeks time but imagine a portal learning portal like lms like adoreka has it's a big project it is time consuming project it has a lot of features there in it definitely this model will not work drawbacks is that requirements needs are upfront and frozen you cannot change the request later on inflexible and revision is not possible 
cannot begin next step until current step is over so until design is over you cannot go for implementation once you finalize the design then only you'll start coding right when it, then only you will start working on the project unable to solve problems until maintenance phase so once design is wrong imagine design is wrong what happens implementation is wrong maintenance is going to be heavy so every stage later stage depends on the previous state and if any changes are required in the pre previous state you are not allowed to do so if the requirement is freezed and designing starts now you cannot come back and say i want to change the requirement so this makes customer really unhappy because definitely customers are paying for getting this software done so he will customer will never be happy in this mode why because he wants the product by his own way and he cannot say okay if i'm coming with a change request you cannot cater it now coming to the next one that is program evaluation review technique part charts part charts are tools used to plan tasks within a project it makes scheduling and coordinating team members to accomplish the work easier basically it is a graphical illustration of a project as a network diagram consists of number of nodes so let's say you are starting a project and you are saying okay end of a schedule i'll be at this point then i need to go in two different directions suppose you are manufacturing a car once you get the raw material you say okay first of all i'll build up the engine and parallelly i will build up the body of the car so building the engine will take two days building a car body will take five days and then once engine and body are completed we will assemble at d point we will assemble at the d point right and then you say okay once body and engine assembled we come to the e point where we'll check for the other parts of the car so we keep on implementing different different parts parallelly coordinating with the other team members checking whether everything is in place or not and going in the reverse direction as well in case it is required what drawbacks you see here and what pros and cons you see here the drawback is that subjective analysis subjective analysis means maybe you are saying that my task is over but according to me your task is not over yet so it is a very subjective analysis you are not having a clear cut line with where, where it is ending where it is starting it is time focused if one part of the project delays it will delay the whole project altogether so that's another drawback it is resource intensive uh, intensive because one resource is working on making the engine another resource in making the body and if the person who made the engine fast he has to wait for the other task to be done the better thing over here is that better activity analysis so you are you are checking every activity parallelly improved department coordination so every department is talking to each other they are talking in terms of what is left out what is going on and uses what if analysis what if we are doing this way or that way we are going to do that now this is the better technique as compared to waterfall but again it has got some drawbacks and this critical path method cpm is a step by step project management technique for process planning it defines critical and non critical tasks with the aim of preventing time frame problems and bottlenecks it is best for the project which consists of numerous activities that interact in a complex manner so this is the important thing what is the critical part what is not critical part suppose you are building up a car and you come to know okay engine is the most critical part which needs to be done on the priority basis if engine is failed car cannot go right if engine is not working in a proper way there is no 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 meaning of making the whole car even if you make the body of the car you install tires into it you put ac into it you put everything and if the engine is not proper the car is not going to work so you understand the critical areas of a project attach a timeline to it and understand the bottlenecks which may happen in the project so that you can work efficiently so you can see here red line red line is a critical path which is critical task that needs to be done within time frames orange are the less critical parts which may delay for some extent or which may be changed for some extent a pros is that better scheduling process prioritization exact estimation of time and cost improve the coordination drawbacks is that it needs experience scheduling needs experience so you need a good project manager who has handled this project in the past it is very much inflexible in nature once you define the critical parts you cannot change it now it is difficult to manage because lot of small parts are there lot of small subsets of the big projects are there designing cpm is a time consuming so it is a very tedious process because you need to assemble everything in one place by taking every schedule of every small part of the organization 
Then critical chain project management is another method in which one or more new project project management techniques are quite latest one. It works backwards from the end goal. If you need, you need to recognize deliverables, then use past experience to map the tasks required to complete the project. So it is a bottom up technique. So till now, whatever we have seen are the techniques of top down. This is the bottom up technique where you have a start time. And you have a finish goal. You take a finished goal and move it to a backward direction what needs to be done. So this is a bottom up approach, which is effective one for many projects. But definitely it is having a resource efficient because you're doing a bottom up approach. You come to know how many people I need at every phase. Focused on the end goal because you know what needs to be delivered. Your major focus is end goal. It removes bottlenecks and various variations, reduce variations. And the drawbacks is that it's not suitable for multi project environment. Suppose you have a one big project having multiple small projects do not work there delay communication. So delays are something which is common in these kind of a projects. So you might have seen uh, this metro rail projects, right? Have you seen that anyone? If you belong to India, Delhi and CR or, or metro cities, they use this kind of a technique traditional methodologies for CCPM technique initially, but later on they change the methodology. So they have an end goal. What are the routes on which Metro is going to pass and then they use the bottom approach. They clear the markets clear the shops nearby. Then they do it in a reverse direction. Like what is the most critical area where Metro has to be built up first. Then they move on to the less critical areas. So they use this CCPM technique for building up a Metro stations in the particular cities. Now another is a PMI PMI is a PM book technique project management book of knowledge. Not exactly a methodology, but a guide for the project management, which consists of five different phases. Planning phase, closing phase, execution phase, initial phase, and monitoring and controlling phase. So it has five different phases, which is a book of all these phases. Every chapter has got almost like 10 different modules, eight to 10. And in detail, you will come to know every phase, how it exactly works. Project initiation, then project planning, then project closing and executing all the projects phases have been discussed in this PM block in detail. So if you register for this course, I would not suggest to read every page of the PM block. It will be good if you attempt as many mock questions as you can. Once you read any chapter, attempt the mock questions and try to fill up the gaps. If you talk about examination around eight to 10 years back, I gave this examination in 2009. And I still remember that I learned by heart every page of the book and did a lot of multiple choice questions. There were very few resources at that point of time in terms of questionnaires which comes over there. But nowadays there are so many websites, so many channels wherein you will find hundreds of questions which are getting asked in PMP. So I would say use a bottom up approach if you're planning to become a PMP. Rather than top down approach, you buy a book and start reading every chapter line by line and cramming it and learning it and understanding it. I would suggest take a PM book, read a chapter quickly, start attempting the questions what are coming from those chapters. If you solve 100 questions from there, then come back to the reading of the book and then you can go for the exam. That will be a better approach. Because why I'm saying that? Because the method of examination has changed a lot. Last 10 years, PMP, PMI organization have changed the methodology of the questions they ask. They ask more of a practical oriented question nowadays rather than theoretical. In older times, they used to ask the question which was exactly there in the book in the same way, in the same format with some minor changes. Now they are asking questions which are more industry specific, more practical oriented, more challenging. And those answers you will not get in the book. They covered very less scenarios in the book. Nowadays, they covered they ask the questions which are out of the syllabus. You can say out of the syllabus. I do not mean that they are completely new, but they are more practical oriented approach which are coming in the industry and people are opting for it. So if you're planning to go for a PMP certification, spend two months time at least for self preparation. Examination percentage is passing percentage is 1% out of 101 people pass this exam. It has got a high market value as well. And if you're planning to give this exam, try to solve from every chapter minimum 100 to 200 questions multiple choice questions and then go for it just reading the book and theoretically understanding it and going for exam will not be able to clear it you need to have a lot of mock tests a lot of sample questions 
to be resolved before going for this examination so talking about first certification that we have in our list is ppm which is professional in project management so talking about this the ppm certification is a trademark of uh, gaqm uh, this basically comprises of project management modules which includes how to plan execute and control and complete the projects that entire details are going to be mentioned or covered in this certification now the requirement for this is if i talk about you have to complete the e-course the cost is hundred dollars and three forty dollars basically for uh, next attempt the question you're going to get is 150 and the validity is going to be five years for the certification then you have to renew the next one that we have in our list is mpm mpm basically stands for as you can see on my screen as well which is master project management so what exactly mpm is so mpm course has been designed to include presentation practical exercises highly interactive group sessions intended for professions like program managers executive directors pmo managers and directors etc now talking about the requirement that we have is you basically require a minimum three years of master project experience plus you should have some training on that and uh, in this the question that you get is only 20 and the duration is 35 minutes and again the cost is same like last one which is 134 dollars and the validity is five years now next one that we have in our list is which is apm so apm stands for associate in project manager so uh, basically apm certificate is an entry-level project management certification that demonstrate that an individual possess the necessary entry-level project management knowledge so here the requirement that we have is e-course completion you have to complete the e-course and the number of questions which are being asked is 50 and duration is 60 minutes and the cost for this is 200 dollars and validity is two years next one that we have is you know your certified project manager so this is basically project management certification for individuals who have basic project management knowledge the good thing is that in this case there is no prerequisite that is required uh, here you get 120 questions you have to cover in 80 minutes it's valid for lifetime the cost is 735 dollars next one is acp which is agile certified practitioner so basically here the candidate is going to utilize the agile practices in project management wherein he is going to showcase their increased professional adaptability through agile tools and technique now the requirement for this is that uh, it requires 21 hours in agile practices and uh, you basically get 120 questions that you have to cover in 180 minutes the cost is 445 and 495 the next attempt and the validity is three years next one that we have in the list is prince 2 so prince 2 basically uh, you know its path which basically defined the rnr the roles and responsibilities which need to be performed by the every team member who is going to be managing the project so whether it's a junior member senior member it's going to you know provide for each and every team member and the requirement for this is like uh, you should have a basic knowledge but not that such a specific prerequisite the number of questions which are being asked are 75 you have to answer in 60 minutes it's valid for three to five years depending on the region plus cost varies with the region as well now one thing i want to share with you before we move on the structured learning edit reka so if you're highly interested to take the course from us what is going to be the structured learning how the entire course structure how the entire learning is going to look like let's take a look on that so in the very first class you're going to learn about pmp certification you know what exactly is pmp how to get certification you're going to get the hands-on on that then after that uh, next class you're going to uh, learn how to create a high performing team and the perspective hands-on and then uh, in the third class you are going to learn about how to start the project the perspective hands-on and then uh, in the next class you will uh, learn about how to do the work with the hands-on and in the next class you will learn about uh, keep the team on work uh, how to do the hands-on the last class you will learn about how to keep the business environment in mind with the hands-on and at the end you are going to become the superhero who is going to have a cape like this just kidding so you are going to be a superhero with the knowledge now talking about the other certification that we have in the list is the comshia certification which is again one of the renowned certification as well so the comshia project certification provides business professionals with both the inside and outside of information technology so to have the certification there is no such prerequisite you get 90 questions and you have to answer in 90 minutes so one minute for every question cost is 329 dollars validity is three years next one that you have is csm which is certified scrum master so the CSM certification is designed to provide students with strong foundation in Scrum. So basically it delivers the people with certain kind of skills that they can have to make it a successful organization. 
now if you talk about the requirement uh, in order to get the certification you should have completed the course of cst or cac where the questions are being asked is 50 duration is 60 minutes the cost is only 29 dollars because you are going to pay already in the past certification that you're going to have for cst or cac and the validity is two years next one that we have is which is capm which is certified associate in project management so uh, this is basically a certification program which is intended to demonstrate candidates understanding of the fundamentals terminology and process of effective project management now in this case the only requirement which is very simple is to have 23 hours of program management education and in this case you are going to add a little, little bit more questions like 150 questions that you have to answer in 90 minutes and the cost of this is 225 dollars on 300 dollars depending on it's a new or the renewal and the total validity is three years and here the one which is like uh, top in the ladder uh, that we have is pmp professional and project management so pmp certification is widely recognized certification that is basically uh, utilized a lot wherein uh, we are uh, using it at so many places so wherein if you are becoming a project manager you want to even become the program manager or tpm as well technical program manager which is again one of the other highest paid job as well so uh, you can easily get you know this certification at the same time this certification is highly recognized if you have this certification it's going to be like a cherry on the top for you so wherein you can easily get the advantage wherein you can easily get high package as compared to others who have not cleared certification and all so these are some of the primary advantages that we get here for pmp so talking about pmp one of the again other advantages this is that uh, if you are going to have it in a resume you're going for a job you're going to get much more more preference as compared to others so basically in the case of pmp what exactly is this is a globally acknowledged professional certification program in project management which legalizes a professional education their experience skill and competency required to lead and direct projects even like for example if you're going to give you you know give an interview and you have this certification on your table then other people who are trying to apply for the job they are not going to get that much preference that you're going to get so in other words if there are 10 resumes in front of HR and then that like one person has the certification, they're going to pick up this candidate first. The reason is because it's expected that if you already have a certification that then you know how to handle the project efficiently, what can be the shortcomings, what can be the downfalls, how you can cope up with, what kind of challenges you can get and how you have to recover from all those challenges. So all those kind of things are basically covered in this certification. So that's why the HR who is going to take the interview there, they will expect that even the interviewer who is going to take the interview, they will expect that you already have a good knowledge about it. So that basically is the PMP certification. Now talking about the requirement uh, here in this case, since this is like top in the letter as well. So here in this case, you require 35 contact hours of project management education. The number of questions which are being asked are 200 and you have to ask in 240 minutes and uh, the cost is four hundred five point five triple five dollars depending on the it's a new or a renewal and the validity is three years so one thing i want to share before we move on that pmp is again one of the vital uh, certification so many companies want to give preference to it because here what they feel is like that the person who has the knowledge uh, can you know take over the business in addition to that they also believe that uh, if you are going to have this certification you can also help in growing the company that's when certain cases company also sponsor you like they bear the cost of this money so project integration management project integration management is one of the knowledge areas in the pmp project management framework so project management practices project management framework where PMP being a best practice, well accepted across the globe, has 10 knowledge areas defined, five process groups defined, and 49 processes defined in the latest edition of PMBOK. So project integration management being one of the knowledge areas includes the processes and activities to identify, define, combine, unify, and coordinate the various processes and project management activities within the project management process groups. Project manager is also called as project integrator. Reason being, project manager should have a full end-to-end -end view of the project and do necessary activities required to manage the project by having end-to-end -end visibility. At any given point in the project, project manager should able to connect in terms of what needs to be done as defined is the project is progressing or not 
that needs to be very much visible to the project manager and that happens in project integration management so integration management basically includes various trends and emerging practices which involves use of automated tools use of visual management tools project knowledge management expanding the project manager's responsibility and many hybrid methodologies so tailoring considerations required while adopting the pmp project management best practice frameworks requires understanding the project life cycle of a specific project which is being done the entire life cycle in terms of activities involved it may be a product which is being developed we should remember in a specific product life cycle in a specific service life cycle or in a specific results what we are creating which will be becoming a result of a specific project that itself will have a life cycle so introducing that product or service you will have a project while enhancing while adding a module or modifying the capabilities of the product you may require to initiate a project to retire that product or services you may require to initiate a project again so basically what we are trying to indicate is in a given product life cycle or service life cycle there will be many project life cycles when we say life cycle there will be beginning means a start date there will be end means end date finish date so beginning to end of a project is project life cycle where multiple such project life cycles can be there in a single product life cycle or in a single service life cycle so throughout that life cycle you will come across many approaches required like quality management approach risk management approach scope management required cost management required schedule management procurement management so for all this there should be a specific approach defined as part of the planning which will get integrated in integration management so knowledge management plays a very important role in every project so knowledge may be related to the project which are already done already completed so those knowledge can be used for the project which is currently running and use that knowledge which is captured there here in the current project so that current project you need not reinvent things or redefine something similarly while doing project currently you may require to capture the details of this project whatever the learning you have what went wrong what went well what are those processes what are those challenges what are those issues which has come across and how they were resolved so in a way project management itself is a change management so i am saying this for a reason every project which is being producing a specific product or service will bring the change to an environment mainly so means project management introduces any project introduces a change to the environment and project management should ensure these changes are done properly considering the project environment and all those various different dynamics in project environment secondly when i say change we should also think about the change to the baselines defined to the project which will happen while doing the projects so we should not get confused between these two changes the project which is bringing a change to environment versus the change which is happening to those baselines which is defined within the project so both needs to be handled very carefully and both are not same then every initiative every investment which is being done by an organization that needs to be justified so similarly project will also have an investment which needs to be justified and every project investment happens with a specific directions set by organization so there will be a governing body which looks at a project to see whether this particular project is aligning to that directions what organization governance is set so to ensure that there should be a project governance every project as it produce outputs outputs in terms of products output in terms of services definitely will have an outcomes creating the benefits or value in the absence of this benefit realization in the absence of not understanding the specific benefits realization of the value if that doesn't happen investment on the project doesn't make any sense so this needs to be confirmed while taking up the project this needs to be confirmed while project is being delivered 
these needs to be confirmed in the post project stage as well the product or service which have been created as part of this project should work should perform in such a way that benefit realization should happen integration management processes so project integration management has around seven processes defined in pmbok sixth edition which is the latest one this involves develop project charter which is part of initiation process group initiating process group defined in pmp framework similarly develop project management plan is a process which is defined as part of planning process group. direct and manage project work manage project knowledge these two processes are defined as part of executing process group monitor and control project work perform integrated change control these two processes are defined as part of monitoring and control process group whereas close project or phase is a process which is defined as part of closing process group defined in pmp so develop project charter as i mentioned earlier develop project charter is a process which is in initiating process group so the aim of this process is to develop the project charter so which basically mean creation of a document a formal document which has to be developed which should be helpful in authorizing the existence of the project which means assignment of a project manager will happen as part of this particular process project charter will be handed over to the project manager and formal declaration of assignment of the project manager will happen it is very important to create a project charter before starting the project implementation as the charter would provide a step by step high level plan for the project with the development of project project manager gains authority over various resources that are applied to the project activities by developing the project charter one will be able to establish a direct link between the organization objectives and the undertaken projects develop project charter process the inputs to that process includes business case benefits management plan agreements to define the initial intention for the project then enterprise environmental factors which are very important because project is happen in that environment the legal regulatory market conditions organizations culture environmental conditions social stakeholders expectations their behaviors then organization process assets so organization process assets includes all the processes policies standards templates methods historical information the lessons learned from the previous project which is captured so all these are required while creating a project charter so tools used to develop project charter would be expert judgment which mean involvement of those experts who are domain experts or who are very thorough about the specific topic or specific subject on which project is being done so taking their inputs taking their opinion and then including those points whichever makes sense and whichever are required as per the suggestion into a charter then data gathering data gathering from all those inputs what we mentioned and also the details of the projects what is mentioned relating to that specific data gathering then interpersonal and team skills this requires meeting with many different individuals of different capabilities and understanding maybe stakeholders if i say at the moment who also over the stakeholder one knows about connecting with them and ensuring the details of that particular project relating to that project are captured using interpersonal and team skills and meetings can also be done to collect those details outputs of this process develop project charter would be project charter itself is an output and secondly assumptions law so what are the assumptions made considerations made while developing the project charter will has to be articulated so next process develop project management plan develop project management plan is a process in a planning process group so this is the second process where the idea is to have a comprehensive project management plan so as defined in pmbok project management body of knowledge 6th edition which is the latest version there are 10 knowledge areas as i mentioned so each knowledge area creates a plan develops a plan relating to that knowledge area like scope management will have scope management plan cost management will have cost management plan 
like with each of those knowledge areas we'll have a specific plans developed but however these plans are called as subsidiary plans so all these subsidiary plans will get consolidated in integration management so develop project management plan is a process in integration management knowledge area which consolidates all of these subsidiary plans so this is the process of developing a project management plan which includes defining preparing and coordinating other plan components to finally integrate them into project management plan the key advantage of developing a project management plan is that it acts as a roadmap of all the team members so this can become an ultimate reference while executing the project this would provide the required directions and set the objectives clear and the plan which is made initially would become a baseline so this also provide a specific direction which helps a project to move towards the goal which is defined and with that unified goal a project delivery can become successful so inputs to develop project management process would be project charter which is an output of develop project charter process which we just discussed so develop project charter process is part of the integration management knowledge area the output of that process comes as an input to develop project management plan so outputs from other processes as i mentioned every knowledge area rest of the knowledge areas out of 10 knowledge areas create subsidiary plans so those subsidiary plans will come as an input to develop project management plan then as i mentioned earlier enterprise environmental factors and organization process assets will also go as an input to develop project management plan so the tool used as part of develop project management plan are expert judgment data gathering interpersonal and team skills and meetings outputs of develop project management plan would be number 1 project management plan which is a consolidation of all the subsidiary plans and detailing out and connecting those together to have a execution of the project become smoother and easier this would be an ultimate baseline then next process is direct and manage project work so direct and manage project work is part of executing process group in integration management knowledge area so as part of this process project management directs and manage project work and this is an integrated process which will provide that visibility in entirety so execution of work will be done by the team who are assigned to do that work but project manager himself or herself will not go and do the activity there so direct and manage project work process helps in directing and manage the project work and making required changes to meet the promised goals with the correct direction and the management of the project the probability of the project's success increases while elevating the deliverable quality so this process is followed throughout the project life cycle so inputs to direct and manage project work are project management plan which is the output of develop project management plan process within the same knowledge area project documents like change log lessons learned register milestone list project communications then project schedule requirements traceability matrix risk register and risk matrix risk report approved change request so now you may ask the question you may have the questions where is this approved change request coming from when i am into direct and manage project work which is the next process i am looking at after develop project management plan so if you visualize the project in entirety in some part of the project sometime there may be some deviation which is identified by monitoring and control process while assessing or while doing an auditing while testing there may be some deviation which is found so that needs to be corrected to correct it a corrective action has to be taken to do that correction there may be a change which needs to be done and that will go as a change request to integrated change management process which is in monitoring and control process group once that change request is evaluated that change request will be approved and that will come as an input to direct and manage project work to take necessary corrective action so preventive actions can also be in the scenario of proactive measurement which is being done or foreseeing certain things happens so addressing the root cause you may require to do some changes so like corrective actions preventive action defective repair these are happening through change approval so those needs to be implemented 
as that as a input coming from integrated change management process this has to be executed that executions has to be directed and managed by project manager enterprise environmental factors will also come as an input and finally organization process asset so tools used as part of direct and manage project work are expert judgment then project management information system meetings outputs of direct and manage project work are deliverables actual deliverables which is coming out each deliverables which as per the planned schedule then work performance data actual work performance data how the project is working how the project is executed what is the status of it what is being created what is in progress at any given point in time issue logs issue logs are the one which used to capture all those deviations corrective measures which needs to be taken and this is managed by project manager a tracker which is maintained by project manager to track those issue logs during the execution then change requests which are raised during the execution some deviations are found some corrections are to be made to do the corrections there may be a change request raised for the deviation then project management plan updates based on those changes or based on the performance which are identified project document updates and organization process assets updates so why opa updates or organization process asset updates reason being there may be a learning there may be a template defined that needs to go and sit in opa so this can be referred in any other project later or within this project as the project progresses it can be reused referring to opa repository so next process manage project knowledge so manage project knowledge is a process which is included as part of 6th edition of pmbok so earlier there was no specific process to manage project knowledge in the earlier editions of pmbok so this is a new process which is included from the 6th edition of pmbok defined by pmi so when i say knowledge one has to keep in mind it's all about know how so when we say some people as i observed they say knowledge is equal to information which is not true information basically gives you the message whereas knowledge provides you the actions the steps to do something know hows so in a project you may require to define know hows you may require to understand for resolution of something what are the steps involved for implementing something what are the steps involved so those are defined so that should not be tampered the integrity of that has to be ensured someone cannot just go and change those steps without any proper approval so those needs to be correctly ensured a specific knowledge which has been created for a project remains so managing that project knowledge is very essential so that achieving the project objective as discussed defined and agreed would be easier so that there is no ambiguity while executing so this can also be used in the future learning and references so it is primarily done by using historical or existing organizational data and updating correcting the current knowledge whichever is there so that needs to be updated on regular basis it majorly helps in leveraging the organizational knowledge and improving the project results so as we discussed about there may be something which is done during this project which are defined that needs to be maintained for following there will be something which we learned that also need to be captured and ensured that is not tampered it is available whenever it is required in the current project as well as future projects which is being done in the organization so inputs to manage project knowledge process would be project management plan project documents like lessons learned register project team assignments resource breakdown structure stakeholder register and the deliverables deliverables which are happening during the execution of the project unique deliverable throughout the project life cycle maybe a milestone deliverable then enterprise environmental factor and organizational process asset tools used as part of manage project knowledge are expert judgment knowledge management tools interpersonal and team skills information management outputs of manage project knowledge process would be lessons learned register the creation of what are the lessons which are captured and reference to those then project management plan updates based on those learnings then opa updates for future reference monitor and control project work 
So the monitor and control project work process is part of monitoring and controlling process group in an integration management knowledge area. So this process helps in order to achieve the performance objectives as defined in the project management plan. This process is implemented to ensure all those deliverables which are being done in the project are according to what is defined. So in this monitoring and controlling process, the project is tracked, reviewed, project's overall progress is reported, which enables stakeholders to get the exact idea of the project status. So this process is performed throughout the project lifecycle and it acts as guide for the project manager to ensure that the project is on schedule within the budget, right? And also the resources utilization according to what is defined. Identified risks are monitored, managed according to what is agreed. Similarly, stakeholder engagement, procurement, communication, scope. So in all perspective, the nine knowledge areas which we spoke about, so to reiterate on those nine knowledge areas, we can remember as scope management, cost management, schedule management, resource management, quality management, risk management, procurement management, communication management, and stakeholder management. So monitoring and control project work will have the processes in all of these knowledge areas. So this process, which is an in integration management, consolidates every control activities so that everything which is defined in all these nine knowledge areas are noted, monitored, checked whether are they are happening as defined. Inputs to this process would be project management plan, project documents like assumptions log, basis of estimates, cost forecast and issue logs, lessons learned register, milestone list and quality reports, risk register and report, schedule forecast, work performance information. Work performance data was input, whereas here we are seeing work performance information, which basically a processed data to in a specific context of that particular monitoring and controlling project work activity. So other inputs may be agreement, enterprise environmental factors, and organization process assets. Tools used in monitoring and control project work are expert judgment, decision making, data analysis, meetings it is very essential to collect those data process the data see how this particular project is being progressing what is the current state what was the actual one versus what is planned so these needs to be understood so that necessary actions can be taken moving forward in the project whether should we do some corrections so that we can bring back the project to the track or should we continue the way it is running outputs of monitoring and control project work would be work performance reports change requests, project management plan updates, and project document updates. So work performance reports are created with a specific objective and context. Is this report is used to discuss with the team? Is this report is used to update the management? Is this report used to update the customer for review? So based on those context, work performance reports are created and templates of those are defined as part of the plan. So change request is an output reason being there may be a deviation which is found while monitoring and controlling the project work. So to do the necessary correction of that particular deviations which is found, change request would be raised. The process six is perform integrated change control, which is a process which takes a change request as an input and checks whether this change makes sense. So there is something called seven hours of change which we discuss while doing the service management. So that is who raised the change, what is the reason for the change, what is the return from the change, risks of change, responsibilities of change. Likewise, we define seven hours. There should be an answer to those seven hours. So this process is performed to control the various change requests received throughout the project lifecycle. All the change requests, approved changes, modification of final deliverable, project documents, project management plan, etc. are reviewed. Performing this process helps in keeping an integrated document containing the list of changes while assessing the overall risks which might arise due to the new changes. So inputs to the process would be project management plan, which is basically change management plan, configuration management plan, scope baseline, schedule baseline, and cost baseline. Project documents, which is basis of estimates, requirements traceability matrix, risk report, 
then work performance reports like resource availability schedule and cost data earned value reports burn up or burn down charts then change request which is required for corrective action preventive action defect repairs or any updates then enterprise environmental factors and organization process assets so the tools used as part of perform integrated change control would be expert judgment change control tools decision making and meetings so and lastly data analysis so the outputs of perform integrated change control would be approved change requests project management plan updates project documents and updates if you look at the outputs very closely the input was change request whereas approved change request is an output which means all those requests which are raised are checked and if you recall approved change request was input to direct and manage project work which i explained from where that particular approved change request will come as an input to direct and manage project work so once it is approved implementation has to happen that is the reason approved change request will go back to execution process group direct and manage project work and then execution happens implementation of change happens close project or phase process which is in closing process group where the various project activities phases and contracts are finalized it provides a control environment where project can be successfully wrapped up the closing process includes the activities like preservation of the project information completion of planned work the release of involved resources etc but we should remember when we say close it is not about project closure alone so it's about phase as well a project will have many phases so closing that phases while closing that phases close project phase the same process is triggered the inputs to this process would be project charter project management plan project documents and accepted deliverables other inputs would be business documents like business case benefits management plan agreements then procurement documents and organizational process assets the tools used during close project or phase process would be expert judgment meetings and data analysis outputs of close project or phase project would be project document updates final product service or result transition final report and opa updates if we closely observe this list of outputs you don't see an accepted deliverable as an output you don't see the results of project as an output it is a final product service or result transition meaning the acceptance of this particular product or service or results which is created as part of the project is already shown to customer to the stakeholders and necessary sign off required is obtained in terms of acceptance so only then close project or phase process will be triggered to complete all those necessary activities required to formally declare the phase of a project or project in entirety is complete so project scope management is one of the knowledge areas that we have out of the 10 knowledge areas that we cover as a part of pimbok when you prepare for pmp examination definitely you will be referring to the latest edition of which is pimbok 6th edition and today's webinar and the training is based on the latest pimbok which is 6th edition itself there are total 49 processes there are total 5 different process groups that we talk about and 10 knowledge areas so when you appear for the exam and when you prepare for the pmp certification you basically study all of these you will study 10 knowledge areas 49 processes and five different process groups one of the knowledge areas today that we are covering as a part of this webinar in terms of giving you the high level overview is the scope management now as a part of scope management i'm sure you may have a lot of basic questions fundamental questions around this knowledge area which i'm sure you will be able to get answer to some of those largely as you would know and you would agree that the scope management process covers about how we define the scope on the project how we go about controlling it and it's more from the point of view of the kind of output that we are trying to deliver by the end of the project what outcomes are we trying to achieve for our stakeholders and what benefits of the project that we are trying to help our stakeholder achieve 
or the result or the outcome that we are working for. If you really look at whenever we work on any project, as a result of the project, what we get by the end of the project is some deliverable. The deliverable could be in the form of some physical product that you're launching in the market, or the deliverable could be in the form of some service or some result that you're producing. And that result or that product is going to ultimately help your stakeholders achieve the outcomes that they want to achieve through that. There could be various outcomes that they want to achieve, by the way. For example, if you are launching some product in the market for your stakeholders through which they might want to achieve the customer satisfaction. So that is outcome of the product that you are trying to work for your stakeholders. Outcomes are defined by stakeholders. Deliverables are worked upon by the team and they ensure that they produce the deliverables in line with the expectations that are agreed upon between the team and the stakeholders. And obviously, as a team, we should also be knowing the kind of benefits that the project offers to the stakeholders. That's how these three things are interlinked with each other. Now, when we talk about scope, obviously, we have to look into the product scope and the project scope. Now, there is a product life cycle and there is a project life cycle. And just to give you an idea about the product life cycle, which is definitely much, much bigger, much, much lengthier than the project life cycle. But obviously, when we produce any product, we basically undertake some project and the outcome of that project is your product. But once you start working on that product, the product life cycle is much, much longer. And within life cycle of a product, you might be undertaking multiple projects. So there is a project scope. So for example, you have a product which you have already launched in the market, and now you have undertaken a small project to build some enhancement on the top of that project. So let's say you are introducing the CRM sales management software in the market. It's already there in the market. You have defined that scope of the product, what all things that you want to cover as a part of that product offering in the market based on the category it serves in. For example, if it is in a sales management, then obviously you would like to build the capabilities which will help your customers utilize your product or use your product in such a way that they can fulfill their needs and requirements. So you'll ensure that your product is capable enough to fulfill all that scope from the customer's point of view. Now, when we talk about a project, now project you could undertake for various purposes. One of the purpose is your product is already in the market and now you want to build some small enhancement on the top of that. So you might undertake a small project just to build that small enhancement and then you would complete that project within two months, three months, six months, whatever the time period that is agreed between you and the customer. So you have a project scope. In this case, it is whatever the enhancement that you have agreed and you have a product scope, which is obviously based on the product that you're building to be launched in the market. Now, if you talk about the scope management, it will obviously cover product scope, project scope, depending on what for you're working on. Now, let's talk about certain tailoring considerations from the scope management point of view. And this is what exactly PMI has done from the sixth edition. There are certain tailoring considerations that are being considered for each of the knowledge areas. Now, from exam point of view as well, this is important to know what are the tailoring considerations under scope management. We always say that one size solution doesn't fit all. So we'll have to tailor the process that we are working on. So if I have to work on a scope management, I might have to tailor the process based on the context I'm working in. And that really differs. If you're working in a banking industry, if you work in FMCG industry, fast moving consumer goods, if you're working in e-commerce industry, pharmaceutical industry, manufacturing. So in each of these industries, the kind of work that you may be working on could differ. The context is different. You're dealing with different kinds of stakeholders. So it's very important for us to tailor the process based on the context that you're working in. So knowledge and requirements management, how are you going to ensure that the knowledge is gathered, is documented? And based on that, you would have to then think about the kind of requirements that you would like to work upon. How are you going to validate and control your scope? Now, depending on the kind of context that you work in, you would decide in terms of defining the acceptance criteria, in terms of agreeing upon how and when my customer would accept the deliverables by the end of each phase or by the end of whatever the milestone that is agreed between you and the customers. So we can certainly tailor around this aspect as well. 
you would also need to define the development approach. How would you like to build this product or a project or some result or service that you are trying to produce by the end of that project? People might go by an agile way or you would like to stick around the waterfall way or some project life cycle or product life cycle that you would agree upon between you and the stakeholders. So what's the development approach? And that's going to differ. If you're working in research and development, the development approach could be completely different than if you're working on producing some product to be launched in the market. Stability of requirements. If the changes that are expected in the product that you're developing are very high, obviously you might not be able to just go in a traditional way. You might need to have more interactions with customer, more feedback loops so that you can pick up those changes. You can validate your requirements more frequently and you will be able to manage those changes in the requirements effectively. Otherwise, you would have a huge impact on the architecture, on the design that you may have already created if the changes come towards late in the cycle. And of course, the governance. The complexity of project would also define the kind of governance framework that you want to establish on project. Whether you would like to have got weekly meetings with your stakeholders, fortnightly discussions, escalation metrics, what kind of a governance that you want to establish on the project that you're working on. From scope point of view, definitely it's important to know how are you going to manage change on the project. We have to tailor the process based on these considerations. Now, once you've done the tailoring of the process, then you get on to the project scope management. Now, here is a question from Satish, and he's asking about what is the difference between the PIMBOK 5th edition and PIMBOK 6th edition scope management process. So I guess, as I mentioned earlier, there is no much of a difference between these two. Of course, the changes that I have done in PIMBOK 6th and 5th edition from scope management point of view. Of course, there are certain changes that have been done in the form of tools and techniques, in the form of certain suggestions, like use of certain techniques, which are additionally mentioned, which we will touch upon a bit on this webinar. But largely, you will find that the scope management is more or less intact. Of course, the tailoring considerations are added. And more importantly, what is also done in general in comparison with the fifth edition is the touch of agile. So in each of these areas, the agile touch is given. Like from scope management point of view, I would say, how do we really manage scope in agile project and how do we do it in the predictive life cycle? So we have got a predictive life cycle and we have adaptive life cycles, as you might have already heard about. So traditionally, we more use the predictive life cycle. The way scope is managed in predictive life cycle is different than the way it is managed in the adaptive life cycle. So those aspects are also covered largely as a part of this new PIMBOK edition. But changes are subtle in comparison with some of the other knowledge areas. So I hope that gives you some idea. All right, thank you for the confirmation. Let's keep moving about uh, scope management processes. Now, under each of these knowledge areas, you will find various processes as a part of these knowledge areas. Talking about scope management, we start with plan scope management, and this is where largely we focus on how to plan the scope management activities on project. Collecting requirements is definitely one of the important process where we reach out to the stakeholders to identify their needs and requirements based on the project or product that we are working on. Then based on the requirements that we have gathered, we define scope and we ensure that whatever is defined in the scope, we only work on those items and not something which is not part of scope. Creating WBS process certainly gives us an idea about uh, what are the uh, low level activities, tasks, packages, work packages that we have to work upon. And uh, decomposition is one of the techniques that is used while creating WBS. So creation of WBS is definitely one of the important processes within the scope management. Then we have to validate scope against the acceptance criteria that is defined between you and the customer. For each deliverable that you're producing by the end of each phase in project or product lifecycle, it's important to define very clearly the acceptance criteria. And then lastly, we have got control scope. And this is where we basically see how do we control effectively the changes that might happen to the scope and how do we go about managing those changes? So these are the six processes that we have within scope management. Let's get on to each of these and we'll do a bit of a deep dive into each of these processes in terms of understanding what is it, first of all, what are some of the inputs that we have to consider? 
what tools and techniques can we use on this process and what kind of output can we expect out of it so let's start with the first one which is about plan scope management and as the name says plan scope management is all about we have to basically define our approach how are we going to go about managing scope on project so it's largely about defining that approach like in terms of how are we going to define the product scope how are we going to validate it against the acceptance criteria how the scope is going to be controlled how changes on the or to the scope are going to be managed so all of those approaches are basically covered as a part of the scope management plan and certainly this is one of the important document from the point of view of if there is any confusion around like how we should manage change then i can just go and refer to this document even if i am new on project and if i wouldn't know how to do that this document will certainly give me an idea about uh, how i supposed to be validate scope against the acceptance criteria so what is the overall approach that is being agreed between the team and customer so that guidance and the direction is what this provides so that's about the scope management now how do we really create this kind of a document for that we'll have to refer to certain inputs the first is of course the project charter since we are defining the approach it's important for us to refer to the project charter in terms of understanding the high level scope that is mentioned there in the project charter we have to also refer to project management plan now project management plan is a subsidiary management plan so it encompasses various plans like for example quality management plan so largely we refer to the quality management plan when we work on the scope management plan because quality will give you inputs about kind of standards that you want to follow while working or creating on that product or service or some result that you're working on through that project so it's very important for us to refer to that or kind of project life cycle that you would like to follow or the development approach that is being agreed upon so all of that would come from there organizational process assets so this will give us an idea about what kind of internal standards that you would like to follow what kind of a templates that you would refer to etc enterprise environmental factors you would refer to certain internal and external factors like for example if i am building on the crm sales management software i would also like to look into some of the market products and see what is there in those products and would there be any gap between what's there what's available already and what we would like to build so those market factors or the products available in the market would also have an impact on the overall plan that you are creating for managing scope now once you have a plan in place certainly you need to be using certain tools and techniques while creating this plan itself the first is of course expert judgment you can talk to the people who have been doing this for quite a while these people will certainly give us an idea about how to do it meetings we can organize various meetings in order to engage right stakeholders we can also gather data and sort of do the discussions around it so this couple of techniques will certainly help us and what do we expect by the end of scope management plan really what we get ultimately is the scope management plan is what we get as a output so i would know how the scope is going to be managed on this project by referring to this plan and i would also get requirement management plan how am i going to manage requirements on the project right from gathering requirements right from what kind of a techniques and tools am i going to use etc who are the stakeholders am i going to engage so all of those answers would come from the requirements management plan including the traceability of the requirements so that's about uh, creating the plan so once we have a plan in place we know the approach on this project that's going to be followed when it comes to managing scope then i start working on the next process which is collect requirements as a part of collect requirement process what do i have to do really so this is a process where we basically ensure that we gather all the needs and the requirements of customers which will help in meeting the objectives of the project that we are working on so it could be manufacturing some product that you are working on or coming up with some result or some process or some service that you are trying to launch in the market so all of that could be a part of the collect requirements depending on the kind of objective that you have defined so this will certainly give us an idea about how to define the scope of the product or project that we are working on before we define the scope it's important to gather requirements and in order to do that we'll have to use certain tools and techniques we have to refer to certain artifacts which are already created on the project by this time so let's get on to it what kind of tools and techniques should we be using so before we get on to the tools and techniques 
first of all we need to refer to certain artifacts which i was just now mentioning to you about like project charter will help us knowing the high level scope of the project and of course i would also know who are some of the stakeholders i need to reach out to project management plan largely as i said scope management plan requirements management plan stakeholder engagement plan some of these plans would be definitely useful to me while working on collecting requirements project documents so i would also need to refer to certain project documents like maybe assumption log or lesson learned if there is any lesson previously learned and if i want to ensure that those mistakes wouldn't be occurring again so that's very important i would also need stakeholder register which is very important because that will give me the list of stakeholders whom i need to engage i would also need to refer to business documents and one of the most important document would be business case because business case will help me in understanding the background context how this project is going to give benefit to my customer etc about investment impacts all of that now most of the times there is always the vendor engagement on the projects something on the other hand so i would need to know the agreements and those agreements will also give me an idea about either the kind of scope impact that would have on this project what kind of a contribution the vendor would have on this and stakeholders as well enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets would be here as well pertaining to collect requirements what kind of a templates do i need to use what kind of a techniques do i need to use so all of that would come from here when i work on collect requirements so these are some of the inputs that i would need to refer to now what kind of a tools and techniques would help me when i start gathering requirements on the project one of the important tools would be expert judgment so i would reach out to people who have done this in the past i would talk to them i would try to understand their perspectives their learnings and i will definitely engage them in order to gather scope so maybe for example business analyst would be one of the best examples so we have people who have been working in business analysis for few years and they know how to conduct certain workshops facilitated group workshops or conduct surveys or interviews etc so i would reach out to them in terms of gathering data again there are various ways through which i do that one of the way could be brainstorming sessions i would conduct face to face interviews and the another way could be also benchmarking so as i said if i am working on a crm software for sales management i would benchmark it against some well known product in the market reputed product in the market and to then try to find out gaps and that will help me in uh, analyzing the data and uh, obviously gather more data decision making is definitely one of the important tools that we use and there could be very small techniques that are used in decision making like simple voting technique just so that everybody is engaged everybody is involved there could be multi criteria decision analysis based on the various criteria how those criteria would impact the decision cost quality resource availability so many of these criteria would be available for us to refer to while making decisions definitely team skills and interpersonal skills like for example whether do we have skills in the team to conducting workshops like nominal group technique or observations and uh, conversations with some senior folks and even do we have the facilitation skills within our team members so that uh, facilitated workshops could be conducted and all of these would have certainly an impact data representations like affinity diagram could be one of the examples in data representation context diagrams prototypes so these are some of the techniques which will definitely help you in engaging your stakeholders from whom you will be gathering data and of course the requirements related requirements on the project all right so what do we get by the end of collect requirement process in the form of output you will get requirements documentation so requirement documentation would have whatever the template which is used in your organization you would have that and requirement traceability metrics these are the couple of outputs that we can think of getting out of this process so requirement documentation is where all the requirements are captured and we have traceability metrics and that's where we try to see how do we establish traceability of that requirement through the project life cycle so there could be a backward traceability or a forward traceability we see to it that once we pick up that requirement from the requirement specification document we are analyzing it we are designing it coding is happening testing is happening and then it's a part of the implementation plan and it's deployed successfully so that's a forward traceability similarly we can do the backward traceability as well 
let's move on to a defined scope process. So once we have defined the requirement or scope management plan, once we've gathered requirements, then based on the requirements, we have to define scope. So how do we do that and what happens largely as a part of this? So as part of the defining scope, you would see that basically we're trying to describe what we're going to build, what we're going to create as part of this project and product. So whatever the product outcome or result that you're trying to achieve here, now you're going to define them together with stakeholders and you're going to be on the same page about what it is like. And uh, this is where you'll also be capturing about the in-scope and out-scope items. What is in-scope as a part of this project? What is not part of this project? So for example, if you are producing some software and that software is supporting only one language, which is English. So we need to be explicitly mentioning about that. Or if it is supporting two languages, so we have to mention explicitly about that. And it doesn't support beyond these two languages or three languages, which is being agreed between you and the customer. Acceptance criteria for each of the deliverables that we produce by the end of each phase needs to be also explicitly captured. For example, when we talk about as a part of the acceptance criteria, when you come up with the requirement specification document as one of the deliverables, so then has to be some acceptance criteria agreed between when the customer will sign off that document when it fulfills certain acceptance criteria. So those needs to be explicitly put down here as a part of defining scope. What do we use really when it comes to the input to defining scope process? We refer to the project charter, project management plan, certain documents, enterprise environmental factors, and organizational process assets. So in terms of project management plan, we'll refer to scope management plan in particular. And in terms of certain project documents, few examples that I gave like assumption log. If there is any assumption around when we try to define scope, we'll have to explicitly mention about that assumption. And that really helps us. And we can also refer to requirements documentation, things like risk register, etc. So those are also very useful to refer to while working on this process. What kind of tools and techniques can we use? Expert judgment is one such a technique which is used in most of the processes that we work on. It's very useful. We can use decision making like a few things that I mentioned earlier as well. Multi-criteria decision analysis kind of a thing. Data analysis, again, trying to find out what are the options that we have and how we can choose the best possible option. So sort of an alternative analysis. Interpersonal and team skills. So this is where your facilitation skills will come into picture. Even if you want to run the meeting, you need those skills without which you won't be able to do that and product analysis in order to find out what is in scope and out of the scope of the product and the one that we are building. So we have to do the analysis of the product. What do we expect by the end of this process? By the end of this process, we should have project scope statement with us. So project scope statement will define ultimately about that product or a project that we are working on and largely what we want to achieve or what we want to build in that product or the project. And certain project documents will get updated as well. Like, for example, during your experience of defining scope, if you come across any assumption, you would like to log that. You want to also update requirement documentation. If in case there has been any change that you observed, you need to also go back and do that. Requirement traceability metrics needs to be updated because now you have identified all the requirements, put it into traceability. So you can update that if there is impact at all and stakeholder register based on your interaction with stakeholder. If you come across any change, then you would need to also update that. So now we have defined the scope management plan. We have started uh, gathering requirements. Based on the requirements, we have also created sort of a scope for that product or the project that we're working on. It's time now for us to break down that into smaller packages, which will make our life easy to work on. And that's a part of your create WBS. So WBS is your work breakdown structure. And as a part of work breakdown structure, what you try to achieve really? When we break down work into something which is more manageable, something which is easy to estimate, something which is easy to plan, and most importantly, based on this work breakdown structure, we actually come up with dependencies, we come up with schedule, we come up with you know estimate. So it's definitely very important for us to work upon. So work breakdown structure is one of the important processes within 
the project management and we need to make sure each work package that we create is broken down at such a level that we can estimate it it's not a large chunk of requirement it's a small chunk of requirement so if you're working on a hardware part then you should be able to break it down into the smaller smaller components smaller smaller deliverables so that you can estimate in terms of networking requirements in terms of hardware server requirements in terms of the other middlewares that you would need to build that so those needs to be very clearly defined so that we can estimate for each of these things what's the time required what's the money required and then we can derive the schedule and budget out of it so to do that we need to certainly refer to certain inputs project management plan project documents some of the documents which i mentioned earlier as well enterprise environmental factor and the opas or organizational process assets like for example when we create wbs there are various ways of creating wbs so you can have a phased way you can divide your entire project into various phases and you can just go on like for example requirement as a phase design as a phase development as a phase and within each of these phases you try to break down your scope items into the smaller more manageable packages so if it is a requirement then you would basically come up with how are you going to manage your requirements requirement specification document so that is one of the deliverables how are you going to collect requirements what are the various techniques who is going to work on each of these so you try to define these deliverables as small as possible which we can then assign to people later on in the form of tasks and then obviously it will be also useful when we estimate things as well what kind of tools and techniques can we use i think when it comes to create wbs there are a couple of things that we can do most important technique here is decomposition now as the name itself says decomposition is all about breaking down your larger piece of requirement into the smaller ones so whatever the scope item that you're working on just try to break it off into the smaller pieces which is like we call it as a work package and that work package is small enough to be completed within maybe around 40 hours or so so that's the rule of 40 that they follow but uh, it could vary so it could be 40 hours to 80 hours something which we can estimate something which is you know easy to learn about and which will also help us in the form of inputs when it comes to estimation of schedule and the budget expert judgment will you can certainly engage certain smes into this and take their views as well what we get by the end of this we'll get scope baseline and uh, what we will get is the project documents updation so project documents will get updated the scope baseline is something which is very important because you would baseline your scope now we use a lot of different tools on the project you might be using ms projects you might be using for example clarity there are certain tools that are available or simple people might be doing it in the excel spreadsheets as well so once we baseline the scope that any change over and above would be considered as a new requirement and it has to go through the change control board etc whatever the process that is being agreed between you and the customer and uh, the project documents again some of the documents that i've already mentioned to you could be assumption log or could be the stakeholder list so those will get updated as a result of this so if we have to just quickly summarize what we've covered we started off with the scope management plan as one of the processes we defined it and we created that now we know the approach on the project about managing scope then we started off with how are we going to collect requirements on the project what kind of inputs we can refer to what kind of tools and techniques we can refer to etc based on that we define scope of the project so i have a scope baseline now and uh, i also have a traceability metrics etc now all this information is going to be really useful when i do the next process which is about validating scope so validating scope is all about understanding whatever the deliverables that i have completed whether those deliverables meet acceptance criteria or not so there is something called as the acceptance process and this acceptance process will certainly help us in increasing the probability of final product service or result acceptance and this is clearly defined between you and the customers for each deliverable that we are producing what is the acceptance criteria so if it is a high level design document that i am producing on the project when would my customer accept that or when would my customer approve that high level design document so i move on to the low level design document if you are working in a waterfall way 
So validate scope is important process from that point of view. What we can use as part of uh, input, of course, we need to refer to project management plan, especially scope requirement and the scope baseline. These three things are important from validate scope point of view. So I would refer to the requirement management plan and the scope baseline, of course. Project documents, like uh, there are certain documents that we can refer to here. For example, lessons learned document, or if I have got a quality reports or certain requirement documentation, and most importantly, traceability metrics. I'll refer to the traceability metrics as well. Then I would have verified deliverable, which is the one that you have actually produced and verified, and work performance data. So work performance data would have the actual progress of the work that you're making on the project. Typically, work performance data is captured in the tool that you're using. So if you're using MS projects or if you're using Clarity, whichever the tool that you're using, your actual work performance data is captured. So what's your planned activities and what's your actual activities that you have completed? So all this data is captured as a part of that. What kind of tools and techniques can we use here? Especially in validating scope, you would have few things, couple of things at least that you can use. One is about inspection. So you are actually inspecting that, okay, there are certain acceptance criteria that are given by the customer and I have already produced that deliverable. So does it really meet the acceptance criteria or not? So I'm doing these regular inspections, which will actually help me in getting closer and closer to the acceptance criteria of the deliverable that I'm producing. And obviously decision-making techniques would certainly help in terms of getting opinion from people as well. What do I get out of this? I would get the accepted deliverable. By the end of this process, I would know whether my customer have already accepted it, considering that this meets acceptance criteria or not. Work performance information. So work performance information will be one of the output. As I mentioned earlier, it will come from the tool. If there is any change at all during the review, during the inspection, typically what happens, you are showing the deliverable to the customer and you're trying to show that how it meets the acceptance criteria. But there could be change. There could be like based on what you have shown to the customer, customer might just suggest you a few changes. So that might be a part of your change request, which will follow the change request cycle. And certain project documents will get updated like lessons learned document or requirements document or even for that matter requirement traceability document would also get updated if required so this is what we can expect out of validate scope process so now that we have done like we've come up with a plan we have gathered requirements we have defined the scope we also validated requirements it's important now for us to control that so that the scope creep can be avoided scope creep Avoidance is very important, and that's where the project manager's role comes into picture, ensuring that the scope is defined so well that there is no need or the scope creep doesn't happen. So let's talk about last and the most important process, which is about control scope. As part of control scope, we'll look into, first of all, what is it really? This comes as a part of the monitoring process, and this is where we try to monitor status of the project and product scope. And whatever the changes that are there needs to be incorporated to the scope baseline, which is maintained throughout the project. As we've discussed already that once we have defined the scope, we have to also come up with the scope baseline, right? So once it is baseline, once it is agreed, over and above, if there is any change, it has to go through a change process. So that's the part of your control scope and monitoring. What kind of inputs I need to refer to for this? I would need, of course, the project management plan. I would need project documents, work performance data, and OPAs. So all of these we have already discussed earlier as well. So like, for example, in this case, project documents, like I would need lessons learned documents, which would be very useful to me. And there are certain tools and techniques which will be useful, like data analysis. I would do the trend analysis, for example. I would also be able to do the alternative analysis, etc. And based on that, what I will get as a part of the control scope is the work performance so work performance uh, this is where i will come to know about uh, what's the kind of progress that i'm making on the project is it uh, in line with what i have planned or is it like i'm behind the schedule or ahead of the schedule or how am i doing since we're talking about scope then how am i doing with respect to the scope change requests if there is any new change that the customer would like to introduce so that will definitely be the output which will go to the process where the change is going to be processed Project management plan will get updated if required. Project documents 
might get updated stakeholder register or for that matter assumption log traceability metrics so any of these documents wherever there is impact as a result of the control scope process would need to be updated now as you all know project schedule is very very important especially from the point of view of the project manager because project manager is ultimately responsible for ensuring that the project is delivered within the schedule and hence as i mentioned earlier that the schedule management is one of the most important knowledge areas that we have within the 10 knowledge areas that we talk about so apart from the other knowledge areas that we cover as a part of the project management trainings like risk management or for that matter stakeholder management resource management etc one of the important one is definitely the project schedule management in this webinar today what we will talk about is basically within the schedule management what are some of the important tools and the techniques that we can use in order to manage the schedule effectively in order to derive and develop the schedule of the project effectively so we will take a look at those skills tools and techniques that are required and apart from that we will also look into the monitoring and controlling aspects of the project because as i mentioned that once we get started with the project activities it's very very important for us to ensure that we control and manage those activities effectively in order to deliver the project within the agreed schedule we will definitely talk about how to do the monitoring and controlling of the scheduling activities not only that we will also understand the importance of timely completion of the project and in order to achieve that how we can approach the schedule management activities in an organized manner so that we will have a better control over the schedule that we have derived so we are going to actually go through all the processes within the schedule management at a high level and feel free to ask if you have any questions during this webinar so let's get started with the high level overview of the schedule management so, so talking about the project schedule now it's important for us to understand few aspects around the schedule management first is of course the scheduling methods there are various scheduling methods that we use now when we talk about scheduling as you know that we approach the project scheduling in a very systematic manner when we refer to the pimbok while working on the projects because pimbok has prescribed and has given the various guidelines and has given various principles for doing the effective schedule management there are certain scheduling methods which are also being given to us and they are available to us which we can refer to while working and deriving the project schedule so project information will definitely is going to be one of the important factors while deriving the project schedule because that's going to be the input for us when we arrive at the project schedule so if you look at this information whatever you see on the slide like this the project information is input based on which we can derive the schedule using the scheduling tools and with the right set of skills that you possess as a project manager or as a part of the project that you're working on then you will be able to derive the project schedule effectively so there are these aspects there are these components when we work on the schedule management we need to have enough information about the activities about the phases about the milestones about the project background context etc and then once we have that we can apply the right scheduling tools which we are going to talk about very soon and there are certain scheduling methods which we can use as well in order to approach the deriving of the schedule in a very very organized manner so that's how it typically happens on the project what we get at the end is basically the plan so when we actually begin working on the schedule management activities one of the important part is coming up with the schedule model so that's where we essentially capture the various dates of the key milestones of the key activities and we come up with a schedule model which can be then tracked across the project life cycle so all these things are very very important from schedule management point of view and if these things are in place then you will be able to effectively manage the schedule of the project so let's just talk about the tailoring aspect of the schedule management now if you see the pimbox 6th edition it definitely focuses more on the tailoring aspect of the process and that's definitely very important as a consultant when we go to the organizations and when we try to work with those teams one of the important responsibility that we have is 
how we can tailor the existing process in order to make it more effective in order to make it in such a way tailor it in such a way that the project teams can find it very easy to implement so some of the tailoring aspects we will talk about so when we talk about the scheduling process particularly one of the factor we need to take into consideration is the life cycle approach so there are various life cycles of the project that we talk about it could be adaptive life cycle predictive life cycle or hybrid life cycles or we have the iterative and incremental life cycle so which project life cycle typically you are going to adopt to or you are going to basically apply or which is that approach of the or for the project life cycle have you really chosen or have you agreed as a team so that's one of the important inputs which needs to be considered availability of the resources will actually help us in tailoring the process especially with respect to the schedule because we need to come up with we need to have the resource calendar in place we need to do the resource smoothing activities we also need to do the resource leveling activities so for that all we need to know what is the resource availability technology support also has an important role to play so if you have a better technology in place then obviously while doing the estimation of the activities you would factor that in so if you are working on an it project for example and if you have the right set of automation tools in place if you have a continuous integration continuous delivery pipeline in place then obviously that will make that much easier doing those activities with respect to release management or with respect to deployment of the software package from one environment to the other environment so that will have an impact on the duration of the activities and various project dimensions which could be from the customer's point of view it could be from the scope point of view or it could be other angles of the project or dimensions of the projects that we talk about so these things needs to be taken into consideration especially with respect to coming up with the project schedule now talking about the various processes on the schedule part of the project let's just first understand the various processes that are involved as a part of the schedule management it starts with planning and that's how typically it happens if you pick up any knowledge area one of the important things that we should be doing is the planning and once we have a plan in place that will make it that much easier for us to then just stick to the plan or just refer to the plan and uh, execute the schedule management activities so once we have a plan in place we try to understand what activities are involved into this project so whichever the project that you are working on it could be research and development project it could be an it product development project or it could be any manufacturing project that you are working on so what are some of the activities that are involved into the project so you come up with a list of those activities once we have a list of activities we need to understand the sequencing of those activities and this is where we take into consideration the dependencies what is the dependency of one activity over other and for that at times we need to factor in various assumptions and all that needs to be also documented so hence the next process is sequence activities followed with which once we have a list of activities once we know the sequencing of the activities then we can certainly come up with the duration that is required to complete that activity so if it is requirement gathering as a phase within the it project and we have activity of conducting the requirement gathering workshop so once we know the sequencing of this activity then we can certainly be able to estimate the duration that is required to perform the requirement or gathering workshop so that's how typically it happens and then once we put together all the activities and we estimate activity duration of each of the activities that we have listed down we just put it together and we can just roll it up or we can just totally it up in order to come up with the project schedule once we have a schedule in place it's important for us then to continuously monitor and control that schedule so it's a very very logical sequence of the schedule management processes we start with planning and we end with controlling the plan controlling the schedule that we come up with now what we'll do is we will understand these processes bit in more detail now we have a training program on pmp that's where we discuss all these processes in depth and we spend hours together on just understanding the schedule management activities so as i said this is one of the important knowledge areas and definitely this knowledge area consumes good amount of time within the pmp training program as well so on this webinar we may not be able to achieve or cover these topics with the same depth of knowledge but we will certainly be able to cover in terms of width and what all is there at a high level from the basic fundamentals perspective
So starting with the planning part, whenever we come up with the planning aspect of the schedule management, the way this whole thing is organized, I'm sure by now some of you may be knowing that we have certain inputs that we consider. For each of the processes that we work on, there are always certain inputs that we consider. And then there are certain tools and techniques that we need to use. And what we get by the end of the process is some output. So we have also organized these slides in the similar manner. So for each of these processes, we will be understanding what are some of the key inputs for the process? What are some of the tools and techniques that we can use in order to effectively work on that process? And what we can expect by the end of that process? So let's just get started with the first process within the schedule management, which is plan schedule management. So starting with the planning aspect, just understanding the background of this process. So this is the process where we will be coming up with the plan for schedule management. So what all activities we should be performing as a part of the schedule management is what is documented here. What are the procedures with respect to those activities? What policies we should be adhering to? What kind of a schedule model, for example, we should be following? What kind of a estimation technique we should be following? So all those things needs to be certainly captured as a part of this plan. So we will definitely be able to do the effective planning. We'll be able to develop, manage, execute, and control the project schedule if all those things are documented effectively. Like for example, what is going to be my approach when it comes to the sequencing of activities, right? So I can document that approach. What is going to be the estimation technique that I should be using? Is it the port technique that I'll be using? Or is it the bottom-up estimation that I'll be using? Or should we be using on the project estimation, the analogous estimation? Or should we be using the expert judgment, etc.? So collectively, as a team, we actually agree to that and we document it, we put it together in the plan. Now, this also gives guidance. This also gives direction on the project while working throughout the project. We need to refer to the plan wherever we are stuck or if in case the project manager is not available, if team wants to refer to the plan and get going, I think this is the document that we can look forward to. So plan is very important. Now to starting with the inputs for each of these processes, as I mentioned, let's understand for planning part, what kind of input that we can look forward to. Certainly when we do the project management as a part of the scheduling part, it's important for us to know the scope. Now we are coming up with the schedule. Remember that we are working on the project and we are coming up with the project schedule. Now in order to do that, we need to know the list of activities. We need to know the sequencing of the activities. We need to estimate those activities. Now for that, we need to obviously know what is the project scope and any other information which you might get from the various documents on the project could be the project charter is one of the important input that we can refer to that will also give us an idea about some of the key milestones. Suppose when am I supposed to be completing the requirement specification document? When am I supposed to be completing the high level design or the low level design or the built activities? What is the date by which when I should be taking up the UAT sign off or the business acceptance testing or user acceptance testing sign off, etc. So those are some of the key milestones on the project that I should be aware about which will come from the project charter. Now, apart from that, there are also a few more things that we need to be aware about while working on the scheduling aspect of the project. So before I move ahead, I can see here question and this uh, question is from Rajat and he is trying to understand about the various factors which will affect the plan. All right, that's great. Thank you for that question. And this is a good question. Definitely. As I mentioned, when we started with this session, some of the factors that we mentioned, what will affect the deriving of the schedule of the project? So when we talk about the planning part, these are some of the factors which are going to really affect, which are your input factors. If you talk about the overall schedule of the project, as I mentioned, the resource availability will affect, the motivation of the resources will affect, the kind of technology that you're using will also affect, the uh, dimensions of the projects that I mentioned, like scope of the project, the time, the budget, the risks, etc. So those things will also affect. So these factors will certainly have an impact on deriving the overall schedule of the project. So I hope that answers uh, your question. Right, thanks for the confirmation. So coming back to now the planning part of the schedule management, the other area of the input that we talk about is enterprise environmental factors. So there are certain factors as an organization, there are certain internal and external factors which will have an impact. One of the example could be the cultural aspects of the organization. How is the overall culture and the structure of the organization? Is it too hierarchical structure? 
how is the general culture is it too inclusive or is it too much process oriented is it autocratic so what kind of leadership style generally it is followed so some of these aspects will also have an impact resource availability what kind of a project management software are you using there are various example of the pm softwares some of you may be already using softwares like maybe there are softwares from the microsoft so ms project could be one of the example or there is primevera or clarity is there from ca so there are various such a softwares which are there for managing the project for managing the schedule so which one are you using or the commercial aspects that are published on the project so some of these things will have an impact as well as inputs to the planning part apart from that there is something called as opas which is nothing but organizational process assets now you will find the enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets will have an impact or will be the input factors in many processes almost in all the processes so if you talk about opas opas will give us a lot of data about the historical information about the projects so very very useful especially if you are implementing the techniques like analogous estimation historical estimation or parametric estimation this data will be very very useful to refer to or if you want to refer to the plan what kind of a template are we going to use for a schedule management plan so that template will come from the opas so these are some of the inputs that we can look forward to what kind of a tools and techniques can we use on this expert judgment so we can engage people who have got previous experience of doing the schedule management and take their inputs we can analyze the data we can analyze the data and this data could be basically the alternative analysis so for example make or buy decisions so if we have the problem statement if you have the context of the project then obviously the kind of solution that is being agreed that will also have an impact on the planning that you're doing for the schedule management so we have to analyze the data or reserves analysis could be one example so management reserves how would those be put into the plan or for that matter certain buffers that we come up with so how do we go about doing or putting that while working on the plan so we have to analyze the data and that actually helps meetings could be very simple yet very very important tool that we use on the project and meetings we need to know when to conduct the meetings whom to invite for the meetings and how we can engage all the stakeholders effectively in order to come up with the plan for doing the schedule management now what do we get at the end of this process is obviously we'll get the schedule management plan so schedule management plan will essentially have some of the important aspects like the schedule model what is my project schedule model so as i mentioned the project schedule model is nothing but my project schedule with some of the key dates some of the key milestones some of the key activities included into that level of accuracy what kind of level of accuracy should i consider so is it like and that's something which needs to be agreed by everybody all the stakeholders so when i am doing the estimation would it be okay with the 10% plus or minus as far as the estimation of the activity duration is concerned or should it be 20% or should it be just 5% so depending on the project depending on the stakeholder agreement you come up with the level of accuracy that's required you need a measurement what are we doing in the estimation is it in hours is it in person days what is that unit that you're going to use control threshold so as i said that when we come up with the estimation so we need to know that how much should be the threshold how much should be the upper limit or the lower limit which we can still withstand with which we can still live with you know in the variations so we should be knowing that like in level of accuracy we should say what is the confidence level with which we are planning this activity similarly control threshold will have the positive and negative in terms of plus or minus control threshold for the schedule of the project so it could be maybe plus 10 and the minus 10 percent schedule variations are allowed okay or is fine to basically something which you know everybody is agreed that control threshold of 5% plus or minus or 10% plus or minus is something that could be absorbed then the project schedule model maintenance so this is where we talk about the monitoring part of it so how we can monitor the schedule how we can come up with the variances and monitor it effectively and organizational procedures links so that will come from your ops and that will be a part of ops later as well rules of performance measurements how are we going to do the performance measurement on the project how are we going to from where this data will come release an iteration length so if you are working in small iteration so we can also agree upon whether iteration should be 3 weeks or 4 weeks or what should be the duration reporting formats if you are using any tool so should it be automated or how it should be so that talks about the planning aspect of the project 
So that is the first process. Now we're moving to the next process, which is about defining activity. So once we have the plan in place, how are we going to approach the schedule management and what's my plan for doing that? Then I can get started with the first activity, which is my defining activities. That's another important process that we need to work upon. So this is the process where we come up with the various activities by referring to the scope of the project. So once I have a scope in place, obviously what I would be doing is referring to the scope. I will come up with some of the key deliverables of the project. I will break them down into the smaller work packages and those will be then broken further down into the activities. Then each of these activities can be then estimated. So if it is the requirements, then requirements will be broken down into the various smaller activities. So I can certainly be able to share with you a very quick example, which will help us in relating it better as well. So as you can see on the screen here, so if it is a project management as one of the phase that we are working on, so we could be performing various activities. It could be identifying the focus group targets or perform the focus group meetings or conduct surveys. So these are some of the activities that we have agreed upon. So I have a work package by the name project requirements. Now project requirement is further broken into various activities. This is what essentially this talks about defining activities. So one of the things that we use here, the technique that we use here is a decomposition. We decompose these work packages into the smaller activities, which will then help us in estimating better. Now, what input can we use in terms of defining activities? First is, of course, we refer to the project management plan in order to understand the approach that we are going to use on defining activities. We will also be able to refer to some of the internal and external factors like if there is some commercial information available which is published and i can refer to that information in order to come up with the estimation so that could be one factor it could be the pmis which is project management information system so it could be ms projects or it could be prime vera or it could be clarity whichever the tool that you are using under ops i can refer to some of the processes how we can do the activity decomposition for example or how i can refer to some of the past knowledge on this project so there could be the knowledge repositories which i can refer to which will give me some insights into doing the activity definitions as well as some planning informal planning activities could also be scheduled so that's the input what kind of a tools and techniques i can think of when i define the activities i can certainly take opinions of the experts who can give us idea about how we should be breaking down these work packages into activities how i can define the work packages etc decomposition is a technique which i told you about so i can break down this work package into the various activities so requirement is broken down into various activities as i took this example similarly we can also use a technique called as rolling wave planning now rolling wave planning and uh, something called as a progressive elaboration goes hand in hand so as we go ahead working on the project things starts unfolding and we keep on getting more and more information about the phases about the milestones about the requirements scope etc so rolling wave plan is nothing but like whatever the information that i have today based on that i do a bit of a detailed planning for next one month or two months and the information that i may not be having in detail maybe after two months or after three months or for next three months i would do the high level planning so the detailed planning for one month or two months or maybe a three months okay or could be just for 15 days and then high level planning for rest of the time period so that's the thing but my rolling wave planning so that's another technique which we can use meetings again something which is very useful always what do we expect by the end of defining activities process the first thing is of course we will come up with a list of activities like the one that i showed you so if i have a requirement as a work package then i can break down that into various activities what i would get by the end of this process is the list of activities the another thing is activity attributes every activity will have its own attributes so for example if it is identify focus group target is an activity then i would need to put some attributes around this it could be assumptions for this activity start date end date dependencies of succeeding preceding activity etc so those things will be a part of the attributes of the activities and those attributes will certainly help us in uh, estimating the duration as well as we go ahead 
milestone list. For each of these projects, we'll have key milestones. Like by the end of the project requirement phase, what I will get is project requirement finalized or signed off or requirement specification document. So that's my milestone. So when I prepare this document, that is going to be my milestone. So I need to know the list of milestones, the change request. So since I'm referring to the scope, I'm decomposing the scope, I'm getting into the scope in a very detailed manner. So that means while interacting with the stakeholders and the customers, I would also be able to sometimes get the change requests, whatever is missing to be added. So that might come as a change request, which we need to deal with. Project management plan will also get updated with respect to if there is anything that needs to be changed. If there is any specific learning, we just go back and update the plan as well. So that's the defining activity. So just to quickly summarize, we started with the project schedule management as one of the important knowledge areas. So I told you that schedule management starts with planning the schedule management for the project. Once we have a plan in place, that's where we define the approach of doing the schedule management. Then we come up with the list of activities as a part of the define activity process. So once we have a list of activities, then the next logical thing will be sequencing them. And that is what is done as a part of sequence activities process. So let's get into the sequence activity process quickly. So in this process, as the name says, this process is all about just putting together the activities and just sequencing them. So we need to understand the dependencies and relation between the activities. So sometimes, as I mentioned, we need to factor in the constraints around activities. We need to factor in the assumptions. So all of that will be a part of your sequencing activities. Now, while doing this, while sequencing the activities, what should I refer to as input? The first thing, of course, the plan. So that will give me the approach about how am I going to sequence the activities. So that's why plan is important. We also need to refer to the scope baseline, obviously, because ultimately these activities are broken down based on the kind of scope that we are working on. Project documents like activity attributes. So when I'm sequencing the activities, I need to understand the various aspects about the activity. So those are nothing but the attributes. So I need to know the assumption for each of the activity. I need to know the complexity of each of the activity. Okay, I need to know the preceding and the succeeding activity. I need to know the other aspects related to that activity so that I can sequence them as well. So activity list obviously is important. Assumption log, as I mentioned, around the activities and the milestone so that I can sequence the activity accordingly to achieve that milestone. Under EEF or enterprise environmental factors, we can also use PMIS tools, as I mentioned, like Clarity or Workbench could be another one for, again, sequencing the activities. Scheduling tool could be used specifically. There are certain scheduling tools like Workbench could be one of the example and organizational work authorization system. So that will give you an idea about who is going to work on what. So that's another area which we can explore. Under OPS, we can refer to some of the templates for sequencing activities if they're already defined. And we can also get access to various project files, which will give you a lot of inputs while working through this. And what kind of tools and techniques can we use while sequencing activities? The most important one here is precedence diagramming method. So as a part of precedence diagramming method, we should be able to put these activities into sequence by using the activity on node or activity on arrow kind of a methods. And I can just quickly show you how the precedence diagramming method looks like just for you to get an idea. So as you can see here, the precedence diagramming method, this is where we basically put the activities on node and uh, we just sequence them and we put it in a diagrammatic manner so that we would know how the activity flows one by one and uh, the overall flow of the activities, the flow of the work. And at the same time, that actually helps us in understanding dependencies and sequencing them better. Dependency determination, so that's another important aspect. And leads and lags. So leads and lags are nothing but if I'm saying that I have got a lead over the activity, that means I can actually start that activity by three days or two days early. But sometimes uh, there are lags, so that means I have to wait for that activity to start. So for activity to start, so if you take a very quick example of, let's say, painting a house. So when you paint the house, you need to first remove the flakes of the old paint. And unless that is removed, you can't really start the painting activity. So can I say that in order to remove those flakes, I would need three days. So I can't start the painting activity. At least we need to wait for three days there. So there is a lag for painting, which is a succeeding activity. In order to start that succeeding activity, 
I need to wait for at least three days. So that is my lag. And sometimes there are activities which we can start in parallel as well. So one of the quick example could be you're working on a high level design and the low level design. So you have a high level design in hand, but I'm sure you know you can also start working on the low level design. So that means you have got a lead and you can actually start three days early or two days early. So those things also actually helps later on when we decide about fast tracking and crashing of the project. And I'm going to talk about that as we proceed. What do we get by the end of it? Obviously, we should be getting the list of activities which are sequenced. So project schedule network diagram is what we should be getting. And as a result of any changes or as a result of any new learning, even we update the project documents. So that's what we can certainly expect. So I'm just going to show you very quickly the project network diagram so that you will get a fair idea about how the network diagram looks like. And yeah, in fact, this could be one of the example of the way a network diagram is drawn. So you will get it from the tool itself these days because there are effective tools which can give you the network diagram, which will then help us in calculating the critical path, etc. So that was about sequencing part of the activities which we can do by using the PDM or precedence diagram method. So that is something which is a very, very useful method. All right. So moving to the next process, which talks about estimate activity duration. So when we estimate the activity duration, now we have a list of activities. We have also sequenced those activities and created the network diagram. That's where we are. And now we have to estimate the activity duration. So this is where essentially we come up with the time period required for each of the activities. So if I have this list of activities, then I can easily come up with the time period that is required for conducting surveys or for preparing the market research findings. I would need maybe 12 hours or for consolidate analyze data. I would need maybe 18 hours. So I would be able to come up with the estimation for each of these activities in whatever the unit that's agreed and that's basically agreed and put and captured in the plan. And therefore, as a part of the inputs, one of the things that is required is the project management plan, which will give us an idea about schedule management plan. So there is a question here before I proceed. And this question is from Sheetal and she is asking that why project management plan is mentioned over here and why not the schedule management plan only? Okay, that's a good question. And, and I have seen that some people have a bit of a confusion sometimes around this. So one thing that we need to understand when we say the project management plan, it comprises of all the other subsidiary management plans and those subsidiary management plans could be the schedule management plan scope management plan risk management plan okay resource management plan so all these plans put together becomes your project management plan so when i say project management plan it will definitely comprises of the schedule management plan as well so that's the that's the point over here so we would need to refer to the project management plan which will essentially give us an access to the schedule management plan as well. So I hope that gives you an idea about why usually you find that as one of the inputs. Okay, thank you for the confirmation. Moving to the next part, which is another input is, of course, some of the documents which we need to refer to, like activity attributes, because when I'm doing the estimation, I need to refer to the characteristics, the attributes of the activities, list of activities, any assumption around the activity will help, any past lessons will help while estimating the duration. Of course, the list of milestones, which will help us, right? So if I know this particular milestone has to be completed by this particular date, and I need to then find out whether I can fit that into the schedule or not. Project team who will be actually doing the estimation as well. And apart from that, under the enterprise environmental factors, I'm just going to give you some of the examples could be productivity metric, which we can certainly refer to. Productivity metric will help us in coming up with the estimation for the activities. So if I know that the market research data analysis previously took us maybe 18 hours. Now on this project also, it could took 18 hours at least, right? So that kind of a productivity analysis or the productivity metric actually helps us in understanding the productivity of the employees or the team members. And that will certainly give, give us input while doing the estimation. Another thing could be the location of the team members. So it could also have an impact. The location of the team members, the time zone differences would also be having an impact. Under OPS, project calendar needs to be referred to scheduling methodologies. We also need to refer to what is the scheduling methodology that we're going to use really. And there are various methodologies that we're going to touch upon very soon. So that time you will be able to cover those. In terms of technique, tools and technique for doing the estimation. One of the important tool is, of course, 
expert judgment which is very very simple yet very powerful tool that we can use Another is analogous estimation. This is where we compare it with the previous project and we estimate the ongoing project. Parametric estimation is based on the various parameters of the project. And a very quick example of the parametric estimation if we have to take, like let's say you're working on a software project and there are certain parameters that we can think of. One of the things could be database connections or input validations. So if I know that input validation is a medium complex task and for that usually it takes one hour. If it is medium complex so if i have three such a tasks to perform i can easily say that that will take three hours so based on these parameters i can actually come up with the estimation three point estimation is also called as the program evaluation and review technique or put so this is where we factor in the most likely pessimistic and the optimistic estimation so all these three estimations are put together and uh, the activity duration is derived out of that and then of course the meetings that's where we engage all the stakeholders Data analysis also helps us the previous data analysis or uh, for that matter even factoring in various constraints of the project and uh, analyzing the data. So those things also really gives us an idea about the various uh, aspect of the uh, scheduling decision making techniques. So there are various options that are explored when we are doing the scheduling. We can actually think of the various decisions. So make or buy decision could be one such example. So if I have to buy this solution as it is, how long would it take? And if I have to build this completely, how long would it take? So make and buy decision. Bottom up estimation is what we um, have been talking about here. When we decompose the work package into smaller activities and we estimate each of the activity, we just totally tough from the bottom up and then we derive the project schedule. Now, what do we expect by the end of the activity duration? So obviously we should be expecting the duration estimates for each of these activities rolled it up at a project level. We get a duration of the project. Basis of estimates. So why are we estimating what we are estimating? So what is the basics of the estimation? So we can certainly document as much as possible. When am I saying that the data analysis of the market research would take uh, 18 hours? So why is it so? What is the basis for that? So maybe I have factored some resources with some skills. Maybe I have factored, maybe I've assumed probably that all the data is available and there is no dependency on anybody. So what are those assumptions? What are those considerations for estimating? So that's my basis of estimation. Then in almost all the processes, you'll find project documents getting updated based on the new information or based on the changes that you might be receiving as part of the project. So just to connect you back, what all we covered so far? So we started with the schedule management plan. We created a plan. Then we started with coming up with the list of activities. Then we sequenced those activities. We created the network diagram, etc. And then we started estimating the activity duration for each of these activities. So once we do that, then obviously we can come up with the schedule. So let's understand how to come up with schedule as a part of the develop schedule process. So this is where we actually derive the project schedule based on whatever the work that we have done so far and by referring to the schedule model as well. What kind of input can we think of? The first thing is, of course, the plan, because plan always gives us the approach for each of these processes. What is the approach that's decided on the given project? And that's why we need to keep referring to the plan. And since we are deriving the schedule, we need to refer to the scope baseline as well. The other documents, the project documents like the attributes of the activity, assumption log, milestone list, etc. So those documents will be very useful here. Agreements. Now we are talking about developing a schedule. So if you are engaging any third party, we have certain agreements with them. So we need to also take them into consideration so that we'll factor in those contractual commitments while developing the schedule. Now let's move on to the other factors like enterprise environmental factors. So we also need to refer to some of the communication channels or scheduling tools which will actually help us in doing these things maybe in a bit professional way bit swiftly as well so i did mention some of the examples of the scheduling tools as well communication channels so for example if you are engaging the third party vendors if you are engaging the various stakeholders how are you going to communicate to them what is the communication channel which is agreed upon so that's another thing also the scheduling methodology some of them which we already covered what kind of tools and techniques can we use while developing schedule the first is of course the network analysis 
so we do the uh, schedule network analysis i also showed you the uh, network diagram so once we do the network analysis we actually come up with the schedule that's the minimum time that is required to complete this project what are some of the critical tasks that needs to be performed and that's also a part of your critical path method so critical part method as i mentioned to you that if the network diagram is created the critical path is nothing but the path of the activities which we need to complete one by one where there is no float so you will not get any extra time to perform those activities so all those activities need to be performed based on the estimated time that you have estimated for those activities so that is also the minimum time that is required for you to complete the project so that's your critical path there could be more than one critical path and it's important for us to know those critical paths on the project data analysis so again we, we did speak about data analysis as a technique resource optimization so how i can utilize the resources effectively in order to be uh, productive on the project the another technique could be pmis use of the project management information systems if you are not using it already leads and lags i did mention about and uh, schedule compression at times we might need to use the schedule compression techniques like fast tracking and crashing so fast tracking is a technique where we actually start working on the activities in parallel so if you are a bit of behind the schedule and you want to fast track what you do is that you identify the activities which you can start working in parallel so you do that crashing on the other hand puts more people on the activities crashing might increase the risk on the project so we need to do we need to monitor it very very closely but those are some of the schedule compression activities which we discuss in detail in the pmp training program agile release plan so if you are working in an agile way we can also come up with a release plan it could be quarterly release or a monthly release or you may even deploy it or release it in production by the end of every sprint depending on your technical readiness depending on your technical excellence as well as the kind of team members that you have on the project now what do we expect by the end of develop schedule obviously we should be expecting the project schedule so let's take a quick look at what do we expect the first thing is going to be schedule baseline so we come up with the project schedule this project would need maybe six months to complete or one year to complete or whatever the schedule that you have come up with and whatever the unit that you have agreed in which you have to present the other thing is the schedule data so you have a data of the milestones you have a basis of estimation you have the sequencing of activities so all this is nothing but your scheduling data that you have the project calendar so you would know the key milestones and the key dates to be referred to track project management plan updates on a regular basis with any change requests if with any new learning we need to do that yeah so we just spoke about the change requests as well so once we have the project schedule in place now it's very important for us to control that and this is what is covered as part of the control schedule as a process so control schedule talks about now since we have the uh, list of activities we have sequenced them we also came up with the duration for each of these activities we have also come up with the resources that are going to work on those activities we also factored in various things like schedule constraints we have done the analysis etc of those things and we come up with even the schedule model which is giving us an idea about various important dates and the key milestones as well so how we can control that so in order to control the project schedule it's important for us to first refer to some of the things like the project schedule management plan itself as well as the scope baseline the another thing that we need to refer to is the list of project documents so what are some of those documents so it could be the activity list it could be assumption log it could be milestone list so some of these documents would be very important for us to refer to another area is the opa so opa will give you an idea about monitoring and reporting methods so what are those monitoring and reporting methods are you going to do the uh, any statistical analysis or quantitative analysis of the data or is it going to be just the qualitative analysis by taking the feedback the formal and informal ways of doing the controlling as well so that could be another uh, quick example work performance data is very important because once you start performing or working on those activities then you need to come up with the data which will give you an idea about what was planned and what is achieved so that's planned versus actual data is nothing but your work performance data what kind of a tools and techniques can we use data analysis which we did discuss critical path method which we did cover as well pmis which is project management information system which will give you some of the ready made matrices in order to monitor the schedule effectively resource optimization for ensuring that the schedule is managed effectively 
schedule compression so again schedule compression we've covered a bit on that as well and lead and lags so again lead and lags we can certainly factor in and what we get by the end of the control schedule activity is the work performance information which is nothing but what was my planned schedule what is my actual schedule which will help me in deriving whether i am ahead of the schedule whether i am behind the schedule of the project or how am i performing schedule forecast so based on the trend then i can actually forecast whether would we be able to complete this project within the given schedule or would we go ahead of the schedule or would we go you know behind the schedule what would be the case so we can forecast it for next six months or three months or whatever the time period that you have to forecast change requests so how we can factor in those change requests maybe as a part of the change request management process project management plan will also get updated as a result of that and certain documents like assumption log the lessons learned etc will also get updated so now let us look at what is project cost management is all about so when we say project cost management we need to understand it basically includes about the cost which gets incurred the expanding value of the monetary investment which is being done by the organization so project cost management basically includes the processes involved in planning estimating budgeting financing funding managing and controlling costs so the project can be completed within approved budget so this requires a detailed cost management plan where the cost of the resources which is required to be used in the project has to be assessed and understood estimated and budgeted which provide the details of how to plan manage and control the project cost in relation to the cost baseline and the cost variances so project cost management plan is one of the subsidiary plan in project management plan so techniques like earned value management are used to check how the cost performance is happening throughout the project so primarily project cost management is concerned with cost of resources needed to complete the project activities and it will consider the effects of project decisions on the subsequent recurring cost of using maintaining and supporting the product service or results of the project so now further to understand what is cost management is all about the overview of it so we need to look at what are the tailoring considerations made while doing the project cost management so the tailoring considerations includes knowledge management estimating and budgeting earned value management use of agile approach and governance when as in knowledge management so it is very important for an organization to have a formal knowledge management and financial database repositories that project manager is required to use that is readily accessible so that right decisions can be made taken at the right time when as estimating and budgeting it requires to look at understanding approximating what is the amount of money which is going to incur in that particular project and accordingly the money the monetary resources has to be allocated to the project based on that project will be delivered and project manager should ensure the project will be delivered within that budgeted value monetary value which is allocated to the project so earned value management is a technique what is used to check how the project management relating to cost management in specific schedule management as well as scope management how it is performing comparison with the baselines of these triple constraints defined in the baselines of the project using a agile approach which means depending on what kind of approach is required for the project scenario so use of agile approach will be considered accordingly not necessarily that agile approach should be applicable to all the projects which is being done so governance governance when we say it's all about an authority one which sets the directions and it is very essential to have such directions set so that necessary controls are established through policies procedures and guidelines so next type of cost we come across involves fixed cost variable cost direct cost indirect cost and sunk cost when i say fixed cost so these are the cost that do not change throughout the project life cycle for example if a construction of a road is happening the excavators and bulldozers are fixed cost whereas when i say variable cost so the cost of this varies throughout the project for example hourly labor cost of material could vary as the project progresses 
So indirect cost and direct cost. If you look at that direct and indirect cost, direct cost refers to that cost which clearly assigned to the project on the labor materials which are directly involved in the project. When as an indirect cost, it is basically speaks about the cost involved in administration, basically overhead costs like indirect materials, utilities, tax, insurance, property, repairs, etc. So sunk cost basically refers to that cost which cannot be recovered after incurring it. For example, cost which has been incurred while paying a rent for the project facility, what is being utilized for doing the project, that cannot come back. That is called sunk cost. So analyzing various different types of cost will become very essential so that estimation, approximation and allocation of budget and also this understanding of the cost will also help in making right decisions, justifying whether we need to include such costs or not in the projects. Further, let us go and look at understanding cost management processes. So cost management processes includes basically four processes, plan cost management, estimate cost, determine budget and control cost. When I say plan cost management, plan cost management, estimate cost management and determine budget are part of planning process group, whereas control cost falls under monitoring and controlling process group. Now let us look at plan cost management. So plan cost management is the process of defining how the project's cost will be estimated, budgeted, managed, monitored and controlled. So it is the initial process of cost management where one has to define how the cost of the project will be looked at after estimation that needs to be monitored. How are you going to monitor and control? What is that particular cost it goes and incurs for a given project? So generally the techniques like WBS, work breakdown structure, which is basically done in scope management is considered. And when you do work breakdown structure, basically the technique of decomposition is used to break down the product into multiple levels and cost will be allocated from the bottom level of the WBS and it is bottom up estimate you consolidate upwards. So many techniques are used to do that like expert judgments, analogous estimation, parametric estimation, three point estimation, pert estimation. So these estimations includes basically the labor utilized, the material utilized, the equipment what is used as part of the project. All this will become a cost component. So this process, plan cost management process, gives a rough outline of the number of resources involved and shows the optimum path to the manage the project cost throughout the project life cycle. Inputs to this process includes project charter, project management plan, basically schedule management plan and risk management plan, enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets. The tools and techniques which are used for plan cost management process would be expert judgment, data analysis and meetings. The output of this process would be cost management plan. So cost management plan is one of the subsidiary plans where this particular plan will go and get consolidated into a bigger plan along with the other subsidiary plans. So when I say other subsidiary plans, we need to think about the scope management plan, schedule management plan, quality management plan, Likewise, we have a nine knowledge areas, means nine subsidiary plans, and all of these are consolidated in integration management knowledge area, and we will have a full plan consolidated. So next process is estimate cost. When I say estimate cost, it is a process of developing an approximation of cost of resources needed to complete the project work. So this is the second process in the project cost management after the cost management plan that helps in estimating the cost of the resources required for the project completion. Since cost is an important variable that ensures project success, one has to be very careful while producing the estimated amount of total project cost. So throughout the project life cycle, this process is performed at periodical intervals. A project manager uses various methods to estimate cost depending on amount of information available. So inputs to this process is project management plan like cost management plan, quality management plan, scope baseline, project scope statement, work breakdown structure, WBS dictionary. Project documents like lessons learned register, project schedule, resource requirement, risk register, then enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets. The tools used as part of this particular process, estimate cost would be expert judgment where involvement of the experts, mainly financial experts, experts who understand that particular project domain and the cost of it. 
So analogous estimation were consideration of historical information in terms of what was the estimation in the earlier project, how much it took to deliver this or do this activity or to acquire some resources. Based on that, you would do the estimation. Parametric estimation, extension of analogous estimation, where the parameter of current scenario is considered along with the historical information and estimation is done. Bottom-up estimation, as I mentioned earlier, you will have a work breakdown structure. At the bottom of the work breakdown structure, you are going to look at what are the resources required to accomplish that particular features, functionality or output. At the same time, looking at what activities are involved, what effort is involved and estimating based on that. Then once it is done at the lower level of WBS, that will be consolidated upwards. Once it is consolidated at the higher level of the WBS, one will have an entire estimation for the project. So next is three point estimation where the estimation of optimistic, pessimistic and most likely estimates are taken and average of that is obtained. So this requires a lot of discussion with an experts, the one who think that without any issues, what could be the estimation, considering what are the issues which would occur and what is that optimally I can accomplish. So pessimistic, optimistic and most likely view are taken while taking the average of it. So data analysis. Checking on all the data, what is available relating to this project and resources of this project, deliverables of this project and analyzing to estimate it. Then project management information system. So this helps to provide a lot of information and also a methods and approaches which would help in terms of estimating the cost. So decision making means decision making techniques involves a lot of exercise in terms of involving various different experts or maybe the people who are involved in the delivery people who understand the technology, people who understand the dynamics associated with that project and facilitate that discussions and make the decision. So output of this process includes cost estimates, basis of estimates. When we say basis of estimates, why are we saying it is so much? So if you estimate a cost for certain particular activity to be completed, why are we saying so much of estimate? What is the reason? So justifying that. So basis of estimate provides you the details. Then project documents updates. So next process would be determine budget. So determine budget is the process of aggregating the estimated cost of individual activities or work packages and establishing the authorized cost baseline. So this is a third process in cost management knowledge area. So this involves the activities a task summed up to identify what is that particular cost baseline would be. So cost baseline of the budget include all the authorized funds that are essential for project execution. So the budget basically includes various reserves of contingency. When I say contingency, we are speaking about the risk. So risk identification has to happen. So which happens in risk management knowledge area. So risk identification, assessing and analyzing the risk and also defining the risk responses. Once that is done, what cost it incurs while doing it? That will be put as a contingency reserve along with all the efforts cost or material cost which has been consolidated upwards in WBA structure and then adding contingency reserve to it will become cost baseline. So above this, there will be management reserve where project manager cannot utilize the management reserve based on the willingness, but it is kept with certain calculation done by the management to see to that project will go with the way it is planned. So any unforeseen circumstances, which is not even identified, unknown risk management reserves would be used. So including contingency reserve and all the project cost consolidated cost baseline. So this cost baseline is authorized. So it is an authorized time phase budget that is used as the initial point for monitoring and calculating the project performance and progress. So this is done through earned value management. So this process is executed at a specific points in the project which are generally predefined. So the inputs to this project would be project management plan, basically cost management plan, resource management plan, scope baseline, project documents, that is basis of estimates, cost estimates, project schedule, risk register, then business documents, which is business case, benefits management plan, then agreements, which is basically that agreement which is done with the suppliers or which is done with any of the customers. So those are considered because you may be acquiring a specific product service or you are producing a specific product or services for your consumer. So these needs to be understood in what terms the project is being worked. Then enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets. So the tools used for this particular process determine budget is expert judgment, historical information review, data analysis, cost aggregation, 
funding limit reconciliations when we say cost aggregation and funding limit reconciliations one has to ensure all the fund flow how is that happening what is the current condition of this fund flow in the organization that needs to be understood and also based on the schedules of the project money needs to be organized the incoming money flow outgoing money flow in the name of cost and revenue that needs to be checked so that necessary investment which is required for project is available or not is understood so this requires working with finance in specific so financing means the allocation of the budget at the same time ensuring that flow happens the money which is allocated comes in outputs of determined budget process would be the cost baseline then project funding requirements and project documents updates so next process would be control cost so control cost is a process of monitoring the status of project to update the project cost and managing changes to the cost baseline so this is the final process which is in monitoring and control process group so this is primarily concerned with measurement of variances of the actual cost from the proposed baseline so various methods and procedures are implemented here to track the project performance and expenses against its progress rate meanwhile all the variances are recorded and compared with with actual baselines if any necessary corrections are required those will be done through raising change request so control cost process will be responsible for explaining the reasons for variance and further assist the project manager in taking corrective actions to incur minimum cost or cost according to what is budgeted or planned so inputs to this process involves project management plan that is cost management plan cost baseline performance measurement baseline project documents then project funding requirements work performance data and then organizational process assets the tools used for control cost process would be expert judgment data analysis two complete performance index and project management information system so output of this process would be work performance information cost forecasts change request project documents updates and project management plan updates project quality management under this topic as we were talking about we will be discussing about the various processes that are involved into managing quality on the project but before get on to the processes that we have let's quickly understand about quality management now as we all know quality is all about whether we are producing the outcome of the project in the form of product or result or the service that we are producing by the end of that project is it fit for use or not is it fit for purpose or not does it meet the customer requirements or not so ultimately we need to make sure that we check on that so whether that project meets the needs it was originally created to meet and that is what is ensured by the quality management it also ensures that all project activities that are necessary for designing planning implementing a project are effective and efficient and that is ensured by following the quality management as one of the important plans that we create on the project so let's understand a bit more around quality management as a concept when we work on the project so there are a few things that we need to definitely make sure we are doing as a part of the quality one is of course the verification the continuous verification is what is expected by the team and the project manager like for example a simple verification could be a traceability matrix we ensure to have a traceability matrix on the project so that we verify the requirements that we have gathered from the customers are we incorporating those while doing designing while doing coding while doing testing while deploying etc so that simple verification really helps us and it's just not the backwards traceability but also the forwards traceability that we ensure that we are doing so that's a quick example of the verification precision now whenever we talk about quality we also ensure that it should be precise precision is all about doing it consistently and when we do consistently right it actually ensures the precision now we must have heard about these terms like precision and accuracy so accuracy is when we actually hit the target we are accurate but when we hit the target 10 times consistently we are not only accurate but also we are precise and that is what reflects in the quality so whatever the outcome that we are producing in the form of that process or even for that matter the result or a service that we are producing we need to make sure that it's not only accurate but also it is precisely 
so that we are consistently producing the same outcome in the form of product service or a result that we are committing to the customer so accuracy and precision definitely are two important facets that we talk about always under quality tolerance there is something called as a tolerance and we set the tolerance limits and we come up with sort of a control charts in order to understand the outcome that we are producing does it fit into the tolerance limits or not so we have upper specification limits and we have lower specification limits and the product that we are producing in the form of outcome of the process or a project we make sure that it fits into the tolerance limit anything above that my customer wouldn't accept and if there are too many such a things that i'm producing which are not accepted by the customer obviously it's going to cost me and that's going to be the cost of quality which we will talk about later as well validation so continuous validation and verification as we were talking about is something which is integral part of the maintaining quality and ensuring quality while we're working on any project so whatever the requirements that customer has given us once we build that feature we need to make sure that that feature is validated as per the acceptance criteria given by the customer and we'll talk more about some of these aspects around quality so quality management overview is what we're going to start with at the moment now when we talk about the overview in terms of understanding the quality we also need to understand the various trends and emerging practices that we talk about in quality these days so starting with the customer satisfaction now customer satisfaction is ultimately one of the goals that every organization would strive to achieve through the product service or the results that are getting produced as an outcome of the project that we work on so even we talk about as a part of the project constraints these days apart from quality schedule and the other constraints like risk resources one of the important thing is also around customer satisfaction are my customer satisfied with the outcome that i'm producing or not and if they are not satisfied then we need to really find out the reasons for customer satisfaction first of all whether i'm really checking my customers are happy or not am i conducting the customer surveys feedbacks and interviews am i incorporating the feedbacks that i'm getting back into the process of developing that product service or result or not so there are various things that we need to ask to ourselves as a team continual improvement continual improvement should be always at the heart of the quality the reason being it's about the consistently improving the way we are doing things right the way the process is running or for that matter are we challenging the status quo how am i improving on a daily basis there could be various ways through which we can do that it could be implementation of a kaizen methodology or a six sigma or lean way of working etc but continual improvement is definitely one of the important things that teams needs to ensure that we do management responsibility now as we just mentioned that quality is everyone's responsibility so how come we miss on management ultimately management is the one who is going to empower the project teams management is the one who is going to ensure that the teams have got enough resources to build the product so if that is not done properly then obviously it's going to have an impact over quality management should also help teams in removing the impediments bottlenecks that are there within what we are producing and not achieving the quality so that is where management would come into picture mutually beneficial partnership with suppliers when we talk about producing any product i guess without having the partnership with suppliers it's just not possible now when we partner with our suppliers we need to make sure that it's a mutually beneficial partnership we need to make them partner into what we are producing and not just treat them as some third party vendors so that's the change in the mindset that we need to bring out in order to get maximum out of this partnership and the relations so let's keep talking about some of the tailoring considerations that we should be taking into consideration while working on the quality management now all the processes of quality management they needs to be applied in a tailored or a customized way in order to make them unique to the project that you're working on because as we know project is a unique endeavor we produce a product or service or a result out of that project and it's unique in itself so let's talk about how and where can we do this kind of a customization or process tailoring pimbox 6th edition specifically talks a lot about process tailoring let's take few examples for example policy compliance and auditing now whichever the 
project that you're working on, you have to do the customization or tailoring around the way you're working, considering the compliance requirements or audit requirements. Like, for example, I still remember when I was working on a project where we had to comply with SOX compliance. That means the requirements were completely different over there. Like we had to take the code freeze approvals at least 14 days before we put code into production environment. That was something very unique to that compliance requirement. And that was audited as well. So we had to really retain those audit trails and had to retain those evidences, which we can then produce when the audit is conducted. So that's a very quick example, which may not be required again on all the projects. So here is a question here from Ramesh, and the question is around what is SOX compliance? All right. So I understand from where this question has come. So I did mention a bit about SOX. Now, SOX compliance is just one example. Those are basically the regulations that are levied by U.S. governments. So those companies who are registered under U.S., any of the stock exchange, let's say New York Stock Exchange. So we need to furnish all the data which actually goes into profit and loss statement or which goes into accounting. And we need to make sure that all this data is furnished to the U.S. government for audit and for review. And SOX came in after the frauds that we may have heard about, like, for example, Enroll or WordCom, those kind of frauds that have happened during early 2000. And uh, after that, U.S. government launched SOX. Of course, this training is not around SOX, really, but you can read more about that. But just very quickly to answer your question, that is just one of the regulations that we talk about today. But if you're working in healthcare industry, you might have to face different regulations. If you work in insurance, there are different regulations. If you are working in banking, there are different regulations. So what's important is to acknowledge those and see how I can tailor my process in order to adhere to those regulations. The second aspect is around standards and regulatory compliance. Sometimes there are certain mandatory standards that are to be followed. So we need to ensure that we are adhering to those mandatory standards if we haven't already considered as a part of the project. Continuous improvement, challenging the status quo. Various methodologies these days are popular when it comes to continuous improvement. And I'm sure some of those methodologies you may have already used yourself. Agile is the best example. Agile really helps us improve on a continuous basis because we do retrospections, we gather lessons learned, we implement the improvements out of that. 5US is another methodology. Six Sigma is another one. Lean is there. So many of them or simple Kanban way of working also helps us in continuously improve ourselves. Stakeholder engagement. Since we talk about quality and ultimately all these requirements that we work on, any project comes from the stakeholders. So we have to engage them throughout the project and not just at the beginning of the project or towards the end of the project. So tailoring around these aspects would really help us gain a competitive advantage or would gain in terms of getting the better outcome of the project. Now let's talk about the quality management process. So far, I just introduced you the topic. We just spoke about what is quality, what are the different aspects around quality. We also spoke about why the tailoring is required when we work on the quality, etc. Now, let's actually get into the process part. As I mentioned to you, there are 49 different processes within Pimbox 6th edition, and there are 10 different knowledge areas. We also have five different process groups. We are picking up quality management processes for you in today's training. Now, this is just the gist of it. I would really encourage you to enroll for the course in order to get more detail around quality management. In webinar today, we are just taking and learning about a very high level aspects around quality. But when we do the deep dive, where while delivering training, we actually cover in detail around various things that we're supposed to be talking around in quality. So let's talk about now the process. There are three processes as a part of quality management. It starts with planning part. We have to plan quality. We can't just ignore that. We have to manage quality. Once we put your plan in place, that's where we decide high level approach. What's my commitment to manage quality on my project? And once I give that commitment through this plan, then I have to execute that plan. And that execution is about managing quality. And once I start executing, I have to also check whether I'm executing it as per the plan or not. And that's where the control aspect comes into picture. So we have planning quality management, managing quality, and control quality. Three processes that are embedded 
as a part of the quality management let's start with the first one which is plan quality management now as like any other knowledge areas whenever we cover we always talk about what are the inputs to that process what are the tools and techniques that we use and what output do we expect out of that similarly we will also be talking about what are the inputs so before we getting on to the input part let's just talk about a bit what is plan so planning quality management is all about identifying what are the key requirements in terms of the quality you know it could be with respect to the standards that we are going to follow it could be with respect to the commitments that we are giving how are we going to maintain quality manage quality on the project what's the approach that we are going to follow in terms of ensuring quality is built in this product so in general this is going to really provide you with some guidance and this will give some direction so even if the project manager is not there one fine day and if somebody wants to look into what is the quality that we are going to maintain on this project so they can easily refer to this plan and learn about this approach so how are we going to manage the quality verify the quality throughout the project is what is maintained and mentioned in this plan typically we create the plan at the beginning of the project itself and quality management plan would then become a part of your project plan when we actually begin working let's now get started off with some of the inputs to the quality management and uh, we will go one by one probably starting off with of course the project charter so when we start talking about the planning part we need to refer to the project charter because project charter will certainly give us an idea about those initial high level requirements that will come from the project charter and as we just now understood about quality that it's about fit for use fit for purpose and it's about ensuring that we deliver the requirements that we have agreed upon with customers so those initial requirements will certainly come from the project charter we would also know which are those stakeholders whom i need to engage while creating the plan etc the other is project management plan in itself few things we have already captured over there and anyways quality management plan is a subsidiary plan of project management plan that means we have to refer to that for sure project documents we need to also refer to different project documents while working on quality part and the project documents obviously we need to make sure that these project documents that we are referring to are something like for example assumption log so i need to know what are some of the assumptions that i need to factor in while working on the planning quality aspects then we also need to know how are we going to establish traceability metrics on the project how are we going to capture risks for example what about the stakeholder register can i have access to that so that i can update if required so those are some of the examples of the documents that we talk about here and apart from that there are two inputs always we talk about in almost all processes and that's enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets they could be like for example as a part of assets there could be certain templates that i need to use there could be a certain in terms of enterprise environmental factors i would also compare the quality with that comes out of the commitment that i'm going to give as a company in the market so there are certain general guidelines that are available that i would refer to as well so these are some of the inputs that we talk about let's now talk about some of the tools and techniques when we plan quality into the project so starting with expert judgment expert judgment is one of the tools and techniques that we talk about here and as you would agree expert judgment is all about engaging my smes into getting inputs from them and probably we need to also take into consideration the tailoring aspects so on this project based on the experience of these people what do i need to do so something which is very easy to do as well as very valuable data gathering data gathering is definitely another uh, tool which is very useful we can gather data through various ways one of the example could be benchmarking i can compare the quality with what's published in the market it could be through various publications or something which is even for that matter the standards that are there so i can compare it with the past i can compare it with the standards or the competition as well so that's kind of a benchmarking right i need to be right up to the competition in the market so if it is not there then how i can improve ourselves in terms of the quality outcomes that we're producing brainstorming is a simple data gathering technique that helps us in generating the data and the ideas etc i can also conduct interviews with few people in order to gather data so these are some of the examples data analysis so once we gather data while putting the plan for quality i need to also ensure that i do analysis of the data that i have gathered for that i might have to use different techniques like simple could be cost benefit analysis 
Can I just check the cost of quality? What is the benefit am I going to get out of that? At the same time, what is the cost of implementation of the quality requirements against the benefit, as I just mentioned? Or cost of quality in itself, which will cover your cost of conformance, cost of non-conformance. Now, as we know, cost of conformance is all about in order to make sure the quality is built in, what is the cost that is required? So for that quality assurance or the audits or different uh, things that I'm going to use on the project, it could be reviews, etc. What's the cost that is required for that? And non-conformance cost could be very high at times. One of the best examples could be the Volkswagen scam of uh, the emission that we know the kind of amount that the Volkswagen had to bear is like huge. That's cost of non-conformance, I would say. Because it not only affects the cost, but also it affects the reputation of the company as a whole. So that could be another example. And we will talk many more such examples in our training. Decision making is another thing. So as a part of decision making, again, it's pretty straightforward, right? We have to make decisions between the options that are available. So we'll also look into some tools that we can use in order to make decision as well. In the actual training, data representation. So once we gather data, we can actually represent that data through various ways. Like, for example, we can create a simple flowchart of the data that I have gathered. So let's say I have gathered some data from the process. I can just put together in a flowchart or I can create some sort of a logical data model or even for that matter, some matrix diagrams. All of that really helps us in visualizing things. I think mind map could be one of the simplest example. We just put together what's there on mind in a particular format, in a particular way, and that really helps us in representing the data. Test and inspection planning would certainly involve our considerations about various testing things that we're going to do in order to, of course, inspect the product, in order to ensure that we inspect the deliverable or a service that we are giving to our customers. And uh, there could be various ways, as we all know, like alpha and beta releases that we do in the market these days or the various inspections that we do, or for that matter, the field test could be another simple example. And then we have meetings, which is pretty straightforward to understand. So these inputs in terms of the different tools and techniques would certainly help us in putting together the plan. Obviously, what do we expect by the end of this? We certainly expect outcome of this process would be the quality management plan itself. We'll also be able to gather some quality metric in terms of, now we can certainly think of as a part of the quality metric, We can think of various things. What kind of a quality metric that you want to capture on your project? And that quality metric would certainly help you in ensuring that you are tracking the quality. So it could be, for example, the defect data. It could be defect age. It could be the defects per release, et cetera, et cetera. So that could be just one quick example. Project management plan will get updated with this outcome and even the project documents. Like I have given you examples of assumption log, or uh, traceability metrics or stakeholder list that we're creating. So that might also get updated as a result of this. So this covers our plan quality management. We saw what are the inputs, we saw tools and techniques, and we also covered the outcomes that we can get in the form of different outputs of this process, of course. Let's now talk about managed quality. So as a part of quality management, we have plan quality, and then the second part is about managed quality. It's all about execution. Now, since we have a plan in place, it's time for us to execute that plan. Let's talk a bit about it. It's all about translating that plan into your executable quality activities. So whatever we have committed to through this plan, now we have to execute that. It will also help us in making sure that the quality policies are embedded into the project. And that is certainly the responsibility of the management to make sure that all the teams are ensuring that uh, embedding of the quality policies into their uh, project plans, etc. It also helps us in improving the probability of meeting the quality objectives and uh, not only that, identifying the ineffective processes and cause of poor quality. So it's all about identifying those aspects and fixing those aspects, act upon those gaps. So when we have started executing on the plans, we would certainly be able to come to know about these things. So let's do a bit of a deep dive and starting with, of course, the inputs. So let's start talking about inputs to manage quality. And we'll, of course, talk about the first input, which is the project management plan in itself. Now, what will come out of the project management plan is the quality management plan. Because quality management plan is the subsidiary management plan, which is a part of your project management plan. 
so that will come in project document so as we've already spoke about the various examples of the project documents that we can think of and uh, not only that now project documents i've already gave you a few examples like it could also include like assumption log i've told you or for that matter the traceability metrics or the stakeholder list etc and the next one is about the opas and eef is what we talk about but in this case specifically we'll be talking about the opas so what is organizational process assets so when we talk about the managed quality we would need to factor in a lot of different assets that might have been created uh, those needs to be used as i gave you example of uh, certain standards templates those we need to adhere to when we work on any of the organization so we need to always refer to that usually the central team within the organization working for quality ensures that these assets are being communicated across to all the teams so that teams start using them so let's get started with the next aspect about managing quality which is tools and techniques what kind of a tools can we use starting with the tools for data gathering which we already discussed about the kind of tools that we can use for gathering data like interviews and brainstorming sessions etc we can talk a bit on the data analysis tools what kind of analysis can we do so once we gather data now this data is about once we start executing your plan some data gets generated on the project that data needs to be captured that data needs to be then analyzed we could do alternative analysis we could analyze various documents that are there on the project we could do simple process analysis in order to find out the opportunities for us to improve that process or importantly we could also undertake a root cause analysis because now we are executing the plan we might come across certain issues to find out why that particular issue has occurred let's find out the root cause of that issue so that it will not occur again audits is another important thing that we always do as a part of the managed quality i hope audits are pretty straightforward thing it could be internal audits it could be external audits so depending on the kind of audits that are conducted in your organization decision making is something again pretty straightforward we make decision based on the kind of data that we've gathered and uh, the design for x now design for x is all about design for excellence or we call it as dfx now this is basically a set of technical guidelines now those technical guidelines could be applied during the design phase while we build the product and that really helps us in optimize few things around obviously the design like there are lots of things that are evolving around design so design thinking could be one such example so design for excellence we is all about those technical guidelines all the practices like one of the simple thing that we do is simple design we keep design simple so that we can evolve later now this will certainly help us to improve the characteristics of the product that we are working on like for example cost reduction or we talk about quality improvements or better performance right or the customer satisfaction a lot of these things that we can think of so those could be achieved while ensuring that some of the technical guidelines are followed for example if you talk about the performance and if you do not incorporate the technical guidelines into the design itself then how would you be able to expect a better performance of the product once you develop that application put it into production and then if the performance is what is one of the expectation and that you missed to factor in into design it's going to affect the performance data representation now how do we represent data we've already spoke about it various ways through which we can represent the data like flow charts process diagrams etc that we spoke about problem solving skills again various ways through which we can solve problems is what it covers about so we'll be talking about in detail in the training when we conduct how do we do that and the quality improvement methods there are various quality improvement methods which i did mention to you some of them at for example plan do check act something which was introduced by deming and uh, six sigma is another example or kaizen for that matter or continuous improvement so all those things really helps us in achieving better quality outcomes now since we talk about managed quality what do we expect as the outcome of the managed quality process we would get quality reports the quality reports again as uh, we spoke a bit on it as far as the metric is concerned but in this case we basically talk about how we can put this data that we're getting during execution of the quality plan into some format now that format could be sort of a graphical format or some numerical or some qualitative stuff that we can put together 
that will actually help us in providing lots of information which we can refer and take corrective decisions. And that corrective decision will in turn help us in meeting the quality expectations. So this would also include, for that matter, some of the quality management issues that get escalated to the next level. Or for that matter, some of the improvements that are suggested, the corrective actions that we have taken, or for that matter, the kind of rework that required to be done. For that matter, even few things that I mentioned to you earlier, like uh, defects data or the bug repair that was done, or the kind of inspection that is done and the outcome of that, etc. And even you can summarize all the findings and put it together. So that essentially includes your quality reports. And there could be certain organizational process assets in order to provide sort of templates how to produce this. Test evaluation documents. A test and evaluation document is all about like uh, what are some of the achievements of the quality objectives that we can put together. Like for example, checklists or detailed requirement traceability metrics. Now those are like test and evaluation documents, right? Traceability metrics is one good example. Checklist is one of the best examples that we always talk about. Those really helps us in uh, evaluating things. Change requests. Now, change request might get initiated as a result of the progress that we are seeing, and that change request then needs to be incorporated back into the project. Project documents will get updated, the ones that I mentioned earlier, and project management plan would also get updated if there is any change that we come across. So this covers entire outcomes or the outputs that we expect out of the managed quality process. So we saw planning part of quality. That's where we give commitments to our customers by putting things into planning, the approach, etc. And then we start executing on that through the managed quality process. And then we are going to talk about the next important process, which is about controlling quality. Now, this is the process where we basically talk about now, how can we make sure what we are doing? Is it in line with the process or not? So it's about monitoring and recording the results. So we've started executing the plan. Now we started getting some outcomes. It's important for us to record the results of those outcomes and we monitor it whether it is as per the quality management activities or not. If there is any gap, we need to act upon those gaps. So in a way, it is going to help us assessing the performance in order to ensure the project outcomes are complete, correct, and meet customer expectations. Not only that, it will also verify that the project deliverables and work meet the requirements specified by key stakeholders for final acceptance. So there has to be a continuous verification and validation that needs to be happening as a part of the control quality as well. All right, so let's get started with control quality aspects. Of course, we'll start with inputs. We can't miss the input project plan in itself. And a project plan would also give you the quality management plan for us to refer to. That's where we have already mentioned about how are you going to do control quality activities so we can refer to those project documents the one that i've already mentioned to you some of those documents we need to refer to and also needs to update later approved change requests again we need to check whether that approved change request is incorporated or not and uh, if it is incorporated if there is any gap etc so if at all there is any approved change request deliverables now, those deliverables could be the ones that I have already verified on the project. So those verified deliverables, that means I have tested those deliverables. I have verified those deliverables as per the customer requirements. So that is what it covers. And the work performance information. So work performance information will be nothing but uh, the data that gets generated when, once we start executing the plans. So how are we performing against the plan? How are we with respect to the schedule or quality or for that matter, budget, et cetera? Enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets is something which is standard, which will really help us in referring to certain things that are there at an organizational level. And then we talk about uh, certain tools and techniques which will help us in uh, performing these tasks. So uh, let's talk about what are those. One is data gathering. We did speak about some of the examples of how do we gather data. So that's one thing. Testing product and evaluations. So since we're talking about controlling quality, we need to make sure that we verify the deliverables against the customer specifications that are given. So this verification and validation needs to be happening on a continuous basis. Not only that, we also need to make sure that including the approved change we have tested as per the expectations. So this is something which is an ongoing process as a part of the control quality. It's an ongoing activity. 
data analysis. So once we gather data out of these uh, techniques, it's time for us to analyze that data and uh, draw actions, which will help us in, of course, taking the corrective and the preventive actions. Like, for example, the outcome that we are producing, is it within the control limits or not? What are the tolerance limits, the upper specification, lower specification limits? And the outcomes that I'm getting, are they falling within those or not? So a lot of data that I'm generating out of the implementation of the quality commitments, now it's time for us to analyze the data. Inspection. So I need to regularly go on inspecting and adapting as well. So various opportunities through which we can do the inspection. So for that, whatever you have committed, how are you going to do the inspection? That would be a part of your plan. So you can refer to that. And you would also represent that data. Again, data representation, we already covered the various ways through which we do that. And of course, the meetings. So those are the tools and techniques that we can use as a part of control quality. And let's let's move on to the outcomes. What do we expect by the end of this? We certainly expect quality control measurements. So we ensure that we've got uh, the quality control measurements in place. We have verified deliverables. So whatever the deliverables that are committed at that phase or at that point in time on the project, we have verified those against the requirements that are given by the customers. Work performance information in itself, how are we performing against the plan? Change requests, project management plan would get updated as a result of that, including the project documents. So this is what we can expect in the form of outcome. So this covers uh, the control quality aspects as well. So we started with the quality management plan. Then we looked into how we can manage quality overall and then how would we control quality. So in today's webinar, our focus was uh, around quality and how we can maintain quality on the project by implementing these three processes as a part of the quality management. So when we ensure that uh, we are implementing these processes as a project manager, as a team, in a way, we are assuring our customer that uh, what we are building in the form of that product, service, or a result is fit for your use and is as per the expectations that are given by you. So that confidence, we can give it to the customer by implementing these quality management processes. And that will certainly make the team give the results to the team which can deliver repeatedly, not just one times, and some, the team which is also predictable. So that predictability and repeatability is something that is really important and that gives a lot of trust on the team as well. So this was just the gist of quality management. We have covered it at a high level. We do a deep dive when we deliver the PMP training program. We get into each of these uh, tools and techniques, inputs and the outcomes much in more detail, in fact. And uh, we also take a lot of different examples as a part of this. But in this webinar, we have just given you the introduction to quality management as a part of the quality management knowledge area within PIMBOK 6th edition. So project resource management. PMP defines 10 knowledge areas. One of the knowledge areas is project resource management. When we say project resource management, we should look at understanding what are the resources required for managing the projects and then acquiring those resources and managing throughout the project lifecycle. So for this, we need to understand what project resource management is all about. When I say resource, resource can be human resource, resource can be a technology resource, resource can be any resource which is required for a project to be done. Now when we say a scope, for example, you will define a scope for a deliverable which will come as an output of a project. Similarly, while defining the project, we should also define the scope of those resources which are required to deliver that result. So project resource management includes the processes to identify, acquire and manage the resources needed for the successful completion of the project. So resource management overview. This includes the trends and emerging practices. When I say resource management methods, so we know the dynamics associated with various different resources. So we acquire the resources based on what kind of project we are doing. In common, the kind of resources, human resources, we will have in every projects. For example, if you say IT project, you need human resource. If you say civil construction project, you need resource. But the dynamics with this human resources changes based on the what kind of skills and capability and experiences that resource will have in a given project. Similarly, when it's IT project, you need to work on applications, you need to work on network devices, infrastructure components. 
But when I say civil constructions, you are all not working with those IT components. Instead, we are speaking about cement, brick, sand, etc. So even quantifying those resources and acquiring those resources and utilizing those resources in a given project is very essential. So dynamics of those resources has to be understood and accordingly it has to be handled. So in specific, when we say human resources, emotional intelligence plays a very important role for project manager to have to use during the project management. So this requires an effort from a project manager to pretend certain roles. For example, when we say leadership, we speak about authoritarian leadership, lazy fair leadership, participative leadership. So when to be authoritarian, when should you behave authoritative? When should a project manager be participative? When should a project manager should become lazy fair? Means delegate and allow team to work on it and then review it. So this requires a lot of influencing thoughts while engaging with the people especially the project team members, what we're speaking about, while engaging with the customers, while engaging with suppliers, while engaging with sponsors. These transactions need certain emotional influence as well for which emotional intelligence may be required. So self-organizing team as a buzzword which comes across whenever we speak about agile mostly. But however, today with the changing needs of the business, where the quick response is required to go to market, at the same time when we go to market quickly, the operations needs to respond to it, manage it the way the user wants it. User may have a queries. Ultimately, the experience of the users makes sense. Only then value realization happens. So because of that, enablement across the organization, right from the teams who are in the project as well as who are managing that particular product or services is required. For that, many organizations have thought about self-organizing team where the team is owning the product or services in entirety rather than one individual or one specific specialist owning it. Then with the advancement of technology, today movement of skills who are distributed across various different regions may not be needed. So there may be virtual teams, a distributed teams who will work together with the help of the technologies. This also comes up with a lot of challenges because teams are not in front of the project manager always. So this requires a specific approach towards managing those resources which the project manager should understand and deal with. So tailoring considerations while doing resource management is to mainly understand the diversity of resources, as I mentioned, based on the various different capabilities, various different geographical locations. The physical equation is another consideration. So because culture changes, people come from different backgrounds. Then industry specific resources, project specific, industry specific. So as per the industry, as per the projects, again, the thought processes, the dynamics associated with the resources will change. The management requirement of the resources itself will differ. Acquisition of team members. So when you actually start a project, when execution starts, you may require to ramp up the team members. So identification of the right skills and capabilities. Before that, one has to define the clearly articulating roles and responsibilities in a project organization structure and accordingly team members has to be acquired so interestingly you cannot get a resource especially human resource who are tailor made to the project so they need to be trained inducted educated about the project and make them to become ready for the project execution so as the project progresses managing this team engaging with this team and making things delivered in time as defined in schedule within the cost needs to be ensured by engaging with the team so life cycle approaches, as I already mentioned, a product will have a life cycle. Similarly, project itself will have a life cycle. So when I say product life cycle, product life cycle is bigger than a project life cycle. So we use a project to introduce a product. We initiate a project to bring in new features, functionality to the existing product. We initiate a project to improve something. We initiate a project to retire a specific product or services. So we need to visualize that life cycle of a product at the same time, what would be the life cycle of this project, which is going to introduce something to that environment. So in a way, project itself is a big change management because it introduces the change to the environment. So project itself will have a life cycle. When we say that a beginning and end, temporary end over, that's what PMP says. It has a specific start, specific end. From this start to end, there is a life cycle for project, which is part of the entirety of a product life cycle or service life cycle. So according to what kind of products are we creating, what kind of projects we have taken, is that improvement project or creation of new product or services, or to introduce the features and functionality to the existing product or services, 
or to retire a product or services depending on that which life cycle of this specific product or services projects are initiated and accordingly it has to be dealt with so resource management processes so resource management processes are distributed across various process groups when as a plan resource management estimate activity resources they fall under planning process group acquire resources develop team and manage team are part of executing process group and control resources is a process which is part of managing and control process group so plan resource management the first process in planning process group in resource management knowledge area so plan resource management is the first and the initial step of the project resource management knowledge area while planning for resources one is to understand what kind of resources are required and how are we going to engage if it is a human resource engage and manage if it is not a human resource any other resources how are going to manage technology resources or the facilities resources in the facilities so this involves various aspects like defining the process of estimating acquiring managing and using physical and human resources so this process is usually performed only once or at few predefined points throughout the project life cycle to help in establishing the way of approach and level of management required for managing resources so every resource needs to be assessed understood what kind of resources is required and how are we going to manage this has to be clearly articulated to manage it as the project progresses so these aspects are majorly influenced by the type and complexity of the project so inputs to this process would be project charter project management plan project documents when i say project charter we know that project charter is created in initiating process group so which provides the basic details and that comes as an input to planning process group one of that process where project charter is coming as an input is plan resource management project management plan which basically quality management plan scope baselines which comes from integration management and then project documents like project schedule requirements documentations risk registers stakeholder registers and further input can be enterprise environmental factors and organizational processes assets the tools used as part of plan resource management is expert judgment data representation organizational theory and meetings when we say experts all those specialized people who are having a specific experience in terms of managing resources a specific resource and various different data considerations and since we are speaking about resource management we should also look at what kind of organization structure required for this project and there should be meetings engaging with the people discussion should happen outputs of plan resource management are resource management plan then team charter and then project document updates when as a resource management plan we are going to understand from it what are the approaches we have to manage the resources and what kind of team structure we would have so what dynamics are involved with it so this particular plan will go and get consolidated into plan which is integrated in integration management this is one of the subsidiary plans so process estimate activity resources so when as estimate activity resources the details of activities are already captured in schedule management so when we say scope management for example so scope management provides scope baseline while deriving that scope baseline work breakdown structure is created as part of it further you will identify an effort activities for those wbs elements and this happens in schedule management so referring to that schedule management for the wbs element for which efforts are estimated here you need to look at what kind of resource and in what quantity is required so estimate activity resources will be doing the planning of estimating the activity resources based on the wba structure defined so in this process the resource required for the project along with the type and quantity of tools equipments raw materials and supplies are being estimated this process is generally executed after specific time intervals throughout the project life cycle with this one can pinpoint that what type of resources project needs and in what amounts means quantity and what should be their characteristics in order to finish the project successfully so estimate activity resources this can be done only after creation of wbs structure and also schedule management sequences which activity has to be done after what so because of this sequencing while estimating the resources one should also can able to know when is this resources required 
not just what resource at what quantity and also when because of the schedule management which is working parallel to resource management inputs to this process project management plan which includes resource management plan and scope baseline then project documents which involves activity attributes activity list assumptions log cost estimates resource calendars risk register enterprise environmental factors resource locations resource availability because we should know what is available resource in the organization so that they can be allocated to the project so team resource skills organization culture published estimating data marketplace conditions organization process assets which includes policies and procedures and historical information so the tools used as part of estimate activity resources are expert judgment data representation organization theory and meetings outputs so outputs includes resource requirements basis of estimates resource breakdown structure and project document updates so resource requirements against the activity which needs to be done and there should be an explanation why so much of resource is estimated that is basis of estimation resource breakdown structure provides the details relating to the wba structure what we have how the resources are connected how the resources are related because we need also link it to organization structure so acquire resources this is the process which happens in executing process group so this process deals with collecting the various human resources facilities tools equipments supplies and raw materials required to deliver the project so human resources are identified and onboarded facilities tools equipments and supplies are procured which are required to be used in the project so this process helps in outlining and guiding the selection process of the project resources and then assigning them to their specific activities or tasks thus it is performed at periodic intervals throughout the project life cycle and helps in preventing running out of resources so appropriate number of resources has quantified in estimating resources so inputs project management plan which includes resource management plan procurement management plan cost baseline project document like project schedule resource calendars resource requirements stakeholder registers enterprise environmental factors which is existing information on organization resources marketplace conditions organization structure then geographical locations where exactly one needs the resources where is that resource available opas organization process asset which includes policies and procedures historical informations and lessons learned repository tools would be decision making interpersonal and team skills pre assignment and virtual teams when i say decision making so one needs to finalize which resource with what features and functionality those needs to be identified before you acquire and confirm interpersonal and team skills because there need certain discussions certain engagement required when you procure or when you onboard a human resource pre assignment maybe the one when the team in the organization with the specific skills which are matching with the organization or project required skills so assigning those resources virtual teams if teams are spread across various different locations so output of this process would be physical resource assignment means the resources are acquired they are onboarded project team assignments you have a team to work now so the team is assigned the members are assigned to the given role resource calendars specifying where exactly the resources are available change requests if any change required in the structure or the kind of resources then project management plan updates project document updates ef updates and then opa updates develop team process so as you acquire a human resources you may require to educate them in terms of what is that expected out of them in a given project and what is their role an individual may have a specific skills and capability that's okay that's about specific skills and capability but what is expected out of that particular individual with that specific skills and capability in this project what is the deliverable from that individual so this process purely concentrates on the development of team bonding and assigning them with rewarding work future opportunities and career development so someone working in a project if that is not contributing to their further future career progression they may not be very motivated because of that so one needs to give that visibility as well as the member to the project is onboarded this will help in enhancing the overall team performance by improving team members competencies 
interactions and the environment. So this process is performed throughout the project life cycle and intensifies teamwork, improves interpersonal skills of the individuals, motivates the team and reduces iterations. So this requires providing lot of insights toward the project, what is that they are going to deliver and how that will contribute to their progression in their career uh, positive way. So these visibility should be there. So this requires an induction. When team is onboarded, there is brainstorming which happens. Maybe team members may not know each other. So one has to ensure a facilitation has to be done so that team will know each other so that they can start performing. So inputs, project management plan, which is basically resource management plan, project documents like lessons learned register, project team assignments, resource calendars, team charter, EF enterprise environmental factors, which is human resource management policies, team member skills, competencies and specialized knowledge, geographical distribution of team members, whereas OPAs organizational process assets, that is historical information and lessons learned repository. The tools used as part of developed team would be co-location, virtual teams, communication technology, interpersonal and team skills, recognition and rewards, training, individual and team assignments, meetings. When we say co-location, people exist in various different locations in the globe. So there needs a lot of interactions. So formal communication should be increased there so that the transaction, the clarity which needs to be provided to the team will be easier and more and more connects. Even when you work with the team which is sitting next to you, since you are present, that effort to connect may not be required. So because it's, it will be happening naturally. But whereas team doesn't exist in front of the project manager, it requires a lot of effort to connect, to keep that communication channels open always. So virtual teams, I mean, similar dynamics, as we saw co-locations. So communication technology, using appropriate communication technology to connect with the teams. So interpersonal and team skills, which as we spoke about emotional intelligence, as we spoke about lazy fare or authoritarian approaches or participative approaches, Required. So while engaging with the teams, it's very essential. The project manager should possess that leadership traits, leadership qualities to connect with the team and influence them. So recognition and rewards. So recognition and rewards helps to motivate. So this will also help in terms of showing the quick wins happening in the project. So providing the training whenever is required on the specific areas, maybe a soft skills, maybe technology specific, maybe specific skill acquiring. So training has to be given and enable the team individual and team assessments, then meetings. Outputs of developed team process would be team performance assessments, change requests, project management plan updates, project document updates, EF updates, and OPA updates. Manage team. So manage team is a process where each and every team member performance is monitored and tracked. It is very essential to understand how the individuals are performing, how the resources are performing. Based on that, necessary actions need to be taken to correct if there is any deviations. If things are going fine, there should be a motivation to the team. And also tracking their problem areas which are identified and the issues are resolved and feedbacks are given on a regular basis. So this process is generally performed throughout the project life cycle and helps in influencing team behavior, managing the conflicts and resolving brewing issues. Very essential to engage with the team. The team which is just given a task and left may not tend to accomplish the results what is required. They need the directions every now and then. One has to sit and evaluate those performances and give the necessary feedbacks and also platforms for them to acquire those skills and capabilities to perform better. Inputs to this process, project management plan, which is resource management plan, project documents, that is issue log, lessons learned register, project team assessment, team charter, work performance report like physical or electronic representation of work performance information. Team performance assessments. The project management team makes ongoing formal or informal assessments of the project team's performance so that one will get that visibility so that accordingly necessary changes can be done. Enterprise environmental factors, which is basically human resource management policies. Then organizational process assets like certificates of appreciation, corporate apparels and other organizational prerequisites. Tools used as part of this process would be interpersonal and team skills, project management information system. So PMIS, which captures all the details of the project 
resources details, deliverables details, skill details, and then the way project is progressing. So these data can be utilized to give that insight to the project team and make them to progress further. Outputs of this process would be change request, procurement management plan updates, project document updates, and EEF updates. Control resources. So control resources is the process in monitoring and control process group. So in this process, the project managers ensures that the resources that are assigned and allocated for the project activities are available as needed. They also monitor their estimated usage versus actual usage. So you quantify the resources when you estimate. These are the number of resources which are required at any given point in time. Because we took that estimating the resources based on what activities are identified and how they are sequenced. So we refer to that scope and schedule. Accordingly, estimation happened. So an actual scenario is that utilization is happening accordingly or is there any variations, increase or decreased. Subsequently, if any deviations found, necessary corrective action needs to be taken for that. That corrective action needs to be triggered. So control resource process is implemented throughout the project lifecycle and helps in ensuring that necessary project resources are deployed to the correct places at the correct time and are released when the project comes to an end. So this is about control resources. The inputs to process, project management plan, basically resource management plan, project documents, that is issue log, lessons learned register, physical resource assignments, project schedule, resource breakdown structure, resource requirements, risk register, work performance data, which would contain the data on project status, such as number and types of resources that have been used, agreements made within the context of project, which are bases for all resources who are external to the organization, OPA, that is policies regarding resource control and assignment, escalation procedures for handling issues within the performing organizations, lessons learned repository from previous similar projects. Tools, data analysis, problem solving, interpersonal skills, PMIS. Outputs of control resource process would be work performance information, change request if any deviations found, procurement management plan updates, and then project document updates. So project communication management, when we say the word term, the communication, it's all about conveying a certain message, meaning passing message from one entity to another entity. So project communication management involves sender, means basically many stakeholders within the project, many stakeholders outside the project, with whom project manager has to communicate. At the same time, within the project, project team will communicate. So project communication, the moment we say that, we need to understand what are the communications requirements in the project. And then communication has to be done, complying to those communication management plans defined. So project communication management focuses on that aspect, the importance of communication to make the project successful. So project communication management is all about understanding what is the project communication needs are and then communicating accordingly. Project communication management includes the processes necessary to ensure that the information needs of the projects and its stakeholders are met through development of artifacts and implementation of activities designed to achieve effective information exchange. So communication management overview. So while communicating, when we say communication, there are a lot of ways the communications are done verbal communication, written communication. In these two, you can also think about formal verbal, formal written, informal verbal, informal written. So these four type of communication, four combination which we saw just now, formal verbal, informal verbal, formal written, informal written. So what is formal verbal? What is informal verbal? What is formal written? What is informal written? This needs to be very clearly articulated. And using the trends and emerging practices also is very important, which is inclusion of stakeholders in project reviews, inclusion of stakeholders in project meetings, increased use of social computing, social platforms, multifaceted approaches to communication. So these dynamics has to be understood. And as the practices evolve, as the need of the market changes, as the dynamics of the environment changes, 
communication requirements also changes the way you communicate one communicates also changes so one needs to understand those dynamics and accordingly communication has to be done so that communication requirements are fulfilled so while communicating looking at those communication needs one needs to ensure the communication happens as needed by the stakeholders so who are the stakeholders that needs to be identified so if we look at the overall framework the 10 knowledge areas five process groups and 49 processes the way they are distributed we see in initiating process group there are only two processes one process in integration management and other process in stakeholder management so what happens there is in the integration management process which is project charter which is getting created project manager assignment happens once the project manager is assigned and authorized the immediate next job the first job to project manager is to go and meet stakeholders identify stakeholders so once the stakeholders are identified stakeholders communication requirements has to be understood and identification of stakeholder is not the one time job it has to happen throughout the project life cycle and their communication requirement has to be understood so location physical location of the stakeholder communication requirement of the stakeholder the technology which needs to be used for communication the platforms which needs to be used for communication the language the knowledge management required for communication has to be understood so why do we need to have knowledge management when we do communication is because whenever there is a specific knowledge about a specific domain area the individual who is having the domain knowledge and the maturity of that individual in that domain may be high may be medium or low so while speaking with those individuals of specific maturity level in a specific domain area the discussion should align to that so there cannot be a discussion which is happening the communication which is happening which would not make any sense it should not look immature or it would not look like it is not even understood so one needs to understand who is the receiver of the communication so based on that the articulation of the communication should happen based on that the frequency of the communication should happen based on the vocabularies used has to be chosen so all this needs to be considered while tailoring the communication during the project so communication management processes so communication management process there are three processes defined in communication management knowledge area that is plan communications management manage communication and monitor communications even though it looks like only three processes the dynamics associated with communication management is not simple it is not very objective always it is very subjective many times the communicator versus the person who is receiving the language the maturity the vocabularies the time of communication the template used the channel used all these plays important role during the communication similarly when we plan for communication management considerations to all of this should be there while managing communication yes there is a defined approach defined template defined information which that communication carries even after that the dynamics of the situations has to be understood while communicating and there should be room for communicator to understand that and do that necessary modifications maybe in language maybe in additional details which are being given maybe the tone in which if it is a verbal communication the selection of those specific words and vocabulary while doing a written communication and is it should be written in the caps or it's okay if there it is not caps that needs to be understood the way the flow of thoughts happens during the communication even that needs to be understood so all these are individuals quality which has to be built now project manager will have a challenge in this regard if project manager is not sensitive about these aspects now as the communication happen monitoring the communication should happen but when you monitor the communication it doesn't mean all those additional aspects the qualities which are looked at while communication you don't have a scale to measure those but however the frequency of communication the content of communication the objective of communication templates used for communication only those can be checked are these used as per the plan otherwise one would not even know what is being communicated is that communication management plan is complied with or not that will not be visible 
so communication management is very important and 90% of the times project manager spends his or her time communicating throughout the project life cycle so by this itself one can understand how important the communication is during the project the first process in project communication management is plan communication management so plan communication management process is the initial process of project communication management knowledge area in this process a systematic and effective way the plan is developed for the activities involved in project communication it majorly makes use of information like the requirement of each and every stakeholders and teams organizational assets available and the project needs project communication management plan also involves the list of stakeholders their communication requirements and these communication requirements keeps changing as the project progresses there are lot of stakeholders who will get added to whom the communications has to be made and at the same time the dynamics of the communications will also change in terms of what kind of communication has to be sent at what part of the project during the starting in the initiating part of the project the communication needs may be different while execution is happening as the project progresses and peaks communication requirements differs maybe frequency of communication will change number of stakeholders to be communicated will change and that keeps varying so communication management is very dynamic so those dynamics has to be considered while planning communications management so creation of templates can also be done so that the more frequent communications like weekly updates monthly updates fortnight updates so that can have a specific uh, templates to the specific set of stakeholders so inputs to plan communication management includes project charter project management plan which includes resource management plan and stakeholder engagement plan project documents like requirements documentation and stakeholder register enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets so tools used during project communication management are expert judgment communication requirement analysis while discussing with stakeholders one needs to understand what are the communication requirement that needs to be analyzed that needs to be checked then technology which are used for communication data representation communication models communication methods interpersonal and team skills then meetings so looking at the number of tools which are looked at for communication management itself emphasizes on the point how important the communication would be many project may fail just because of wrong communications misunderstood communications it is very essential to ensure communication management is planned carefully and that is executed accordingly outputs of planned communication management would be communication management plan project management plan updates and project document updates manage communication is a process which happens while communications happens throughout the project life cycle so this process we see as part of executing process group where this process manages the communication throughout means the communication happens throughout the project life cycle which mainly aims to collect create distribute store retrieve manage monitor and finally dispose the information related to the project appropriately and timely manner so it is performed throughout the project life cycle in order to provide an effortless and efficient flow of information from the project team to stakeholders and vice versa so this process also help in identifying different aspects of effective communication along with the most suitable methodologies technologies and techniques inputs to manage communication process would be project management plan which is resource management plan communication management plan stakeholder engagement plan then project documents like change log issue log lessons learned registers quality report risk report stakeholder register work performance reports which can be presented as dashboards heat reports stop light charts or other representations ef and opa tools used to manage communications would be project reporting communication technology project management information systems meetings communication skills communication methods interpersonal and team skills outputs of manage communication process would be project communications where project communications are happening is that happening the way it is planned or not project management plan updates 
project document updates and OPA updates. So next process would be monitor communication. Monitor communication is part of monitoring and controlling process group. So monitoring communication process is the final process of communication management knowledge area. This process ensures that all the information needs and requirements of the project and the involved stakeholders are met by its completion. It is performed throughout the project life cycle and helps in optimizing the flow of the information as per the communication management plan and stakeholder engagement plan. So inputs to monitor communication would be project management plan that is resource management plan, communication management plan, stakeholder engagement plan, project documents like issue log, lessons learned register, project communications are used, work performance data on actual performance of the project, EF and OPA. Tools used would be expert judgment, data analysis, project management information system, interpersonal and team skills, meetings, whereas outputs of monitor communication process would be work performance information about communication, change request if there is any deviation, project management plan updates, and project document updates. Before we get into risk management, we should understand what is risk. So every project, every business, every investment done by an organization will be having certain kind of risks. So those risks need to be managed. So what is risk? Risk refers to an uncertainty. Uncertainty of an something, maybe positive or negative, which resides in the future. If that occurs, which becomes an issue to resolve. So the moment it occurs, there will be some impacts. If it is negative impact, we call it as a threat. If it is positive, we call it as an opportunity. So negative risk, which has a negative impact, which needs to be the impact of those needs to be reduced or that needs to be eliminated or reduce the probability of that occurrence by taking necessary actions or become ready. Yes, there is a risk. I cannot do anything about it. To reduce the impact of that risk, I will become ready to do something when it occurs. So if it is positive risk, I will take the advantages of that. I exploit that risk, I enhance. So this is the kind of responses you will get into. So project risk management focuses on risk which are associated with the project which are undertaken. So project risk management as defined in PMP includes the processes of conducting risk management, planning, identification, analysis, response planning, response implementation, and monitoring risk of a project. So identification of risk, Analyzing the risk, managing the risk, responding to the specific kind of risk is not a one-time job. This needs to happen throughout the project life cycle. When we assess to take up a project, we identify risks. When we initiate a project, when we start the project, we identify risks. When we progress as part of the project life cycle, we identify risks. So new, new risks are identified and identified risks are kept analyzed at the various different part of the project life cycle because the impact and probability of the risk if not probability, at least impact of the risk would vary as the project progresses based on in what part of project life cycle we are assessing it. At that given point in time, there would be variation of the risk. For example, when I begin a project, a risk like a deliverables, deliverables uncertainty is high when I start the project. But as I progress, I'm ending towards the same risk the impact will be less because the deliverables have happened in various different phases and already those are checked and tested. There is no associated risk with them in terms of a validation perspective, accomplishing that result perspective because majority of the deliverables have already happened. Only few deliverables will be pending as you progress towards end of the project. So risk will be less at the end of the project. Middle of the project may be moderate, may be high, definitely not low. So likewise, for any specific risk we identify at a given point of a project life cycle, associated risk which we identified as and assessed, the impact of that risk would vary positively, means increases, impact will increase or impact would decrease. So risk management overview, here we are going to look at trends and emerging practices related to the risk. So risk can be looked at less like non-event risk, project resilience, integrated risk management. Now, when I say risk of something which fails, yes, that is an event, an event has occurred. So that risk we associate as an event which is associated with risk, a power failure risk event, a deliverable did not happen event risk. So then what is this non-event risk? 
Now, if you say I wanted to accomplish these results and these are all the benefits which has to be realized out of it and that realization doesn't happen, that is not an event. So because that benefit is not realized, the investment is not making sense now. This is not an event which occurred. So benefit realization happens as the product which comes as an output of a project should result, should come as an outcome. That is not happening. It is not an event. It is a non-event risk. People who have specific skills and capabilities were unable to deliver properly. It is not an event. The performance of the individuals is not happening the way it is required. Non-event risk. So likewise, by generic statement of risk or the definition of risk, we say an uncertain event for a risk. But there are risks which exist which are non-event risks as well, which needs to be identified. Then projects resilience. Whenever a project fails, whenever there is a degradation of performance, how will a project recover? What is that ability? Project as a whole could be able to recover from it and move on smoothly further to accomplish the ultimate results. So these needs to be planned very well. Integrated risk management. So as we know in PMP framework, we have integration management. So integration management provides an integrated view of the entire project where risk management will also go on, get into that, get integrated into ultimate project management plan. So risk management plan across the project life cycle needs to be looked at and it should have a bigger picture. It is not one or two risks, only positive or negative risk. It's about all the risks which are identified, assessed throughout and managed together. There should be a risk register to capture all of this. That is the reason there is a dedicated risk management knowledge area defined in PMP framework. So tailoring considerations would be size of the project, complexity of the project, importance of the project and approaches for various different things which are adapted and adopted for the project. So as the size and complexity of the project varies, obviously the impact of the projects because of certain failures will be varying. When I say importance of the project, the deliverables of the project, how important is for my business. If I'm doing a project to enhance the capability of the people in general, then that is important to the business perspective, but it does not have a time target. It is a continual exercise for organization. But I am getting into a specific new project and I need people's competency should be improved. Now I have a specific point in time before which I should have that capability. Otherwise, I will lose on that opportunity. So likewise, my tailoring consideration in the projects in terms of what is that I'm going to deliver? What is that benefits the people who are investing on this project? What is the return they would get? Unless that is visible, we cannot say how important the project is. Then approaches defined would be based on what kind of technology is used, what kind of deliverables required, what kind of environment we are into, what are the outputs which should come out of a project, what would be the outcome of that project. As you define all of this, when the direction is set clearly, accordingly, one can take an approach. So people can adopt a predictive life cycle project management, adaptive life cycle project management, which is basically a waterfall versus agile approaches. Two different uh, approaches which we can broadly mention about. So risk management processes. So risk management processes includes plan risk management, identify risks, perform qualitative risk analysis, perform quantitative risk analysis, plan risk responses. So all the processes one to five are part of planning process group. Implement risk responses will be part of executing process group and monitor risk will be part of monitoring and control process group. So plan risk management, which is the first process in this knowledge area, focuses on defining how to conduct risk management activities for a project. This process helps in ensuring that the degree, type and visibility of risk management are proportionate to both risk and the importance of the project to the organization and other stakeholders. So it is performed once or at the predefined points in the project life cycle. But however, even though it is defined in the planning process group here in the framework, Planning for the risks should be integrated one, which should be applicable to any given scenario of the project. But however, if there is any modification for this, as we progress in the project required, that can be done. Inputs to plan risk management process would be project charter, project management plan, project documents, enterprise environmental factors, and organizational process assets. Tools would be expert judgment, data gathering, meetings, whereas outputs would be risk management plan so identify risk identify risk 
is a process which identifies the individual project risk as well as the sources of overall project risks. So when I say sources, we're speaking about the causes of that risk and documenting those risks and all the associated details describing why should I consider this as a risk? Why am I saying it is a risk? That needs to be described. So this process helps in documenting and existing individual project risk and the sources of overall project risk. It also helps him bringing together the information using which the project team can respond appropriately to identified risk. This process is performed throughout the project. So one has to keep identifying the risk throughout the project lifecycle. So input of identified risk process would be project management plan, project documents, agreements, procurement documentation, EF and OPA. Whereas tools used as part of identified risk process would be expert judgment, data gathering, data analysis, interpersonal and team skills, prompt lists and meetings. The outputs of identify risk process would be risk register, risk report and project document updates. The next process for us is perform qualitative risk analysis. So perform qualitative risk analysis is the process of assessing and analyzing the identified risk qualitatively. So this helps in prioritizing the project's risk for further analysis or action by assessing their probability of occurrence and impact as well as other characteristics. So this process prioritizes the individual project's risk and also look at major benefits of this process that is a focus effort of high priority risks. This process is performed regularly throughout the project life cycle and inputs to this process includes project management plan, project documents, EFs and OPA. The tools, tools used are expert judgment, interpersonal and team skills, data gathering, data analysis, risk categorization, data representation and meetings. So the output of this particular process perform qualitative risk analysis would be project documents updates. So perform quantitative risk analysis. So further as after doing qualitative risk analysis, if a risk also needs to be analyzed quantitatively, so one can conduct quantitative risk analysis. So this process numerically analyzes the combined effect of identified individual project risk and other sources of uncertainty on overall project objectives. The main benefit of this process is that it quantifies overall project risk exposure and it can also provide additional quantitative risk information to support risk response planning. This process is not required for every project, but where it is used, it is performed throughout the project. So where should we use this quantitative risk analysis? Wherever the project size is big, where the project is complex. So inputs to this particular uh, process would be project management plan, project documents like assumptions log, basis of estimates, cost estimates, cost forecast, duration estimates, milestone lists, resource requirement, risk registers, and uh, schedule forecast. So enterprise environmental factors as well as OPA. So tools used as part of this particular process would be expert judgment, data gathering, interpersonal and team skills, representation of uncertainty, then data analysis. The outputs, project documents, updates. So plan risk responses. So as we identify the risk and then analyze them qualitatively and quantitatively, so we know positive risk or negative risk, what kind of impact each of those risks would have. So how are we going to get benefit of positive risk? How are we going to reduce the impact of negative risk? So this requires planning risk responses. So this process helps in developing options, selecting strategies and agreeing on actions to address overall project risk exposure as well as to treat individual project risk. This also identifies appropriate ways to address overall project risk and individual project risk. This process also allocates resources and inserts activities into project documents and the project management plans as needed. So this is performed throughout the project life cycle. So now inputs to plan risk responses would be project management plan, which involves resource management plan, risk management plan and cost baseline. Then project document, which is lessons learned register, project schedule, project team assignments, resource calendars, risk register, risk report, stakeholder register, EF and OPA. Tools. Tools involves uh, expert judgment, data gathering, interpersonal and team skills, 
strategies for threats strategies for opportunities then uh, contingency response strategies strategies for overall project risk data analysis and decision making the outputs of this process would be change request pmp updates that is project management plan updates and project documents updates so implement risk responses so as we plan for risk responses it is very essential for us to look at implementation of that responses so this process considers all those risk responses plan what is defined already and accordingly it will implement so this process of implementing agreed upon risk response plans provides a key benefit so what is the key benefit of this process that is to ensure that agreed upon risk responses are executed as planned in order to address overall project risk exposure minimizing the individual project threats and maximizing overall project opportunities so process helps in implementing agreed upon risk response as i mentioned earlier so now once we are ready we are making ourselves ready to respond to the risk scenario some of the risks you cannot even able to reduce by doing the risk response plan implemented if power going off in between while you are playing presentation or conducting a training so that will impact the training so how will you ensure the power is available always so you will go for ups that is a response plan what you made so ups cannot give the backup more than 2 hours 3 hours let us assume that you will have a generator so that if power fails ups will take care immediately then you go and switch on the generator which will generate the power and load on the ups would come down and ups is always in the loaded condition so that even generator fails ups will take care for some time but there will be some scenarios where fuel will is not available so generator cannot run so such risks are called residual risks which we will accept because we implemented this ups as well as generator it is quite obvious these two introduces additional risk risk associated with ups itself risk associated with generator itself we call it as a second risk so in this case what we did was before the occurrence of the risk we implemented the risk responses but there will be some scenario where you cannot implement the risk responses you should yourself make ready to handle those scenarios what if the building collapses what if the earthquake happens what if flooding happens so you will have a contingency plan defined so contingency plan you can implement or else looking at the impact kind of thing you will make yourself ready let it go i have other modes of operating my business and move forward or make my project successful so inputs to this particular process would be project management plan project documents and opa tools used as part of this particular process is expert judgment interpersonal and team skills project management information system outputs would be project document updates and change requests monitor risk process monitor risk process which is part of monitoring and control process group defined in pmp this process mainly monitors the implementation of agreed upon risk response plans tracking identified risk identifying and analyzing new risk and evaluating risk process effectiveness throughout the project so this process helps in enabling the project decisions to be based on current information about overall project risk exposure and individual project risk so this is performed throughout the project life cycle so input to this process would be project management plan project documents work performance data and work performance reports tools used as part of this particular process would be data analysis audits as well as meetings outputs work performance information change request pmp updates that is project management plan updates project documents updates and opa updates so let us come to the project procurement management so firstly we need to understand when we say procurement management every project involves procurement so when we take up a project when organization decides we need to take up a project organization decides should we really invest on this or not that is first decision organization make once the decision is made there are many things which are used as part of the project to deliver that output to create that output to create that result so while doing it within the project there are a lot of things which are created at the same time creation is fine the deliverables which happens throughout the project life cycle is fine but at the same time organizations would also decide some of the deliverables which goes into output i don't make instead i will procure 
or maybe certain facilities required certain resources required organization would decide i will not make it myself i will not manage it directly i will give it to the supplier let the supplier give it to me so a lot of procurements involved raw materials are procured the environment where project is being done that environment i may not have so i may get into a place where i will lease it or i will have a resources on a time and material basis for a specific duration a specific tool a specific instrument so i procure another similar scenario is i as an organization don't do this project so instead i give this project to the some of the experts the organization which has expertise in this area so if my business is a retail i sell products but i don't know anything about civil constructions so i need to have a facility where i am going to have my particular retail office or retail store now i need to have this construction so i am not expert in that so i will give it to an expert an organization which has an expertise in this so i will procure so any procurement involved in the project which is there anyways at various different levels procurement happens so pmp considers the specific focus which is required and helps project manager to understand what is involved in procurement management so procurement management is basically focuses on ensuring purchasing and acquiring products or services and or the results required from outside the project team we are not creating this so we don't create because we do not want to focus on that area let us give it to someone else let me say i am a car manufacturer an automobile manufacturing company who integrate various different parts of the car and then sell i don't manufacture engine because i do not want to have creating that facility creating that plant of manufacturing and i do not want to invest because i don't have an expertise instead I have a organization which is very good having good expertise and take that engine manufactured by them and integrate into my car so i am procuring that engine i have given that creation of that engine producing that engine to some organization and i am procuring it that is one possibility so procurement when i say we may also go for human resources for temporary period human resources if you can think about civil construction project a concrete mixer can be a one which is outsourced to me i am procuring on a time and material basis that is also another possibility raw material required for my project i am procuring so it's all about identifying all those resources the products or the services for my project and what is that i am going to procure what is that i am going to make myself one has to decide on that once the decision is made then actual procurement happens so we will see how what is that exactly pmp speaks about it the project procurement management has various different considerations to make before go on procuring so this includes understanding the trends and emerging practices so advances in the various different tools so which tool should i use as part of this project which makes sense to me which helps in terms of accomplishing the results required and what is the risk involved effectively how am i going to do the risk management what are the methodologies what are the approaches we have so when i procure is there any risk involved when i do it myself is there any risk involved when i compare both the risk which one is better so we need to analyze that then changing contracting processes as we know there is a changing demand in the market the mindset of the consumers are changing rapidly and the way we contract the way we establish the contract is also changing so that it should accommodate the changing need of the market condition then logistics and supply chain management or the one which is there with me versus what needs to be established then technology and stakeholder relations now a lot of transactions involved with the stakeholders the engagement which has to happen while procuring because decisions has to be made while procuring involvement of the stakeholders happens and involvement of technology today so today we cannot imagine any specific industry or any specific organization or any specific operations or project which is happening in the absence of technology so what would be the right technology which is appropriate to my project that needs to be considered and then engagements which happens while doing the procurements so we need to have a tailoring considerations while doing procurement which includes complexity of procurement complexity of a procurement may be because of the technology involved because of the geographies various different geographies the team size the kind of project i am doing and the region where i am doing it it may be of a legality of that particular geography the mandatory things which i need to comply with while i do the procurement in that region 
then physical location as i mentioned then governance and regulatory environment which i cannot miss which i cannot shy away from considering it i have to consider those and i should do within it i should consider like tax structure can i ignore it no registration requirements i cannot ignore which are the basic requirements to have before i do the procurement then availability of contractors so in not every region you will have the resources in some of the cases you may require to bring it from the different region altogether maybe from different state or different city or from different country altogether so many organizations outsource a certain part of it to certain organization as i was mentioning about car scenario so outsourcing the engine manufacturing to some other manufacturing company or in it scenario outsourcing like outsourcing to different country so that they will do it for me remotely they will do the work like organizations which are in the different country developing a specific application for me monitoring an application for me while i produce something here as part of the project so a lot of such outsourcing which would happen because of non availability of certain skills capability another scenario would be the cost of resources in the local region versus cost of resources in different region that would also become outsourced to different countries the various different processes involved in procurement management would be plan procurement management conduct procurements and control procurements mainly three processes so plan procurement management is the process in planning process group whereas conduct procurement is in executing process group and control procurement is in monitoring and control so when i say plan procurement management this has to help in terms of planning my procurement i need to make the decisions mainly i need to provide the necessary guidelines set a directions to conduct the procurements and then based on that you will control so you monitor and control the procurements the way it is conducted in reality versus what is being planned so moving to plan procurement management which is a process in planning process group so in procurement management knowledge area in this process one will document the project procurement decision specifying the approach and identifying the potential sellers so in this process you need to document various procurement decisions specifying procurement approach and identification of potential and quality sellers so once this process is executed predefined points in project life cycle will be understood visualized and that will help in deciding whether this needs to be acquiring goods or services from outside or not should be make or buy such decisions has to be made it should provide the guidelines in case there is a need it also helps in identifying which resources has to be acquired and when that clarity should be provided in plan procurement management inputs to plan procurement management process is project charter business documents which is business case and benefits management plan which are mainly referred to then project management plan that is scope management plan quality management plan resource management plan scope based plan which are already consolidated in project management plan updated then project documents which involves milestone list project team assignments requirements documentation requirements traceability metrics resource requirements risk register then ef and opa now plan procurement management tools and techniques used involves expert judgment data gathering data analysis source selection criteria or source selection analysis meetings then output of this process would be procurement management plan then procurement strategy bid documents procurement statement of work source selection criteria make or buy decisions so many gets confused to see make or buy decision as an output of something they look that as an action but basically the decisions what is made what should i procure what i should not something which i consider in the project should i buy or make myself so these decisions are made that comes as an output then independent cost estimates change request project document updates and ops organizational process assets updates the next process is conduct procurement when we say conduct procurement it's quite obvious we need to understand it is an action which is happening in execution so there is a plan which is set already so to that plan there should be an action which happens conduct procurement is the process of obtaining sellers responses 
selecting a seller and awarding the contract so this is the process which is in executing process group so when we say conduct procurement the actions required to identify a specific seller finalize okay this is the seller and then establish the contract with that particular seller and then do the procurements so selection of seller should happen agreements needs to be established which is very essential to do the procurement so the inputs to this process involves project management plan that is scope management plan requirements management plan communication management plan risk management plan procurement management plan configuration management plan cost baseline if you observe very closely procurement management plan is an output of a process within the same knowledge area is one of the inputs to conduct procurement then project documents which involves lessons learned register project schedule requirements documentation technical requirements relating to the seller risk register stakeholder register then procurement documents like bid documents procurement statement of work independent cost estimates source selection criteria so these are very essential when you go and identify a seller and discuss engage clarify if at all any doubts that particular seller probable seller a bidder would have then further the inputs list goes with like seller proposals which actually comes as a response to a request for proposal maybe organization would float an rfp request for proposal from a sellers who are interested sellers proposals which comes in then efs and ops appropriate one for procurement like local laws and regulation economic environment marketplace conditions information on relevant experience any agreement which are already in place consideration of that contract management system then ops like list of preferred sellers organizational policies organizational templates and guidelines financial policies and procedures so taking this as an input this process conducts the procurement by using the tools and techniques like expert judgment advertising advertising which is required to invite a probable seller to respond to the request for proposal then data analysis bidder conferences the bidder conferences are held to clarify any doubts any clarifications which are there with a specific seller before they submit the response to the rfp a proposal before they submit then interpersonal and team skills which are essential while conducting procurement so outputs of this process conduct procurement would be selected sellers identified sellers the finalized one then agreements which are established with those selected sellers the change request so change request may be an output here not initially when you do the conduct procurement later as the project progresses maybe some additional deliverables may be required from a specific seller so may raise for a change request or maybe some clauses has to be changed in the agreement you would raise a change request that is possible as this process happens throughout the project life cycle maybe change of the seller itself the partner itself or the one who is supplying certain things change of that itself is required change request can be raised then pmp updates project document updates and op updates next process is control procurement so control procurement is part of monitoring and control knowledge area which is a process meant for ensuring the procured relations are managed as defined the contract performance as we defined in the contract versus the actual performance are checked then appropriate necessary modifications are made to bring it back to the required one so this process is performed throughout the project life cycle and it helps in ensuring that performance of both the involved parties that is buyers and sellers is up to the project requirement as stated in legal arrangements legal agreement inputs to this process involves project management plan project documents agreements procurement documents so now when i say project management plan it's quite obvious i need to see what was actually planned and how it is exactly done so requirements management plan risk management plan change management plan schedule baseline project documents when i say assumptions logs lessons learned register milestone list quality reports requirements documentation requirements traceability matrix risk and stakeholder register and agreements which are established between the seller and buyer and any procurement documents which are decided along with them approved change requests then work performance data 
organizational process asset and enterprise environmental factors the tools used as part of control procurement process should be expert judgment claims administration data analysis inspection and audits the outputs of this process is closed procurements work performance information procurement documentation updates change request if at all any deviation is identified then update to project management plan project documents and opa organizational process assets so this concludes the basic understanding one should have while doing procurement management so when i say stakeholder we need to understand the dynamics associated with the stakeholder who will become the stakeholder for a project and why should we engage with the stakeholder and why should we do whatever is required to be done with the stakeholder which is very essential for us to look at it very carefully because there will be stakeholders who are main decision makers who can entirely influence the project and make or break the project there will be stakeholders who will have nothing to do with this particular project but they may create noise there may be stakeholders who will get impacted because of the project so likewise with various different relationships various different alignment there will be stakeholders for every given project so project stakeholder management needs to be understood in terms of what is this stakeholder management is all about why should i manage a stakeholder so pmis pmbo ke defines the project stakeholder management as identification of the stakeholders like people group organizations who would impact get impacted who would influence get influenced and analyze what are the expectations of various different stakeholders identified and how their involvement will impact influence impacted or influenced to the project and to the stakeholders and create and develop appropriate strategies to effectively engage with stakeholders so that stakeholders engagement or stakeholders involvement benefits the project it should not take away the project's objectives so it should complement to the project so project stakeholder management is very important knowledge area and as we know i think communication in a project management project manager the amount of time the project manager spends around 90% that is very essential this itself says the kind of involvement a project manager should have the sensitivity project manager should have while looking at the stakeholder involved for a project the way they impact the project so stakeholder management overview involves considerations of various trends and emerging practices related to stakeholder management so as part of this we need to identify all the stakeholders being a project manager so identification of all the stakeholder involves all those who are involved in the project who are internal to the project and who are external to the project who doesn't involve in the project directly so one has to identify all of those stakeholders then ensuring that all team members are involved in stakeholder engagement activities at various different levels and in various different capacities so one has to review the stakeholder community regularly and the dynamics the transactions associated with it then consulting with stakeholder engaging with stakeholder is very essential then capturing the value of effective stakeholder engagement so did we really create that value which is looked up to by a stakeholder or is that creating that value what is expected if i say customer as a stakeholder the value associated with is different if i say my team member is a stakeholder the dynamics differs if i say competition to an organization is a stakeholder dynamics differs the supplier or a partner with my organization and my project dynamics differs the family members of the people who are working in the project the team members dynamics differs so there will be stakeholders where a project manager should engage involve directly there will be stakeholder where project manager need not involve directly to manage them maybe team members would involve there will be stakeholders who any one in the project team need not involve with those stakeholders so likewise understanding who are the stakeholders how are they going to impact the project how are they going to get impacted influenced and how are they going to influence and what is the distance they have from the project to make any impact to the project or get impacted so this visualization is important so that appropriate engagement can happen with the stakeholders so that required value can be created project objectives can be achieved
So this involves the tailoring considerations like stakeholders diversity. When I say stakeholder diversity, I already mentioned where exactly the stakeholder would exist. So every stakeholder comes up with a different background, different authority, different ability to influence, capabilities they come up with. So that diversity needs to be acknowledged first, understood. One cannot ignore it is very sensitive one. Then complexity of stakeholder relationship. The moment if I say stakeholder, obviously there's a lot of intellect, emotions which are involved. The swing in these aspects which happens regularly. So that is not visible directly. So one needs to be sensitive about it for a given context. Even though there is an engagement plan defined, there is some interpersonal skills required for the person who is engaging with the stakeholder. So accordingly, whenever there is an information need to be put, the message has to be put to someone. Having sensible to that scenario, that message has to be given. And also the relationship needs to be managed. Communication technology. So various communication technology today, every business organizations use and project management or project environment also has it. So this also plays an important role. So a communication channel, a technology used to communication can also create noise. That noise which is there in the communication, the choice of words also, the choice of vocabulary also plays a role in communication, which would give a different meaning to the different stakeholders. So when, for example, when I give a report, when I review, if I am doing that with the sponsor, I would give it a different template and different content which is presented certain way. Whereas I'm doing the same review with my team members as a project manager, the content, the template would vary and the message what needs to be conveyed also varies. So the language needs to be used varies. The technology platforms, the channels which needs to be used varies. So these variations, deviations has to be properly understood. Only then you will have an effectiveness in terms of handling stakeholders. Then the processes of stakeholder management. So there are around four processes. So identify stakeholder, which is an initiating process group. Plan stakeholder engagement, which is in planning process group. Manage stakeholder engagement, which is in executing process group. Monitor stakeholder engagement, which is in monitoring and controlling process group. So all these processes are very essential. So if you closely observe this, I said identify stakeholder process is in initiating process group. So if you look at the entire knowledge areas of the one which is defined in PMP, if you look at very closely, this is the only knowledge area where you see a process in initiating process group other than integration management. So in initiating process group, there are only two processes, one in integration management and other one is in stakeholder management. So if you visualize the project, the way it flows in a project life cycle, identification of stakeholder happens immediately after developing the project charter. The first job of a project manager is to identify the stakeholders, go sit with the stakeholders, create the stakeholder register, have the details of the stakeholders. So this is the first process and only knowledge area other than integration management, which has a process in initiating process group. Let us look at the first process, identify stakeholders. So identify stakeholder is a process in initiating process group, as I mentioned, which is basically focuses on identifying all the project stakeholders, not once, regularly throughout the project life cycle and documenting the relevant information required to understand about the stakeholders, like interest of the stakeholders, involvement requirement of a stakeholder, interdependency, ability to influence, the impact or influence or impacted, influenced, to this terms, how is this specific stakeholder is related? The project stakeholders are regularly identified, analyzed throughout the project life cycle. So it cannot happen at once. So stakeholders in the projects keep changing. You may onboard new supplier. So you have a new stakeholder. You may have a person who onboarded into a project like a team member. There is a resignation which has happened. There is a change in the team member. There is a movement of team member, right? In the customer organization, there may be change in the point of contact to this project. Reasons may be various. So understanding this dynamics of change of stakeholders regularly, identifying the stakeholder and updating the stakeholder register is very essential. So identifying stakeholder is not a process which happens once in the entire project life cycle. It will happen throughout the project life cycle. Inputs to this process involves project charter, business documents, project management plan, then project documents, agreements, 
enterprise environmental factors and organization process assets so these details like project charter because it is in the same process group business document because based on that a specific project charter is defined and that also tells who are the primary stakeholders and uh, if at all any project documents are available like change log issue log requirements documentation that will also help so project management plan basically which helps in terms of basic plan whichever is available at that point in time also tells what is this project is all about and how the project is supposed to progress any established agreements will also help in going and speaking to that particular stakeholder so ef and opa obviously to understand what is there in that particular environment which helps which guides or which becomes a reference while going and identifying the stakeholders then tools used during identification of stakeholder would be expert judgment data gathering data analysis data representation and meetings so the output of this process is it is obvious that is stakeholder register so stakeholder register which captures all the details of that identified stakeholders in terms of the position the authority the ability to influence and the proximity of the stakeholder relating to the project in what distance the stakeholder is then next output would be change request if at all any change to the stakeholder register in terms of new stakeholder has to be added some stakeholders needs to be removed so change request is required then project management plan updates and project document updates next process is plan stakeholder engagement so plan stakeholder engagement is the process which will have all those approaches which are involved in terms of engaging with stakeholders their needs expectations interest potential impact on the project so this process is part of planning process group so in this process various approaches are curated in order to involve the stakeholders on the basis of their needs interest expectations and impact and influence what they have into the project so this is performed at the periodic intervals throughout the project life cycle and whenever the new stakeholder is identified so even then you need to understand do this how am i going to engage with this particular stakeholder so the tools and techniques involved will be various like as i mentioned earlier when a stakeholder involved and people are involved it is very essential for us to have a appropriate engagement plan so while having a engagement plan defined so we need to consider certain things which are required to understand who is the stakeholder first so according to the input should be project charter project management plan project documents like we see assumptions log change log issue log project schedule risk register stakeholder register but one point i want to mention here many times when i conduct training especially in stakeholder management i keep getting the question like this process is in planning process group but we are speaking about assumptions log change log issue log which project manager refers throughout the project life cycle so how is that coming in so we need to understand this process including identify stakeholder process doesn't happen only in once in the particular project life cycle these are repetitive as the particular stakeholder changes update should happen to the stakeholder register as you update to the stakeholder register it is essential to create that plan that engagement plan so you are updating that plan as well that happens throughout the project life cycle maybe almost like you reach the end of the project even then you may require to have a different stakeholders so that is a continued exercise throughout the project life cycle continually you need to update the other set of inputs should be agreements efs and opa the tools and techniques used for plan stakeholder engagement process would be expert judgment data gathering data analysis decision making data representation and meetings the outputs of this process is quite obvious stakeholder engagement plan which will tell who is the stakeholder what are the expectations it will have the details what are the engagement requirements when should i meet why should i meet what is the objective of engaging with the stakeholder and what transaction should happen with that stakeholder how frequently how often that engagement should happen that also needs to be addressed in stakeholder engagement plan so next process which is in executing process group that is manage stakeholder engagement so manage stakeholder engagement is the process of communicating and working with stakeholders so that their expectations are met their issues whichever occurs during the project life cycle are addressed resolved then involvement of the stakeholders will be according to such that organization or project is helped to accomplish the objective of the project so they are in the complementing engagement so various steps are taken 
for establishing that better communication and maintaining the good relationship with the stakeholders. So along with this, their concerns, their issues are addressed and appropriate stakeholders involvement is fostered as well. So it is performed throughout the project life cycle as I mentioned. So this should help a project manager in terms of ensuring there is increased support from a particular stakeholder. Now we need to understand one thing when I say manage stakeholder, when we identify stakeholder and when we plan for that engagement, we need to ensure the engagement happens accordingly. So if I assume a stakeholder who is high in terms of authority, the power and has high interest in this project. Now that particular stakeholder definitely is a decision maker for this project who can influence things. So we cannot ignore such stakeholders. One has to engage with the stakeholder very closely, update, review with them very closely. At the same time, certain stakeholders, what we think about may be in different state altogether. So their active involvement may be required, but they are unaware of this project. So you may require to involve them, push them, pull them, whatever the approach you take, interpersonal skills which you have, interpersonal and team skills. You need to engage with them, create that awareness, and ensure they are in the project actively involved. So likewise, various different stakeholders who will have a different set of state of existence. When I say state of existence, they may be in the unaware state. They may be in the resistant state. They may be neutral. They may be supportive. They may be leading. So whatever the state they are in. So you need to decide what state they are supposed to be in this project. What is the required state versus what is the state they are. So this engagement should help in terms of pulling them back to the required one, required engagement or required state of existence for the stakeholder. A team member cannot be in a resistive state or unaware state. Definitely team member should be in supportive, not in neutral as well, supportive. It means the person should be doing the job. So those dynamics are associated with stakeholder which needs to be understood very carefully. The inputs to this process involves project management plan, which is communication management plan, risk management plan, stakeholder management plan, and change management plan. Then project documents, which is change logs, issue logs, lessons learned register, stakeholder register, EF, and OPA. So culture plays a very important role when I say stakeholder within an organization. Now, the way the people, the stakeholders engage with themselves, the way they conduct themselves, the way they communicate among themselves, the way they treat themselves, all this plays a very important role. So being a project manager, being sensitive to this, so you may require to influence that culture which makes or which is required for a specific project's success. So you cannot just do away with that culture. You may require to influence those. So the tools used for this would be expert judgment, communication skills, interpersonal team skills, ground rules which has to be set for certain transactions and then meetings. Outputs, output involves change requests, project management plan updates and project documents updates. So next process is monitor stakeholder engagement. So monitor stakeholder engagement is the process in monitoring and controlling process group, which is the process of monitoring project stakeholder relationship and tailoring strategies for engaging stakeholders through modification of engagement strategies and plans. So as part of this process, the relationships of project stakeholders are monitored and various strategies are tailored in order to engage with the stakeholder using engagement plans and strategies. The process is performed, has to be performed throughout the project life cycle and this will help increasing the efficiency and effectiveness of the implied stakeholders engagement activities. Which is a critical process. The success of a stakeholder engagement can ensure a success of project because there are decision makers, there are stakeholders who are doing activities in the project. Their active involvement is very essential for those stakeholders who needs to be involved. So understanding that is very essential. And accordingly, you have defined that engagement plan and you need to ensure it happens accordingly. The objectives are achieved. It's very essential. So inputs to this process should be project management plan, which involves resource management plan, communication management plan, stakeholder management plan, project documents like issue logs, lessons learned register, project communications, risk register, stakeholder register, work performance data, EF and OPA. Then tools used as part of this process would be data analysis, communication skills, decision making, data representation, ground rules and then meetings. 
Outputs of this process includes work performance information, change request, if at all any deviations found in terms of the way the engagement happened, the way the objectives are accomplished. Now change request in stakeholder engagement. So if you look at it very carefully, earlier in any knowledge area when you speak in the entire framework what we have discussed, whenever we say change request, we spoke about adding something, removing something, modifying something. But in this case, when we raise a change request, it also involves some approach what I have defined versus the approach with work. I may require to update that also, which is a specific dynamics which involves here in especially stakeholder engagement. Then project management plan updates and project documents updates would be the outputs for monitor stakeholder engagement. So that's all about stakeholder management knowledge area defined in PMI's PMP, that is PMBOK. I think this will provide certain insight towards stakeholder engagement, but in real time, it is more than what is told here, which requires a lot of sensitivity, a lot of involvement, a lot of understanding of the dynamics of that environment. I hope this provided you certain insights which help you to understand what stakeholder management is all about. What is Agile Project Management? Agile Project Management is an iterative approach to software development projects that guarantees input and is immediately acted upon and responsive changes are made at each level of sprint or product cycle. This enables the project teams to use agile project management approaches to operate swiftly and collaboratively with a project's deadline and budget. Many agile project management approaches were created with software in mind. However, the underlying agile ideals and agile project concepts may be applied to a wide range of teams from product teams to marketing teams. So if we give a proper definition to it, then Agile Project Management is a collaborative, iterative project management approach that incorporates continuous testing and responsiveness to change. Next, why Agile Project Management? Going back as far as 1970s, software teams discovered that the highly organized, heavy-weighted traditional project management approaches such as waterfall just weren't cutting it when it came to the way they needed to work. Numerous post-failure analysis highlighted that there were two consistent fault areas, that is, project's utilization was little, if any, formal overarching management methodology. Secondly, projects were applying the methodology, but not necessarily one best suited the software development. These pressures led to the development of Agile. Delivering a managed approach to a software development without a conventional procedural emphasis and compartmentalization, Agile focuses on iterating through product requirements, encouraging continuous improvement, and responding quickly to changing requirements from aspect of a team, mentally rather than an individual level. Today, we can see there is 90% of the significant growth in agile adoption within the companies and around 50% of the respondents who had focused on the agile methodology had delivered the best results. Around two thirds of the respondents identified the strongest positive impact from the agile adoption. So if we talk about the principles of Agile Project Management, so there are around 12 key principles of Agile Project Management that every one of us should be knowing. So firstly, satisfy the customer. The number one priority is customer satisfaction through the early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Next is welcome changing requirements. Welcome changing developments, even in late development, agile processes harness change to customers' competitive advantage. Next, deliver working software frequently. It means from couple of weeks to couple of months within a presence of shorter time scale. Collaborate daily. Business people and developments must work together daily throughout the project. Next is motivated individuals. Build projects around motivated individuals, give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Face-to-face -face conversation. 
the most efficient and the effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is the face to face conversation working software is the primary measure of progress so agile processes processes to promote sustainable development that is the sponsors developers and users should be able to maintain the constant pace indefinitely continuous attention to technical excellence you must have continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility simplicity is the art of maximizing the amount of work not done that is very essential the best architectures requirements and design emerge from the self organizing teams and finally at regular intervals the team reflects on how to become more effective the tunes and adjust its behavior accordingly so these are the 12 principles that agile project management follows and encourage you to deliver iterations quickly and often because it is better for the thing to exist in a flawed reality than in a perfect theory so what are the steps involved in agile project management in agile project management as you can see this diagram here there are five steps that agile project management follows first is the requirements then you design then you develop and then once you develop your project it goes ahead with the testing and once your test is done we deploy it is ready to be deployed so based on this we have the agile project management framework so let's see how does agile project management works so here you can see there are five phases based on which the agile project management work so first phase is a vision phase the evision phase is the initial phase within the agile project management framework in general after approval of business case the agile key members are involved in the evision phase where they collaborate to create the compelling vision for a project a vision phase identifies customers vision of project decides the key capabilities required in the project set the business objectives of the project identifies the quality objectives of the project and identifies the right participant and stakeholders of the project and plans how a team will deliver the project after this we come to the next phase that is spectacular phase in spectacular phase the product vision into a backlog of requirement is translated to overall approach the overall approach to meet the requirement is realized and a high level of release plan for the product is presented so there are two key activities that happens in spectacular phase so first activity is that the team must come up with at least an initial understanding of the requirement for the project so each feature will be further broken down into one or more user stories for the team to discuss and estimate so there are two key activities that happens in spectacular phase the first activity is the team must come up with at least an initial understanding of the requirements for the project each feature will be then broken down into one or more user stories for the team to discuss and estimate they must make sure that the requirements also have to be prioritized so that the team knows in what order to start working on them the second aspect is to determine a high level milestone based on the plan that spectaculates how long it would take to create those features this planning happens at multiple levels such as release level wave level and iteration level after spectacular phase we go into a explore phase that is the third phase of the agile project management framework so as the name is suggested in this phase team members explore various alternatives to implement and fulfill the requirements of the project in this phase work deliveries and testing takes place here the product vision needs to be transformed to release plan and then to the respective iteration plan the team works in an iterative manner in the explore phase that means they take a subset of the product feature or a story and accept it into a plan for the iteration then 
it will be processed to work on the development for the stories. It goes hand in hand with the adapt phase, wherein the team learns from the experiences of the development and the feedback from the customers. So next is the adapt phase. In adapt phase, the agile team reviews the result of the execution, the current situation, performance of the team against the plan and adapt as per the requirement. Adaptation can be changing the approach to the project management, changing the process or changing the environment or changing the project's objective and so on as per the requirements of the customers. So taking feedback, acknowledging it and adapting to the situation based on the feedback is the major work of this phase. So at last is the close phase. This is the last phase within the Agile project management framework. It concludes the project in an ordered manner, capturing the project's key lessons. So this was all about the Agile project management framework, how it works. So which in all companies are adapting the Agile project management? So as for the recent research, 71% of the companies use Agile approaches, among which Cisco, Ericsson, IBM, Microsoft are the major users of the Agile project management. Lastly, Agile project management tools. So some of the best Agile project management tools are Proof Hub, Rick, Smartsheet, Active Collapse, and many more. We'll start with our understanding of who's a project manager. Project manager is a person who's aware how to handle a project. And at the same time, he is also aware on what are the different constraints in a project, what he has to handle. He also has a good experience in dealing with people, dealing with team, managing the team. So we can say that the project managers are the main catalyst of a project and they are responsible for driving in projects through various phases. Now, when you go through various phases, you will encounter many constraints. You will encounter many challenges. So he is the one who has a good idea on all the phases such as initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, controlling and closing phases. So project manager is exposed to the project environment. He works with the team, works with the sponsors, works with customers and various stakeholders, understanding what are their need, requirement and expectations, captures them and prepares a project management plan. And throughout, we follow that project management plan and ensure what is planned and approved gets delivered. So basically, when I talk about on key items, what project manager deals with, these are scope, time and cost, followed by three other constraints, which is quality, risk and resources. These are the main areas wherein project manager focuses. So we can say that the project manager also shoulders the responsibility of entire project scope, team management, risk estimations handling risk responses throughout the project. It's an authoritative role, which has an authority to ensure the project purpose and objectives that we are setting up in the beginning of the project. Moving forward, there has been a lot of questions coming in on different salary trends, what the project managers can get. And there's a very interesting statistics what we have, which gives us an idea in terms of number of jobs in different locations. Starting up with New York, number of jobs is to the tune of double one, double six. San Francisco, 471, Chicago, 613, Washington, 566, Boston, 450, and the list goes on. Let us talk about of a salary which is starting up from $65,000. So if you look at this kind of a salary, there are about 32.71% of jobs in the market. Similarly, when I look at a second salary bracket, which is around $80,000, you have almost about 26.25% of the salary percentage in this. Then comes up $90,000. So the opening isn't of the percentage is going to be about 19.94. Then comes up $100,000. You have 13.43% of job openings. Similarly, when I talk about on the $110,000, the openings are in the tune of 7.65%. Of course, when you see a higher salary bracket, that would also mean good experience. If I want to compare the salary from India perspective and salary from US perspective, so we thought of coming out with an average salary to give us an idea. 
an average salary in a US of a person who is a project manager and needless to say I am expecting the person to be PMP certified average salary in US is about $72,000 if I compare the same salary in Indian context this could be somewhere about 190505 which is about 11.9 lakhs so if we are actually talking about entry level project manager because the salary trend what i am sharing with you this is the generic and average salary trend let us now prefer having a look at the salary trends based on different experience and we'll start with an entry level project manager the person who has a little experience let us say that maybe about 3 or 4 years of experience and he starts with project management so here is the salary reference for you maybe if i look at on our total package we are talking about of this package ranging between 39767 dollar till 90784 dollars of course this package has few break up starting with basic salary so we are considering basic salary in the range of 41401 which can go till about 87694 dollars we are considering few bonus depending on the different industries different organizations bonus ranging from 498 dollars to about 10117 dollar and we are also talking about of a profit sharing which ranges from 305 dollars to about 9648 dollars so if you look at the compensation it could be maybe ranging from 1260 dollars to 25081 dollars all put together i would say broadly between 40000 to 90000 so that's an idea about the entry level project manager let me assume that you have some more experience and i'm considering you as maybe about mid career level mid career would mean that you have already been exposed to the project maybe about 7 to 8 years kind of an experience let us look at the salary trend and i'll call that as a mid career project manager so if you look at compensation here the basic is now going to be at 50778 and if you remember the entry level people we were considering that in the range of 41000 so there is tentatively an increase of almost about 20% here so salary in this case which we call that as a mid career project manager ranging from 50778 dollars till about 106103 dollar bonus almost i would say the two times of what we have seen it before so which is about 985 dollar and till about 14489 dollars similarly on a profit sharing we are talking about of a 295 dollars and 10437 so profit sharing value remains more or less the same and then comes up to the compensation which is 1005 dollar to about 24747 so profit sharing and compensation more or less these two columns are pretty much similar but the base salary and the bonus has a big difference so this comes out to be somewhere in the range of 49657 dollars so let us say that 50000 for our is and going in till about 112540 dollars so that's a good jump in comparison to what we have seen it for the entry level so if i look at a total package i consider that as a jump ranging from 15 to 20% and i'm sure you also have a curiosity to know about maybe a person who is very good experienced project manager and let us say that his experience is ranging between about 12 years to about 15 or 18 years and if i consider that as maybe one of the third category of looking at salary trends that sounds even more exciting so i'm considering now an experienced project manager with the experience ranging from 12 years to 15 years a person with that kind of an exposure can expect a basic salary of about 55850 dollars till about 122768 dollars and if i look at a bonus maybe it could range from 986 dollar till about 17899 dollars profit sharing would not be as high as it used to be in the previous two stages so it's going to be maybe ranging from 0 till about 14737 dollars and when we look at a compensation this would be in the range of 1008 till about 25584 dollars so on the whole if i try to add up all the components i realize a person with about 12 to 15 years of a project experience and of course i will also add up a word called as a certification maybe from pmi so this person can actually expect a salary ranging from 54 to 31 dollars till about 138 31 dollars so that's the kind of a salary which you can expect from maybe an experienced project manager now what happens in lot of cases is that there are people who get into the project maybe at a later date but at the same time they also have a huge exposure so what i'm referring here is i'm referring about one more category so far what i have discussed with you on a category number 1 as entry level project manager 
नंबर टू एज मिड कैरियर प्रोजेक्ट मैनेजर थर्ड कैटेगरी एज एक्सपीरियंस प्रोजेक्ट मैनेजर एंड नाउ आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट ऑफ अ फोर्थ कैटेगरी व्हिच टॉक्स अबाउट मे बी अ लेट कैरियर प्रोजेक्ट मैनेजर द पर्सन हुड हैव गॉट इन टू द प्रोजेक्ट मैनेजमेंट अ लिटिल लेट बट ही आल्सो कैरीज अ ग्रेट एक्सपीरियंस सो ब्रॉडली इफ आई लुक एट द पैकेज हियर एंड द पैकेज इन एन एक्सपीरियंस प्रोजेक्ट मैनेजर मोर और लेस इट इज गोइंग टू बी अ प्रीटी मच सिमिलर बट there could be an increase of about 3 to 5% wherein the person who has been exposed to this would have a little more package in comparison so if we try to understand on same break up of their salary maybe considering the salary in the entry level first which is about maybe 57615 dollar if we consider that as the base package ranging from 57615 to about 132032 and then maybe looking at a bonus of about 962 dollar varying till about 20348 dollars and then looking into the compensation part which is about 1009 dollar till about 28938 so if i try to kind of a sum up on all this this value is going to be getting in somewhere close to 59000 dollar and it will go somewhere about 150000 dollars so that's going to be the tentative value what we can look at for people who are in the late career project manager now we have got a good idea on different salaries of people at different brackets let us try to understand on various skills what are expected to be in a project manager let us start with the first skill which is called as communication project involves many stakeholders which could be at the same level as project manager which could be people below the level of project manager which could be above the level of project manager so dealing with the people at different authority levels at different hierarchy levels would be the communication and communication would differ from person to person depending on their seniority depending or kind of engagement we have with them so in nutshell if i have to look at 90% of a project manager time goes in the communication and integration so when i refer to this 90% there is one more interesting statistics which says when two people communicate with each other 55% of the message gets communicated through body language 38% gets communicated through voice pitch tone and about 7% which gets communicated through text i hope you understand the statistics indirectly i meant when you are communicating the face to face communication carries the most effectiveness followed by the other various means of doing the communication the person who is communicating must understand that the message what he is trying to communicate is encoded in the language which can be best understood by everybody and he has to also ensure that there is an acknowledgement coming in of the message which will ensure there is a interactive communication going on between the two then comes up leadership leadership skills are pretty much important which talks about of motivating team elevating them boosting their energy boosting their efforts making sure that team grows up from current level to the next level and leadership also talks about of handling various situations and using different forms of leadership sometimes it is good to involve people to take the decisions sometimes there are situation wherein project manager will have to show a leadership role and he may also like to decide on his side but i would prefer more you engage with people better it is going to be when people feel like involved in decision making the commitment from people is pretty high so when i talk about of a team management this also refers on the similar lines saying when the team comes in from different backgrounds when you start working in your project you may need to direct that team once they start working on to the job there is a possibility of some conflict in between if that's the situation you should be working as a mentor or a coach to make sure they get the right guidance when the team understands that ego clash won't take them to a longer way attitude clash will not work out and when they start understanding that complimenting is the best thing and competing may not work if they come to that situation the leader must support that kind of team and going forward you can actually start delegating more items to them so my role which started from a directing would move in from a mentor as a coach to supporting to delegating and maybe once project comes to an end my role will go towards more of thanking acknowledging appreciating the efforts made by the team coming to the negotiation power negotiation is like pretty important which could be with various stakeholders negotiation could be from functional managers which project manager has to have it could be with team it could be with vendors it could be with various stakeholders 
this does not always mean the money as the negotiation there could be many other things which could be talking about of our contract terms early joining of resources payment terms so there are many aspects money happens to be one of them among all then comes a personal organization so when a project manager demonstrates that he is organized he generates a lot of signals and we agreed that 55% is the body language 38% is voice which tone so if you practice what you preach that makes the kind of an impression pretty good on the team members they would understand that you have structured everything you are following it you are using time as means you are very punctual you are delivering the things and at the same time they get a very clear cut message that you follow the timings so that's something to make sure we are organized in our personal space as well office space as well then comes up the last line item here which is on the risk management risk management talks about of identifying what the risks are the risk can be a positive or risk can be a negative a positive risk is called as an opportunity and a negative risk is called as a threat so when we talk about of handling the risk we should pay good importance to both threats as well as opportunities and the key guideline for managing the risk is very simple it is hovering around two words called as probability and impact if it is a negative risk i must try reducing either probability or impact or both i'll give an example when you buy an insurance let us say that you have bought an insurance for maybe your car so what is the purpose you are buying an insurance the purpose is you want to have the impact reduced on to you in case the vehicle meets an accident so the cost of repairs will be transferred to an insurance company so what are you handling probability or impact yes you are handling impact similarly let us talk about of the positive risk that means an opportunity if your organization wants to open up in a different country and you realize that especially opening up in a different country would be a challenging task and you thought of working into a franchisee model or in partnership model with another company who has a base in the country where you wanted to start with so in such scenario you are actually trying to leverage on the other company's presence in that country and you don't mind sharing portion of your margins with them so when we are talking about of a positive risk i will again relate my answer in two words which is probability and impact and i'll say if it is a positive risk if it is an opportunity always try to look at increasing the probability or the impact or both that will make sure that we are handling the risks very well so that's a key understanding on handling the risks and i expect these are very important skills a project manager should have we are getting more questions and the questions which is pretty common is a question saying what are the job description or the roles of a project manager now this will vary depending on what kind of an organization i am in how much of the experience i have so let us look at the various roles what is expected from the project manager to start with project manager is the person who coordinates the internal resources and who is also coordinating the stakeholders then as we said he has to ensure that the project follows the scope time and cost so we can say that he is ensuring that there is a timely completion of the project and within the scope and and within the budget that means we have very clearly mentioned that handling the three constraints which is scope time and cost is actually going to be the key role any organization would expect from the project manager of course there are some add on responsibilities as well but if i have to choose just three out of the big list scope time cost handling would be the one then comes up the defining up the project scope and objectives that means very clearly noting down what are the different requirements then talking about on how do you prepare a project management plan how do you ensure compliance to the project management plan ensure that you do regular project performance tracking using various tools systems and if at all there are any challenges you are open to escalate and report to the management as required and of course you can always go ahead and take their approval for taking up the change request and the purpose of change request could be threefold number 1 it could be a preventive action number 2 it could be a corrective action number 3 it could be a repair action what you may like to trigger with the help of change request so when i look at the job description or roles so these are few of those job descriptions and roles and we have few more to share with you let me share with you the other roles what we have which is in continuation to our previous slide 
which talks about of managing the relationship between the customers and the stakeholder ensuring that we are managing the risks ensuring that we are also having a good stakeholder management especially the vendors and principals and the other organizations which are working on this project with us so that means people outside of my organization as well who are part of this project then comes up uh, tracking the resource availability and talking about of resource allocation okay and end to end needless to say i expect project manager to also be responsible for creating and maintaining the comprehensive project documentation there are many documents in the projects which are very important for project management plan for charter for performance tracking for confirmation that the performance stands delivered and most of these documents are basically the formally signed documents and they are supposed to be part of my organizational process asset they are supposed to be archived when project comes to an end and they are supposed to be used when the project is progressing got it so this was uh, an idea on the project manager job description or roles okay so hope your queries pertaining to the salary pertaining to the various skills pertaining to job description stands uh, addressed and uh, now let me touch base on another interesting query what you guys generally have been asking for and that's what are the items we should include in the project manager resume so when it comes to the project manager resumes there are many things what we can look at in let us look at one sample resumes which talks about of uh, a person who has uh, the certifications as well so if you look at the tag line the bullet line the headings very clearly talking about of the person's name and especially the certification what he carries i'm sure you you know a very good saying which says first impression is the last impression so in the first go i am able to understand hey this guy is an it project manager and he is certified in project management as well carrying lot of certifications such as pmp certifications prince 2 capm so these things are i catchy for me and when i'm trying to look into any of the cv this is what which matters a lot for me okay now let us look at few more items so if i look at cv it covers up experience very clearly so you know that on the left hand side there is an experience written when i talk about on education it is also written very clearly what is the skills somebody is carrying the certifications the languages the softwares the skills so what we'll do is we'll try to get into each line item one by one so that we get a very good uh, picture on the different items of the resume to start with let me look at the first thing first which is on the personal information okay so if you look at on the right hand side portion of a cv it very clearly captures the personal information so what are the personal information first thing first the full name yes that's written then we talk about on the latest phone number which is working then we talk about on email address because if somebody has to communicate at least this cv is giving straight away two options to me one is the phone number and the other is the email id and if i wanted to understand more on this profile of course i have a linkedin profile also here so you are giving an opportunity to somebody that if somebody is interested in your profile they can always go and click on your uh, linkedin profile and get to know more details about your professional certifications your engagements okay so this is the first thing what i would prefer in a cv which is very much important to mention that on the first page second thing which talks about on experience what experience if i look at an experience here it very clearly gives me a message experience starting from year 2006 december month till present and if i compare as on today's date it gives me a very fair idea that this guy is has a pretty good experience as on date what we are referring to he is also clearly mentioning his position what position he is mentioning he is very clearly saying that what designation he has and where is that he is working now so this is also coming up very clearly with this profile okay and when i look at on the other information which is mentioned here which is on experience it is also giving me a message that he has been working in many projects so far the organization name remains the same however his designation is changing hopefully when i read the inside line items it also gives me a very fair idea on the various jobs he has been doing within the same organization and more interesting if i look at the words which are mentioned below they are talking about of lot of statistics so for example if i may pull your attention on one line item here which very clearly says 
he has been working to cut costs by 32% in less than six months. So I would say this is a highlight what he is trying to share it with us. If I look at the second highlight, what he says is reduce the cost of IT maintenance by successfully rebuilding the server infrastructure resulting in over $50,000 of annual savings. So basically, this guy is very intelligent to put forward the two major things he has done it here. And both the major things he is very clearly specifying with the help of statistics and the data points. So basically, he wants to sell his CV very clearly telling that if you hire him, he has a mindset of looking into the efficiency, reduction in the costing, and at the same time without compromising on the quality of the project. So these are pretty interesting way of putting your profile forward to others. And I'm sure with just a, a small explanation here, you would have got to know. Now, if I need to look at the similar thing, this guy is again talking about of again bringing down the cost by 25%. And you need to tell me which organization would not like to have savings in the expenses, right? Now he's mentioning another figure saying maintained the user database of over 30,000 patient. So this is also a statistics depending on what scale of maybe job you guys have for him. And similarly, if I actually go back and look into the, his first experience, what is mentioned here, it also says that this guy has resolved over 200 issues related to IT. He has prepared over 100 infrastructure performance analysis and report. That means he's good in monitoring and control. He's good in delivery. So these are various selling points. I would say he has mentioned that in this profile. Got it? So that's something the way you can put forward on a lot of things like this. Let us now look at beyond the experience, what we have mentioned and beyond the performance, the personal information. Next thing I have is the skill. So various skills, what we expect from project manager that could range from technical or non-technical. We may not expect the project manager to be technical expert at all point in time, but we expect him to have a broader idea on the stream or the technicalities of the line what he is handling, which may include maybe things such as project management software, project management methodologies, frameworks, reporting, stakeholder handling, team building, resource planning, time management, time scheduling, cost assessment, budget management, review, monitoring, conflict handling, policy knowledge. So these are few of the many things what could be important for us to look forward maybe in the technical skills of project manager. So I again repeat, it may not be required for project manager to be the expert in terms of the technicalities, but he should have a broader idea on the technicalities of the project. Having seen the technical skills, I'm sure you have a curiosity to also look into the non-technical skills. Let us figure out on what are the non-technical skills expected from a project manager. Few of these skills we would have already discussed in one of the slides when we mentioned on the skills of a project manager. Let us understand what are the skills expected from your profile. So if I look at the skills here and look at some of those skills mentioned in the CV on my left hand side, you may like to mention some key skills from here such as leadership, such as relationship building, such as collaboration with various team members, problem solving, critical thinking, active listening, negotiation, information gathering. So these are some of the non-technical skills we expect from the project manager. And let us also have a look on the CV now, which talks about on the various education and the certification somebody has. So if I look at on an education, it talks about of maybe first to start with, it's the software, which mentions skills such as Microsoft Project, Microsoft Excel, Skype, Trello, Evernote, Jira, so these are various softwares which will help in enhancing the communication with various stakeholders. And nowadays, not knowing any of these, people would not be comfortable in recruiting you. So these are certain things which you should know. Of course, you may not be an expert in each one of those areas, but at least in some of those skills, you will be an expert. In some of those areas, you will have a moderate knowledge, but good to have some knowledge on each of those areas. Okay. Now look at the education, which is also very much clearly visible in the CV itself. So if we refer this sample resume, it very clearly says Master of Computer Science, Bachelor of Computer Science. So qualification is very clearly seen. So we get to know that what kind of educational background this person has. If at all you have certain certifications, which is highlighting those education, do mention those certifications as well. 
So what are those certifications I'm referring? I'm referring to certifications such as BMP, certifications such as Certified Scrum Master, CAM, such as PMI ACP, which is uh, Agile Certified Practitioner, such as Six Sigma, PPM, PMIT. So there are a lot of certifications and they should be prominent uh, very clearly. So when you are able to put forward those certification, people can understand on what you want to communicate. And maybe pictures can say many things about the person on a profile. And when we look at on similar things from different people, it will be good for us to do a comparison, understand what kind of knowledge somebody would carry. And certifications generally comes in with respect to the knowledge you carry. And when you are having a certification, that means you are proving this to the world that you have written those exams to achieve those level of certifications. And I'm sure you know that most of these certifications are globally renowned. And once you get that certificate and you are continuing your journey to learn more, it creates a pretty good comfort from a project manager perspective to handle different arenas. And of course, when I'm referring the CV, it creates a very good impression in terms of somebody who would like to look at my profile or a CV. So this was all about on the certifications and if at all, I'm going to be summing that up and asking another question to you saying, finally, what are the personality traits of a project manager? Starts from sociability, goal-oriented. You should be proactive. You should be open to inspect and adapt, and you should be able to train yourself. You should be confident. You should be committed to take up the tasks. You should be predictable as well at the same time. So these are some of those few traits which we expect that the project manager has in the personalities what he's carrying. And there is an immense need of people who are having those skills and certifications. And there are many organizations which are consistently hiring people having those kind of a skill set. Example of this is maybe Intel, Amazon, Philips, CGI, Facebook, Microsoft, IBM, and list is going to be pretty big. So this gives us an idea of maybe kind of the certification we should have, the qualification we can have, and how we can present it to others. And how should my CV reflect each of those line items when we talk about of the skill set required for a project manager? As a project manager, you will have a number of roles and responsibilities to perform. So what are the roles and responsibilities of a project manager? Project managers are intended to have a mindset similar to that of an entrepreneur. The knowledge of project managers comprises of both technical as well as management domains. Keeping this in mind, we have penned down some of the most important roles and responsibilities of project managers. First up is planning. Planning takes place at the very beginning of the project life cycle. As a project manager, you will need to plan the project in order to deliver the final product within the allocated time, resources and various other constraints. Poor planning leads to the failure of many projects. Therefore, it is the duty of a project manager to define the project plan in such a way that all the stages of the project development take place in a smooth and efficient manner. For this, the project manager should be able to understand the capabilities of each and every project team member, the time that will be required to execute every step of the project, the cost, etc. Once that is done, a clear and precise plan is developed in order to execute the various processes involved in the project development as well as to monitor the progress at the same time. Often, the course of the project tends to deviate from the estimated plan. At this point in time, a project manager should foresee the shortcomings and make the required modifications. Next up is leadership. According to Jack Welch, the former CEO of General Electrics, Good business leaders create a vision, articulate the vision, passionately own the vision, and relentlessly drive it to completion. This is exactly what describes a project manager. A project manager should lead his project team members not by commanding or simply listing down the tasks that each one should perform, but by actually setting an example in order to drive the team through to the finish line. As a project manager, you will have to make critical decisions that deal with the project development as well as the team that is involved in this process. As a leader, you will be accountable for any error that erupts during the course of the project. Therefore, you will have to be extremely active, take appropriate measures and solve the issues in time so things don't turn out of control. Time Management 
Time management is one of the most important aspects when it comes to project management. Clients measure the success or the failure of a project based on whether the project has been delivered within the stipulated time or not. Therefore, a project manager has to be able to judge and set realistic deadlines for the project and also constantly communicate with the team in order to understand the progress and manage all the unforeseen issues and conflicts. Therefore, the project manager should define all the project activities, put them in right order and create a schedule with the estimated time that will be needed in order to complete each of the defined activities. Budget Planning Another important factor that deals with projects is the project cost or the amount that will be required to create the project. A project budget is an estimate of all the amount that will be required for all the tasks and the activities that will take place at every phase of the project development cycle. This basically includes labor costs, material procurement costs and monitoring costs. It is the job of a project manager to develop the project budget. It is important that the project meets the planned budget along with all the other necessary factors like time, requirements, etc. In case the project meets all the other deadlines and fails to be within the stipulated budget, the project is considered to be a failure. Customer Satisfaction Customer satisfaction is one of the biggest priorities for every organization. The activities that are involved in project management are pioneered by the end users or the customers. They are involved in the project management activities right from the beginning that is requirement analysis until the delivery of the end product. Now this is the reason why project managers always include customer satisfaction during planning. Increased customer satisfaction also guarantees the growth of the organization. Not just will satisfied clients bring in more and more projects to the organization, but the organization will also be able to attract several other clients who are constantly looking out for reliable organizations. Handling project risks. Now it is very much obvious that when projects are under development, they tend to run out of hand when it comes to time, cost, resources, etc. These issues just increase when the size of the project increases. As a good project manager, you should be able to foresee these issues and take appropriate measures beforehand. Monitoring project development phases. At every stage of project development, project managers must be aware of all the developments that take place. Generally, when the project is being planned, the spirits of the entire team are high. The problem arises when the project starts to throw issues and leads to conflicts. At this stage, the project manager needs to handle all the problems, solve the conflicts and motivate and lead the entire team towards the success of the project that includes all factors that is time, cost, quality, etc. Finally, a project manager should create detailed reports. Reports and documentations are a very essential part of a project. A project manager must be able to present comprehensive project reports which depict that the project has been delivered successfully, meeting all the desired requirements and deadlines. Not just that, the project manager should also be able to take insights from previous project reports in order to solve similar problems or issues in the ongoing or the upcoming projects. So those were some of the most important roles and responsibilities performed by a project manager. To conclude, it can be said that the project cannot be completed without the efforts of a project manager. Project managers drive the complete project from scratch till the final delivery of the project to the customers. What are the market trends and job salary for a project manager? Now, as for the project management job growth and talent gap report by PMI, it is predicted that over the next decade, organization of all the sizes and type will require approximately 88 million people working in different project management roles. So with this said, let us see some of the job openings for a project manager in India and the United States. So according to Glassdoor, there are more than 3,300 job openings for a project manager in India, with Bangalore having the highest of 717 job openings. And in the United States, there are more than 55,400 job openings for a project manager. Now, this was the number only from one website. There are many more job opportunities around you. Also, the demand for a skilled project manager is growing and so is the salary. Let us now take a look at the salaries for a project manager. So according to Glassdoor, the average salary for a project manager in India is 15 lakhs per annum. 
and the average salary for a project manager in the United States is $87,560 per annum. Now the salary can vary depending on your experience, the place and the company you're working for. This was just a number for a project manager with good years of experience. As a fresher in India, you can expect a salary to be around 4 to 6 lakhs, but as your experience increases, your salary also will increase. So this was about the market rent and salary of a project manager. Let us move on to our next topic and see what are the skills required to become a project manager. The first skill is communication skill. Now as a project manager, you will have to work closely with the stakeholders, team members and a lot of people from different department. So communication is the key to manage all these people. You will have to communicate with the stakeholders and the higher authority to clearly explain the progress you're making with the project. You will also have to communicate with your team members and your subordinates and explain them what are the goals of the project and assign them their individual tasks. Now all these tasks requires you to have strong communication skill to be able to convey all your messages to the client and your team members. Project manager needs the skill to effectively share the vision, goals, ideas and issues. They also need communication skills to produce presentation and reports to the higher authority. And according to PMI's 2018 Pulse of Professional report found that communication was a primary factor in 29% of the failed projects. So you see how important it is to have good communication skill. So this was the first and the prominent skill required to become a project manager. Now here I'm just going to talk about a few general skills a project manager should have, not technical skills. So the next skill is leadership skill. Now as a project manager, you'll be managing a team. You'll have to assign each of the individual with the individual task, have to get updates from them. You have to also motivate your team members and get the work done. So having a strong leadership skills are very important for a project manager. Now this skill is not something you can learn in a day or a week. It grows as you develop your project management experience. Also, there is no particular way to define what is the best leadership type. Each project manager will have his or own way of managing a team. But a good leader not only coordinates the task, but also motivates and encourages the team members to do their task and defines the roadmap to successfully complete the project. So you can develop a skill by actually watching someone who you think has good leadership skills and learning from their actions and decisions. So this was the second important skill you need to become a project manager. The next skill is team management. Now this skill is closely related to the previous one. As a project manager, you're not only responsible for keeping yourself organized, but also have to assign and manage the task of your team members and subordinates. A project manager must be able to bring the whole team together and make sure all are on the same page, aligning the personal goals with those of the organization. Team management skills include the ability to delegate responsibilities, evaluate performance, handle all the conflicts that are happening in the team, and teach your team members to help them improve the skills. Also, the project manager should ensure that the team members finish the given task within the given deadlines. So you see, team management is also a very important skill for becoming a project manager. Now moving on to our next skill required to become a project manager, which is negotiation skill. Now one of the responsibility of a project manager is to review the budget each day to ensure the project does not exist the resource allocation. This may also include processing and approving invoices for many third party vendors. So it is very important to negotiate with the third party vendors to make sure that you're getting the required product at a good deal. Having good negotiation skill contributes significantly to business success as they help you build better relationship, deliver lasting quality solution rather than poor short term solution that do not satisfy the needs of either party. They also help you avoid future problem and conflicts. So for having good negotiation skill, you should focus on the ultimate goal for the negotiation and focus on solving the problem to benefit both the side of the issues. Again, to have good negotiation skill, you should have good communication skills. So you see, all of this are interrelated. Now moving on to a next skill required to become a project manager, which is personal organization. Now a project manager should have good organization skills. They should have to ensure all the processes go as planned and are in line with the common goals set by the company. Personal organization includes the ability to multitask, then they should prioritize the tasks. This is very important because there could be tasks which will start only after a particular task end. So it is very important to organize and prioritize the task and all these processes should be documented for easy access and further references. Now personal organization skill also includes interpersonal skills, which include self-confidence, relationship management and collaboration skill. Project managers should collaborate well as a part of a team, which would allow the entire team to work together so they can be more productive and complete the project more efficiently. Relationship management skills are also essential as they enable the project manager to develop and nurture relationship with the clients and also with the vendors and team members. Also, the right level of self-confidence can also improve the confidence of a team as a whole, increasing morale and allowing for improved performance. And finally, the next skill required to become a project manager is risk management. Now, risks are inevitable. They will be present in every project. 
So as a project manager, it will be your responsibility to identify the risk beforehand and find solution for it. The project manager should follow the five important steps in risk planning, which is identifying the risk, analyzing the risk, prioritizing the risk, treating the risk, and then monitoring and reviewing the risk. Project managers should also know how to use professional risk management tools that will allow them to analyze potential risks to develop risk mitigation strategies. So managing risk is a very integral part of a project and handling this is one of the core responsibilities of a project manager. Now this skill also improves with experience. So these were some of the important skills required to become a project manager. Now let us move on to our next topic, which is the main topic and see the careers in project management. Now here first we have the project coordinator. The project coordinator is an entry level administrator project management job role. They are very important and work under a project manager to ensure the project are completed on time and within the budget. So they're responsible for overseeing small parts of the larger projects which are primarily responsible for administrative tasks. They have to work with various members of the project team and the clients to use press sheet to track budgets, dates and other information. A project coordinator job description often includes organizing contracts, financial files, reports and invoices and performing all the administrative duties such as ordering office supplies, bookkeeping and billing. So this was about project coordinator. Second, we have project manager. We have discussed about project manager in details in the first topic. The professionals were responsible for leading a project from the very beginning to the very end. A project manager oversees the entire project, including budgets, plans, schedules, and the project demonstration. They also make sure that the project runs properly and is completed on time and within the given budget. After the project manager, we have program manager. Now, program manager is a professional who handles many programs. Now, program can be defined as a group of projects managed in a coordinated way to ensure the value is achieved. A program manager is responsible for coordinating multiple projects and then rejoining them according to the interdependencies among them. They have a high level view of the entire program and they strategically guide the project managers to ensure they're all working effectively towards the program's objectives. The Project Management Institute describes the role of program manager as a super project manager who strategically directs all the program's interconnected projects simultaneously. Their roles and responsibilities are almost the same as that of a project manager, but at a larger scale. Where a project manager takes care of one project, process manager handles various projects together. The next job role is senior project manager. A senior project manager is a more experienced project manager. So they are entrusted with a bigger and more complex project. Now the exact job role and responsibilities of a senior project manager varies companies to company but they have additional responsibility with respect to the junior project manager. Also, high priority projects are given to senior project managers as they are more experienced and skilled. They also guide the new project managers. In some organization, they are responsible for hiring new project managers. Now, these were just a few roles and responsibilities of a senior project manager. Depending on the company, they might have additional responsibilities. So these were some of the careers in project management. Firstly, we will have to really understand what is the PMP exam. Without really understanding what this exam is, we can't really talk about how to prepare for it. PMP firstly stands for Project Management Professional. It is the world's leading project management certification. Now including predictive, agile and hybrid approaches, the PMP proves project leadership experience and expertise in any way of working. It supercharges careers for project leaders across industries and really helps organizations find the people they need to work smarter and perform better. You can take a PMP certification exam at home or in your office when it fits your schedule. So research indicates that employers will need to fill nearly 2.2 million new project oriented roles each year through 2027. This means highly skilled project managers are in very much demand. PMP certification is designed by project professionals for project professionals and validates that you are among the best highly skilled in three main areas. The first one is people, emphasizing the soft skills you need to effectively lead a project team in today's changing environment. The second area is process where you're reinforcing the technical aspects of successfully managing projects. The last one is business environment, where you're highlighting the connection between projects and organizational strategy. PMP certification validates that you have the project leadership skills employers see. The new PMP includes three key approaches. The first one is predictive or waterfall. 
then you have agile and finally hybrid you have to gain a competitive edge prove your work smarter make your goals a reality and earn the pmp today now that we know what is the pmp certification we will understand why choose only the pmp exam firstly the pmp adds great value cio magazine ranked the pmp as the top project management certification in north america because it demonstrates you have the specific skills employers really seek dedication to excellence and the capacity to perform at the highest levels pmp also delivers benefits the median salary for project professionals in north america is 25% higher than those without it and finally the pmp proves you work smarter it shows you have the skills to drive business results and increase your organization's impact in the office and around the world as i've already mentioned the median salary for pmp holders in the us is 25% higher than those without pmp certification according to pmi's most recent project management salary survey there are also more than 1 million pmp certification holders worldwide they have earned universally recognized knowledge so these are two of the major reasons as to why you need to write the pmp exam today firstly you get a higher salary which is advantageous for you and secondly it is a universally that is a globally recognized certification program so it's not just confined to one place this is exactly why the pmp exam is so important now the next question that would pop up is how to get your pmp now earning your pmp certification is a commitment and that is why it is so valuable first question is do you have real world project management experience that leads to success if yes great you finished the hardest part you have to make sure you meet some of the following sets of pmp certification requirements the first one is you will need a four year degree so once that has been satisfied then you will have to check you have been leading projects for at least 36 months if you have surpassed that too then the last requirement is you will need 35 hours of project management education or training either that or you will have had to clear the capm certification so either one of these is required so if you do not have a four year degree that's okay you can also have a high school diploma or an associate's degree but along with that you will need to have 60 months of leading project so that is one disadvantage if you have a high school diploma or an associate's degree you must have experience of 60 months leading projects so once that is done so there are some steps that you will need to follow to get on your way to your pmp certification the first step is to apply to take your exam you validate your project management experience and education in this step and apply to your exam the step 2 is to take your pmp exam so here you will have to understand what to expect on the big day and how to prepare to pass all of the preparation part happens in step 2 and the third step is to maintain your certification it is really really important to engage in continuous professional development in order to remain certified so these are the three major steps they seem quite simple but it isn't it takes months of preparation it takes months of dedication especially if you're working full time so all of that you need to balance you need to learn how to balance and moving on to the exam fee that is the cost of the exam if you're a member of the project management institute that is the pmi it is relatively much lesser that is it is rupees 23459 rupees but if you're a non member it is almost double the price that is 42863 rupees now that we've discussed the requirements for the pmp exam and also the steps as to how you could get started with it let's move ahead to the main part of this session and discuss the exam content outline so as i've already mentioned previously the exam identifies the proportion of questions from three different domains the first one is the people domain the second one is process the third one is business environment the people domain consists of 42% of items on the test and they are divided into different tasks so domain 1 has 14 tasks and we will be discussing each of these tasks in detail the first one is manage conflict 
Here you will have to interpret the source and stage of the conflict, analyze the context for the conflict and even evaluate or recommend or reconcile the appropriate conflict resolution solution. The second task is to lead a team. You need to set a clear vision and mission, support diversity and inclusion, value servant leadership, determine an appropriate leadership style. Basically, you will have to inspire, motivate and influence team members or stakeholders. This way you can analyze team members and stakeholders influence also keeping in mind to distinguish various options to lead various team members and stakeholders. In task 3 you have to support team performance. That is you'll have to appraise team member performance against key performance indicators. You will have to basically support and recognize team member growth and development, determine appropriate feedback approach and verify performance improvements. In task four, you will have to empower team members and stakeholders that is organize around team strengths, support team task accountability, evaluate demonstration of task accountability, basically determine and best out levels of decision making authority. In task five, you will have to ensure team members or stakeholders are adequately trained. That is, you'll have to determine required competencies and elements of training. You will also have to determine training options based on training needs allocate resources for training and finally measure training outcomes. In task six, you will have to build a team that is appraise stakeholder skills, deduce project resource requirements, continuously assist and refresh team skills to meet project needs and also maintain team and knowledge transfer. Moving on to task seven, you will have to address and remove impediments, obstacles and blockers for the team. You will have to prioritize critical impediments, obstacles and blockers for the team. That is, you will have to use network to implement solutions to really remove these blockages that you have in your team. You will also have to reassess continually to ensure impediments, obstacles and blockers for the team are being addressed regularly. In task eight, you have to negotiate project agreements. That is, analyze the bounds of the negotiations for agreement. You will also have to assess priorities and determine ultimate objectives, verify that the objectives of the project requirements are met, participate in agreement negotiations, also determine a negotiation strategy. In task nine, you have to collaborate with stakeholders, that is evaluate engagement needs for stakeholders, optimize alignment between stakeholder needs, expectations and project objectives. That is, you have to build and influence stakeholders to really accomplish project objectives. In task 10, you'll have to build shared understanding. That is, you'll have to break down situation to identify the root cause of a misunderstanding if it ever occurs. You'll have to survey all necessary parties to reach consensus, support outcome of parties agreement and investigate potential misunderstanding. In task 11, you'll have to engage and support virtual teams. That is, you'll have to examine virtual team members' needs, investigate alternatives for virtual team member engagement, implement options for virtual team member engagement, and continually evaluate the effectiveness of team member engagement. In task 11, you have to define team ground rules. That is, you'll have to communicate organizational principles with team and the external stakeholders. Basically, you'll have to create an environment that fosters adherence to the ground rules, and manages and rectifies ground rule violations. In task 13, you will have to mentor relevant stakeholders, that is allocate the time to mentoring and also recognize and act on mentoring opportunities. Finally, in task 14, you'll have to promote team performance through the application of emotional intelligence. That is, you'll have to assess behavior through the use of personality indicators and analyze personality indicators and adjust to the emotional needs of key project stakeholders. Now that we have discussed the first domain, we'll move on to the second one that is process that takes up 50% of items on the test. And here we have about 17 tasks and we'll be discussing each of these tasks in detail. So the first task here is to execute project with the urgency required to deliver business value. Here you will have to assess opportunities to deliver value incrementally, examine the business value throughout the project and support the team to subdivide project tasks as necessary to find the minimum viable product. In task two, you will have to manage communications. You will have to analyze communication needs of all the stakeholders, determine communication methods, channels, frequency and level of detail for all stakeholders. 
communicate project information and updates effectively here and also confirm communication is understood and feedback is received. In task three, you will have to assess and manage risks. This is basically determining risk management options and iteratively assess and prioritize risks. In task four, you engage with stakeholders, that is analyze them, categorize them and engage stakeholders by each of their categories. You will also have to develop, execute and validate a strategy for stakeholder engagement. In task five, you'll have to plan and manage budget and resources. This is really important. That is, you'll have to estimate budgetary needs based on the scope of the project and lessons learned from past projects. You'll have to anticipate future budget challenges, monitor budget variations and work with governance to adjust as necessary. That is, you'll have to plan and manage your resources accordingly. In task six, on the other hand, you will have to plan and manage schedule. Here, you'll have to estimate project tasks, utilize benchmarks and historical data, prepare schedule based on methodology, measure ongoing progress based on methodology, and modify schedule as needed based on it. Task seven, on the other hand, helps you plan and manage quality of products and deliverables. You can determine quality standard required for project deliverables, recommend options for improvement based on quality gaps, continually survey project deliverable quality. In task eight, you plan and manage scope, that is determine and prioritize requirements, break down scope, and finally monitor and validate scope. In task nine, you integrate project planning activities. Here you consolidate the project or phase plans, assess consolidated project plans for dependencies, gaps, and continued business value, analyze the data that has been collected, collect and analyze data to make informed project decisions and determine critical information requirements. In task 10, you manage project changes. You anticipate and embrace the need for change, basically determine the strategy to handle that change, execute change management strategy according to the methodology, and finally determine a change response to move the project forward. In task 11, you plan and manage procurement. You define resource requirements and needs, communicate resource requirements, manage suppliers or contracts, plan and manage procurement strategy, and finally develop a delivery solution. Task 12 allows you to manage project artifacts. Here you will have to determine the requirements for managing the project artifacts, validate that the project information is kept up to date and accessible to all the stakeholders, and continually assess the effectiveness of the management of the project artifacts. In task 13, you will have to determine the appropriate project methodology and methods and practices. Here you will have to assess project needs, complexity and magnitude, recommend project execution strategy, recommend also project methodology or approach, basically use iterative incremental practices through the project life cycle. In task 14, you will have to establish project governance structure that is determine appropriate governance for a project and define escalation paths and thresholds. In task 15, you manage project issues, that is you recognize when a risk becomes an issue, attack the issue with the optimal action to achieve project success, and collaborate with relevant stakeholders on the approach to resolve the issues. Task 16 ensures knowledge transfer for project continuity. You discuss project responsibilities within the team, outline expectations for working environment, and confirm approach for knowledge transfers. Finally, in task 17, you plan and manage project or phase closure or transitions. Here you determine criteria to successfully close the project or phase, validate readiness for transitions, and conclude activities to close our project or phase. Moving on to the last domain, we have business environment that takes up 8% of the items that come in your exam. Here you have just four tasks. The first one is to plan and manage project compilance. Here you will require to confirm project compliance requirements, classify compliance categories, determine potential threats to compliance, and use methods to support compliance. That is, analyze the consequences of non-compliance, determine the necessary approach and action to really address compliance needs, measure the extent to which the project is in compliance. In task two, you evaluate and deliver project benefits and value. Here you investigate that benefits are identified, document agreement on ownership for ongoing benefit realization, verify measurement system is in place to track benefits, and evaluate delivery options to demonstrate value, appraise stakeholders of value gain process. 
In task three, you evaluate and address external business environment changes for impact on scope. That is, you survey changes to external business environment, access and prioritize impact on project scope or backlog based on changes in external business environment. Here also, you recommend options for scope or backlog changes. Continually review external business environment for impacts on project scope or backlog. Finally, in task four, you support organizational change. That is, you assess organizational culture, evaluate impact of organizational change to project, and determine required actions. You also evaluate impact of the project to the organization and determine required actions. Now that we have discussed the PMP content outline, we will understand ways to really prepare for this exam. The first thing you'll have to do is move forward with confidence. So there are five ways project management professionals commonly tackle the exam prep process. The first step is to envision the finish line. Create a clear mission statement spelling out why earning the PMP is important to you and review it to stay motivated throughout the prep process. You will have to plan to regularly study in the weeks or months ahead of the big day. You will have to also create a study schedule that integrates work and family obligations. Share your goal with others so they can help you stay on track. Seek support from your boss. See if your organization will allow you to study during work hours. The second step is to tour the terrain. Learn more about the exam's 180 question format. Questions will be a combination of MCQs, multiple responses, matching, hotspot, and limited fill in the blank. You can also closely review the PMP exam content outlined below, available in 16 translations, which details knowledge areas covered in the PMP exam content outline that we just discussed. You will have to create a course of action. This is by finding the most useful exam prep resources. Check out the local PMI chapters that can help you find a study group or members willing to guide you. Also, an authorized training providers to help you prepare for the exam. And also, many practice exams can be found online or as part of formal training courses. Fourth step would to hit the books. A guide to the project management body of knowledge, that is the PMBOK guide, is a go-to reference book. But the exam isn't only based solely on this. Many PMI members lean on PMP exam book preps. You can head on to the projectmanagement.com for more recommendations. Finally, the fifth way is to join the club. Project professionals are eager to provide advice and encouragement. You can check out projectmanagement.com where there are plenty of blog posts and community discussions which are devoted to exam prep challenges and advice. PMI's LinkedIn Project Professional Group is also a great place to post a question about the exam prep process when you've hit a wall. You can also check out the local PMI chapters. These can be another resource when you need a hand. With this, we move on to the next part of this session where we'll be talking about PMP exam day essentials. Now that you have made the investment to earn the Project Management Professional Certification, it is time to make the commitment to prepare for and pass the exam. Carving out time and securing the proper materials to study requires discipline and focus. As a project professional, you have got what it takes. Firstly, you have to pad your schedule. Visit the test center in advance so you know precisely how to get there. Find the room immediately on test day. Arrive 30 minutes early so you have time to relax before you start your exam. The second advice would be to know your limits. 2.30 minutes, time allocated for exam completions. There'll be two 10 minutes breaks for computer-based tests. No scheduled breaks for paper-based exam. And third one is to make sure you have your ID, which is valid and government issues. It should include your photo and your signature. And you don't really have to carry your calculator because you have it built into computer-based tests. Scratch paper and pencils or erasable boards and markers are provided by test administrators. So again, you don't have to really carry them. And you will find out if you pass before you leave. That is, the results is completely computer-based testing, so it will be out immediately after your exam. Now that we've discussed some of the exam day essentials, let's check out the tips to prepare for PMP. So the first and the most recommended tip would be for you to opt for a certification training. Edureka's PMP online course gives you extensive knowledge of project management concepts highlighted specifically in the PMBOK 6th edition guide and is aligned with the latest PMP exam content outline. If you're someone who's interested in taking up the PMP exam, this certification training is perfect for you. So what are you waiting for? 
go ahead and register today. Today, we are going to talk about two important certifications. And I'm sure you might have a lot of questions around PMP and PRINCE2 certifications. Let's get started from the very, very basic. And that's nothing but understanding the acronym of PMP and PRINCE2. Many of you might know PMP stands for Project Management Professional. However, PRINCE2 is Projects in Controlled Environment. These are the acronyms. And by acronym itself, we can understand a bit about these certifications. Who are the certifying bodies of PMP and PRINCE2? PMP is offered by PMI. Go to PMI.org for more information on PMP. PMP was introduced in 1984 and the first batch was conducted in Philadelphia, USA. There were 43 people who certified PMP in 1984. PMI as an institute was established in 1969. So definitely it has a lot of history attached to it. And it's a global certifying body. It's a global institute. It's a non-profit based institute. Lacks of people have been certified by PMI. And it's not only in project management, but also in program management, in agile project management, etc. Currently, PMI has a headquarters in US, Pennsylvania. Have you ever Prince2? The certifying body for Prince2 is Axelos. Axelos is a UK based joint venture which manages certifications. Now, Prince2 was introduced in 1989. Largely, it was introduced for the UK government projects. And it was run by the Office of Government of Commerce. We call it as OGC in 1989. So that's how it started. From there, let's now move on to the methodology in itself. So PMP and the PRINCE2 methodologies, if we have to talk about, whenever you appear for the PMP certification examination, you will have to refer to PMBOK guide, which is Project Management's Book of Knowledge. Currently, sixth edition of the PMBOK knowledge or PMBOK guide is already launched. And the certification is based on the PMBOK 6th edition. PMBOK contains the information about project management that is required not only to pass the PMP certification, but also it can be a reference to many project managers when they manage various projects. PMBOK guide contains 10 knowledge areas, 49 processes, and there are five process groups. And how they are interlinked with each other and how to apply these knowledge areas, processes, and the process groups. These are already covered as a part of the PMP preparation training as well. On the other hand, PRINCE2 has seven different principles. There are various principles which are covered as a part of PRINCE2. And some of those principles could be like continued business justification because PRINCE2 focuses a lot on preparing a business case, providing the context behind why the project is initiated. The another principle could be learn from experience so that we could actually relate to the retrospectives that we do in order to gather lessons learned. Define rules and responsibilities or manage by stage. These are some of the principles of PRINCE2. Now PRINCE2 also act as a directive. So there are various directives that we talk about. Process-based approach, a lot of focus is there on various processes. And there are various processes which are covered as a part of the PRINCE2. Some of the processes could be starting of a project, directing a project, initiating a project. So depending on at what stage of the project you are, you will have to refer to these processes. For example, if you are working at directing a project, directing a project is a process in itself that will guide you on how to go about overall directing the project end to end. Then we have a controlling stage where we refer to controlling a stage process. Likewise, there are seven different processes, including the process for closing a project. So largely, you would realize PRINCE2 covers about what part of the project management and PMP will cover largely on how part of the project management. So PRINCE2 is definitely very, very process focused and PMP has got knowledge areas, processes, tools and techniques. So those are the aspects which are covered as a part of the PMP certification. Moving from there, Let's quickly talk about the project management structure, how this PMP is structured and PRINCE2 is structured. In fact, we touched a bit on it. So PMP focuses a lot on the knowledge areas. I gave you some of the examples of the knowledge areas it covers. For example, stakeholder management, communications management, risk and issue management. These are the knowledge areas which are covered as a part of the PMP. 
And each of these knowledge areas encompasses various processes. There are total 49 of them. And they cut across various process groups like initiating, monitoring and controlling, executing, closing. These are the process groups that we talk about, which actually are there as a part of each and every phase of the project. Apart from that, PMP also focuses a lot on tools and techniques, tools and techniques that are required for the estimation, Delphi technique or PERT formula or PERT technique, bottoms up estimation, historical estimation, or the techniques that are required for identification of risk and issues. So there are total 119 tools and techniques that are described as a part of the PMP. And when we deliver the PMP training program, we cover each of these with lots of examples as well. Prince2 focuses on the principles. As we just covered, there are total seven principles it touched upon. And then there are themes as well. Prince2 has defined certain themes like business case or organization or quality. So for example, in business case, it talks about how to create and maintain record of the business justifications for the project. It's definitely very, very important artifact. We can refer to that artifact to understand the context behind the project that we are working on. Or quality theme, which actually talks about what the quality requirements and measures and how the project will deliver them. So your commitment about the quality can be documented under this theme. The another example could be plans or risk or change. So these are some of the themes that it covers about. And we took some of the examples of various processes that it covers. Total, there are 41 different activities that are performed under PRINCE2. And there are a few techniques which are also referred and some of them are defined by the PRINCE2. So go to axilos.com for more information on PRINCE2. All right, so I'm taking a pause here because there is one quick question on the project management approach. So this question is from Divya and she's asking about which is more agile pro. So let me give you a brief about that. Now both these certifications, they have got a legacy. So that means both of these certifications talks about processes. And if you see agile, it focuses more on delivering the business value. So none of these are really focusing on agile, but the Pimbox 6 edition certainly nowadays talks about the agile way of working as well. So while working on Agile, how would Pimbok 6th edition can help you in connecting to the Agile projects? So that has explicitly defined. But the best part is that now Prince2 and PMI, both these certifying bodies have launched their Agile certification separately. So if you are keen in doing Agile certifications, I would recommend you PMI ACP, which is launched by PMI, and Axelos launched Prince2 Agile certification in order to get into the Agile way of working. So agile approach as such is completely different. So I wouldn't say PMP or Prince2 really is agile because it's definitely process driven. It's driven by a lot of documentation, but there are agile references into both these certifications and that's the best part of it. So even though you are working by applying the PMP or Prince2 methods and practices and the guidance, still it will give you a lot of benefit in terms of managing the project effectively end to end. Now, from the PM approach point of view, if you really talk about in PMP, what do we do really? It's a sequential approach. When we talk about PMP training, in that one of the things that we cover are various project management phases. So we go phase wise, right? From initiating a project to planning about it, executing, closing. So all these are various phases which are performed or which are conducted in a sequential manner. And some of the important things like scope of the project or time of the project, cost of the project, they need to be derived in the beginning itself. So before you commence the project, we basically try to gather all the scope items. Then we derive the schedule out of it. And then we also come up with the cost. And then we derive budget that is required for the project. So if you really see, all these things are planned upfront on the project. Now PMP focuses on customer requirements. Whenever we work by applying the PMP ways of working or PMP knowledge areas and processes, we basically spend time in the beginning of the project for gathering requirements by using various tools and techniques that are described under PMP to gather requirements. And we document those requirements. We take sign off on those requirements from the customer. So a lot of focus on the customer requirements as such. If you take a look at the Prince2 way of working, it focuses more on iterative approach. And therefore you'll find in Prince2, there are things like taking some of the early feedback 
or learning from experiences. PMP also has the feedback sessions and PINS2 also has feedback sessions. One of the difference here you would see that the iterative approach versus the sequential approach. However, in both the cases, the scope, time and cost is definitely derived upfront in the beginning itself of the project. PINS2 focuses more on the business side. As we mentioned, some of the themes, they actually focus more on the business side to understand the business case, context behind why the project is initiated, etc. So from the requirements point of view, it's more of a business use cases than the typical customer requirements that we talk about. So Prince2 focuses on the use cases. So this is more from the project management approach. When we go back and start applying some of these techniques, processes, and ways of working under project management within PMP and Prince2, you'll find some of these differences very, very evident. Now let's talk about the project management frameworks. If you see largely, in PMP, I told you there are certain process groups like initiating, planning, monitoring and executing, monitoring and controlling. All right. So these are the various process groups that are there. And these process groups actually fall under each of the phases. You could define your own phases based on the project that you're working on, based on the domain you are working on. If it is research and development project, your phases could be different. If it is software development project, your phases could be different. You can follow typical SDLC lifecycle. So right from the initiating of the project to requirements gathering to doing analysis, getting into planning part, then we work on the design aspects, etc., and taking it through to the closure. So that's how we basically get into various phases. Now, each of these process groups are applied or are used within these phases. So there is a question here, and this question is from Swati, and she's asking about how do we do it? Let me give you a quick idea. So for example, when we initiate a project, we have to do a lot of initiating activities, right? From the business case to understand the context to coming up with the project charter, etc. So definitely we can apply some of these process groups over there. Like for example, we initiate the phase or we'll take example of requirements. So if you're working on a requirement as a phase, we initiate working on requirement as a phase. Then we create the plan, how to gather requirements, what kind of a techniques we should be using, etc. And then we execute that plan. And once we start executing the plan, it's important to also monitor and control the plan so that whatever we are doing, it should be as per the plan that we are created. And then once we gather requirements and take sign off, then we close the requirement phase. So that means within a phase, I'm able to actually apply these five process groups. In case of prints two, largely you'll find various stages like starting, initiating, directing, controlling. These are the various stages that are defined in prints two. So I hope I answered that question. Okay, thanks for that confirmation. Moving to the next part, which is in terms of the kind of industry where these certifications are recognized. So PMP is recognized across all major industries like IT, healthcare, aerospace, defense, government, etc. And even you'll find that which covers largely almost all the industries. So it's not only just IT which covers the PMP, but even if you are from construction or you are from other industries, still PMP is very, very useful certification. Not only that, if you take a look at some of the countries which recognize the PMP certifications, India, US, Canada, Middle East, Southeast countries, Asia, Australia, etc. So it's a global certification. And I have seen many times in the job description of the project manager, the companies have now started putting explicitly about looking for somebody who is PMP certified or looking for somebody who is Prince 2 certified. And sometimes I have seen people doing both. So PMP people do it you know, after gaining some experience. So initially some people opt for even CAPM, which is Certified Associate in Project Management. That doesn't require you to have a PM experience. Once you gain PM experience, you can get into the PMP certification. Even you can go for Prince 2 because it doesn't require any sort of a specific project management experience. On the top of that, under Prince 2, we have two different levels. So we have foundation, we have practitioner. So one can start with the foundation level and gradually move on to the practitioner level. Because Prince 2 is another certification which is also a global certification and recognized in the industries like construction, engineering, IT, business, financial services. So though it started with IT projects, but now it is very well recognized and appreciated across different industries. 
and there are various countries where it's also very well recognized india uk obviously uk and european countries is definitely a high consideration for the pins too because that's from where it emerged but now it's a global certification certainly let's quickly understand the various levels of the pins 2 and pmp certification pmp is very straightforward it's one certification but as i said if you are into project management to begin with for the beginners pmi has also defined a different level of certification which is capm certified associate in project management so that could be one level i would say and then once you gain some experience after doing capm you can go for pmp people who have experience in project management can directly go for pmp as well however in prince 2 as i mentioned we have foundation for the people who would like to just know the various project management terminologies then take bit of a guidance on project management at a foundation level can go for prince 2 foundation and once they gain bit of an experience by applying the foundation level knowledge that they gained they can gradually move on to the prince 2 practitioner as well however some people can even directly go for prince 2 practitioner certification by fulfilling the prerequisites that are mentioned okay let's quickly take a look at the eligibility and fee structure as well for both the certification for pmp as i mentioned you need to have an experience of minimum 4500 hours of experience in project management if you're a graduate if you're not then 7500 hours of experience in project management is required there is a need to have formal training for pmp because it's important to have 35 pdus professional development units and you will gain or you will achieve those units by undergoing a formal training program which will not only give you 35 pdus but also will help you prepare for the certification examination because it's a comprehensive training it covers all the 10 knowledge areas five process groups and 49 processes and lots of practice so all that put together should help you prepare for the examination the fees for pmp is around 550 usd but i always recommend you to go and visit the pmi ac pmi.org and take a look at the latest eligibility criteria and the fees from there always the certification needs to be renewed every 3 years and for renewal of the pmp certification you need 60 pdus now again for those 60 pdus you can also undertake various project management training courses some of those courses are also offered by edureka so those courses will also help you gain the additional pdus that are required to renew certification within that 3 years on the other hand prince 2 doesn't require any specific work experience into project management however it needs formal training in fact your exam cost and the training fees both are included in one fees itself prince 2 practitioner certification needs to be renewed every 5 years and you need to appear for short exam to renew the certification so that's on the certification side moving to the format of the examination pmp there are 200 multiple choice questions it's 4 hour exam definitely it's 4 hour extensive examination out of 200 questions there are 25 questions which are dummy questions which are just there in order to check the response from the people who are appearing for the examination those will not give you any points as such but those questions you need to appear for so actual points you will get out of 175 minimum passing is not explicitly mentioned by pmi however it depends on the kind of questions that you go on answering the difficulty level of question changes as you go on facing the questions most importantly pmp is conducted at prometric center under proper invigilation so there are cameras there are invigilators who invigilate the examination in a proper prometric setup for 4 hours you have to be there appearing for 200 multiple choice questions to clear pmp examination prince 2 foundation 60 questions 1 hour passing is 55% practitioner if when you appear 68 questions 2 and 1/2 hours passing is 55% so everything is explicitly given sometimes i have seen people even appearing for the exam after the training program is done so immediately when you appear for the exam after the training since you have just gone through the training you have everything fresh in your mind so you can easily provide answers to the questions however it depends sometimes people might need some extra time to prepare so that's up to the person but i have seen sometimes people doing that as well overall when we talk about the preparation time for both these certifications typically for pmp examination you would need to spend good 8 to 10 weeks time i would say approximately 2 months 
to two and a half months are definitely required starting from the time when when you begin your preparation by taking a training program from that day till the time you appear for the examination always good to start at least two and a half months before where you decide to take the examination average study time is close to anywhere between 150 hours prince 2 needs around one to two weeks because as i mentioned the exam is part of your training so you appear for the training and then you give examination so preparation time that way is less in comparison to pmp so the average study time could be just 10 to 15 hours because most of the things are covered as a part of the training itself now there was also a survey that was conducted to find out on an average how much salary people get after pmp and the prince 2 kind of certifications so with pmp on an average the salary is 115000 usd and in general it's observed and in general that's a feedback that pmp certified professional they get 20% more salary than the non pmp professionals prince 2 also on an average the salary is 86000 usd so certainly these two certifications will help you not only gain knowledge not only increase your expertise into project management and help you effectively manage the project but also will help you in earning more salary and therefore i have seen a lot of companies these days explicitly mention in the job description about the project manager with pmp certification or prince 2 certification because these certifications will also help you in gaining knowledge and pmp certification explicitly ask you to have experience in project management so in a way your experience in project management also gets validated so those people who wants to get into a certification without having any experience pins to you can get started with or from pmi there is capm and those people who have enough experience in project management and meet the pmp criteria can certainly go for pmp as well as prince 2 depending upon what kind of a project that you are managing so sometimes i have seen that there are projects which explicitly they are run on prince 2 methodology so they expect you to have prince 2 certifications and knowledge However, there are a lot of projects which are running on PMP process areas and the process groups and the PMP guidance and the processes, etc. So obviously, they will expect you to have the PMP certifications. And many times I have seen people doing both because when you are into project management, you not only need to know about PMP, but also Prince 2 ways of working as well. Because you might today work on a project which is running on Prince 2, tomorrow you might go for PMP project so obviously it's important to have both the certifications as well however it's up to you depending upon your career aspirations and depending upon in which area you're working in you can certainly aspire for the certifications like pmp and prince 2 which are global certifications brief history of pmb okay it all began way back in the summer of 1969 when the Project Management Institute was founded by a group of people. In 1975, PMI describes its objectives, and since then it stood true to it. It has also been instrumental in bringing order and guidance to the project management practices. In the 1980s, though efforts had begun to standardize project management practices, procedures, and approaches, and put them together as a reference for project managers to consider. That is the genesis of a guide to project management body of knowledge, in short, PMBOK guide, which has so far undergone six editions. The seventh edition of the guide builds on the standard and is structured not around knowledge areas and IWTOs, but around project performance domains, a group of related activities that are critical for the effective delivery of project outcomes. The PMI's Project Management Body of Knowledge or PMBOK guide has basically two parts. The first one is the standard for project management. PMI has affirmed that it will continue its affiliation with the two standard bodies, ISO and ANSI. As with previous PMBOK guides, PMBOK 7 will continue PMI's standard for project management. This will eventually carry the American National Standards Institute designation. The second important part is a guide to the project management body of knowledge, a collation of what PMI considers to be the core body of knowledge it expects all professional project managers to know. Until now, it has been the basics for its principal examination and qualifications, project management professional and certified associate in project management. 
In the future, it will be more of a framework for applying the standard with a wide range of knowledge that PMI will store in its new online repository, PMI Standards Plus. So this is basically the purpose of the PMBOK. Now that we know why the PMBOK has been really created and what are its parts, let's move ahead and really understand its history. So the first version of PMBOK was released in 1996. Although the efforts to put together processes and guidelines to treat project management as a profession began in 1981, and a rough draft of the project, a management body of knowledge, was published in 1987, it had eight sections with five to six pages in each. The updated version came to be known as PMBOK Edition 1 in the year 1996. This edition was basically an extended version of a white paper titled Ethics, Standards and Accreditation Committee Final Report, which was later on published in the year 1983. Then there was the second PMBOK edition that released in 2000. While this edition corrected errors in first edition, it also included newer practices being involved in the world of project management. Remember, while some level of agile project management efforts were going on during this time, it wouldn't be until 6th edition that some amount of Agile guidelines would make their way into PMBOK. This edition had 9 knowledge areas, 39 processes, and 211 pages. Then, moving ahead, the PMBOK edition 3 released in the year 2004. By now, you must have noticed a certain pattern that a new version has been released every 4 years once. Sounds sensible, right? Especially with project management as a professional slowly gathering recognition and being looked at as a skill to be developed. PMI 2 began to standardize the process of basing information in PMBOK as generally recognized as good practice used on most of the projects most of the time. By now, you must have probably noticed the pattern. A new version of the PMBOK is released every four years once, which sounds pretty sensible, especially with project management as a profession, slowly gathering recognition and being looked at as a skill to be developed. PMI 2 began to standardize the process of basing information in PMBOK as generally recognized as good practice used on most of the projects most of the time. Here the words generally recognized means that the knowledge and practices described are applicable to most projects most of the time and there is consensus about their value and usefulness. The words good practice means that there is general agreement that the application of the knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques can enhance the chances of success for many projects. As you can imagine, PMBOK began to be accepted and used by many professionals to guide their thinking and action on their projects. Here, the process count jumped to 44. Moving on to the next edition, we had the PMBOK Edition 4, which was released in the year 2008. One could say this edition gave birth to the current edition, that is 6th edition which has the structure of PMBOK. The six constraints, scope, schedule, budget, quality, resources, and risks were introduced in this edition. Process names were formalized into the current verb noun format, that is validate scope, control quality, you get the idea. A couple of the processes were deleted, a few were added, and a few more were merged into a fewer. Process count here reduced from 44 to 42, ITTO count reduced from 599 to 517. In 2011, an interesting shift happened where 30% of the questions were changed to confirm the latest 2011 role delineation study. Then came PMBOK edition 5 in 2013. Not four years later, but this time five. Every rule has an exception and for PMBOK, it was the year 2009. This guide saw some of the jar-shaking changes some of the processes were moved under proper knowledge areas. Communications management KA was split into communications management and a new KA stakeholder management. Overall process can't move to 47. And here we had 10 knowledge areas with ITTOs jumped to 619. The guide put on some weight to 589 pages. Again, this was an exercise of not just adding more relevant information into the mix, but also making sure that the processes and their placements made sense. Still, if you were studying for the exam during the time, you would be very much happier when edition 6 arrived. Then PMBOK edition 6 was released in the year 2017. 
This was the first time ever that the agile word as well as agile practices based content is introduced in a PMBOK. Moreover, PMBOK 6 edition 7 is here, not waiting for four years this time. So PMI's research found that in past 10 years, technology and software are driving innovation and they are also creating new business models and new ways of working. There is a stronger focus on outcomes now than deliverables. Now, let us talk about PMBOK and its seventh edition. PMBOK, as we all know, is a short version of Project Management Book of Knowledge Guide, which lays the foundation of project management. It contains the complete collection of processes, best practices, terminologies, and guidelines that are globally accepted as golden standards within the project management industry. That is why PMBOK Guide is often regarded as the Bible of project management. The seventh edition of the guide builds on the standard and is structured not around knowledge areas and ITTOs, but around project performance domains, a group of related activities that are critical for the effective delivery of project outcomes. Now that we've understood the PMBOK's history and how the seventh edition has come into the picture, let's move ahead and talk about why does PMBOK really change? The impetus for updating the PMBOK guide has been building for several years rapid enhancements in technology and the need for organizations and practitioners to more quickly adapt to changes in the market has caused it to evolve. Practitioners are now tasked with identifying the right delivery approach to get the job done and deliver value. To make sure the PMBOK Guide 7th edition remains relevant, it must reflect this flexibility and assist the practitioner in managing the project at hand to deliver outputs that enable envisioned outcomes. If PMI wants to remain relevant and continue to meet the needs of customers and the professional community, they have to update its approach to both the standard and the guide portion. It is a great responsibility to ensure the PMBOK guide is relevant and meets the needs of all customers in a swiftly changing landscape. So the new edition is very different from previous editions in several significant ways. Now let's move ahead and discuss some of the aspects influencing PMBOK 7. Primarily, as you might have guessed, in the view of the new syllabus introduced in 2019, the agile and hybrid project management approach make their way to mainstream content of the guide along with the existing predictive delivery approach. But this is not the fundamental change that is really influencing PMBOK. PMBOK 7th firstly moves away from a process-oriented approach to a principles-oriented approach, thus supporting any type of project delivery. You guessed it right, the word principles has a stamp of agile paradigm. You could say that the thinking from which PMBOK comes now has been shifted. It has become much, much broader. Another marked change is a shift in scope to address project delivery in addition to project management. The idea seems to be more action-focused or practitioner-friendly. Also, the focus is on project outcomes than just the project deliverables. One could say that PMBOK scope is not widened to just include the project management approaches, but it really also focuses on the project outcomes. Now, there are two fundamental aspects that really influence the changes in PMBOK 7. The first one is the value delivery system and the second one is the project delivery principles. So the value delivery system is the holistic system through which projects deliver business value. Business value is the tangible and intangible benefits received by customers, employees and partners of the business. And projects are the main vehicle that delivers business value by achieving business objectives of the organization. The seventh edition of standard for project management on which PMBOK is based on shows how good strategy leads to intended business value in the organization. And this is done through defining organizational strategies that really help identify business objectives, which then eventually turn into actionable initiatives. The system that enables this flow in a smooth and predictive manner would be the value delivery system to be built in the organization. And this is made possible by the efficient propagation of information and feedback through the predefined challenges. The value delivery system comprises portfolios, projects, programs, operations, and uses a governance system to really manage issues and eventually support decision-making capabilities. 
The next aspect that is influencing PMBOK 7th edition is project delivery principles. These are basically the what's and why's of project management that guide the thinking and behavior of people involved in project delivery so they can really apply their efforts towards a strong project outcome. There are 12 principles defined in the standard for project management. The first one is be a diligent, respectful and caring steward. The second one is build a culture of accountability and respect. The third one is to engage stakeholders to understand their interests and needs. Fourth one is to focus on value. The fifth one is to recognize and respond to systems interactions. The sixth one is to motivate, influence, coach and learn. The seventh one is tailor the delivery approach based on context. The eighth one is to build quality into processes and results. The ninth one is to address complexity using knowledge, experience and learning. The tenth one is to address opportunities and threats. The eleventh one is to be adaptable and resilient. The twelfth and the last one is to enable change to achieve the envisioned future state. So now let's move ahead to the most important part of the session: PMBOK six versus PMBOK seven. In terms of general approach, PMBOK guide six is very prescriptive, not descriptive. It really emphasizes on how, not what or why. But as we have already discussed in the seventh edition. It focuses on principles to guide mindset, actions, and behaviors that are reflected in bodies of knowledge for project delivery, agile, lean, customer-centered design, and much more. The next difference is based on the basis of design. So, in the sixth guide, there are specific processes that convert inputs to outputs using certain tools and techniques. So, it is basically more process-focused. Whereas the seventh one has domains of interacting interdependent areas of activity with performance outcomes as well as an overview of commonly used tools, techniques, artifacts, and much more, basically focuses on project outcomes in addition to deliverables. The next difference is based on the project environment. The project environment is internal and external on both of these books, so that's one similarity between PMBOK six versus seven. The next difference is based on the project application. So, in the sixth guide, most projects can be implemented most of the time. But in PMBOK Guide Seven, the principles can be implemented in any of the projects. That's the beauty of it. Moving on to the next difference is based on its target audience. So, as you can see in PMBOK Six, it's primarily for project managers. Whereas in seven, it is for anyone who is involved in the project with a specific focus on team members and team roles, including project lead, sponsor, and product owner. In terms of change in degree, there is an incremental revision based on previous editions in the PMBOK Guide Six edition, but in the seventh edition, it is a principle based to reflect the full value delivery landscape. Finally, in terms of tailoring guidance. In the sixth edition, it references to tailoring, but no specific guidance about this tailoring. Whereas in the seventh edition, you have specific tailoring guidance that has been provided within the book. Now that we have discussed the major differences between sixth edition and seventh edition, let's move ahead and talk. When is this book really releasing? So PMI informed that PMBOK seven will be available from first August twenty twenty one. And you will be able to get a copy from PMI, Amazon, and all the good booksellers that are available online in your country. The full price of the PMBOK Seventh Edition will be ninety-nine US dollars. So, firstly, we will have to understand what is the PMBOK Guide, right? So the Project Management Institute offers a professional certification for project managers, and it is known as the Project Management Professional, that is PMP certification. PMI's professional certification examination development processes stand apart from other project management certification examination development practices. So the PMI, that is the Project Management Institute, has released PMBOK Guide Version Seven. And this all began way back in the summer of 1969, when the Project Management Institute, that is PMI, was founded by a group of people. And ever since, they've been releasing the PMBOK guides. Okay, currently there are six PMBOK guides, and the seventh one is releasing on August 1st, 2021. 
PMI's research found that in past 10 years, technology and software are driving innovation and they are also creating new business models and new ways of working. There is a stronger focus on outcomes now than deliverables. The seventh edition of the guide builds on the standard and is structured not only around knowledge areas and ITTOs, but around project performance domains, which are a group of related activities that are very, very critical for the effective delivery of project outcomes. So it's not just solely focused on project delivery, but it is also focused on the project outcomes. So the PMBOK guide are relevant to the changing dynamics of the project management professionals. So now let's move on to the next part of the session and understand the purpose of PMBOK. So the PMI's project management body of knowledge or PMBOK guide has two parts. The first part is the standard for project management. PMI, that is the Project Management Institute, has affirmed that it will continue its affiliation with two standard bodies, that is ISO and American National Standards Institute, that is ANSI. As with previous PMBOK guides, PMBOK 7 will contain PMI standard for project management. The second part is a guide to the project management body of knowledge, a collation of what PMI considers to be the core body of knowledge it expects all professional project managers to know. Until now, it has been the basis for its principal examinations and qualifications, project management professional and certified associate in project management. In the future, it will be more of a framework for applying the standard with a wide range of knowledge that PMI will store in its new online repository that is PMI Standards Plus. We will be talking about PMI Standard Plus later on in the session. So the fundamental purpose of the PMBOK guide is to recognize and explain generally accepted knowledge and systems that can be applied to the projects. The PMBOK guide is basically a subset of the project management body of knowledge that is generally recognized as a very good practice. Now let's move ahead and talk about the various factors influencing PMBOK. Now, primarily, as you might have guessed in the view of the new syllabus introduced in 2019, the agile and hybrid project management approach make their way to mainstream content of the guide along with the existing predictive delivery approach. But this is not the fundamental change influencing PMBOK. The seventh version moves away from a process oriented approach to principles oriented, or you could even say outcome oriented approach, thus supporting any type of project delivery. You guessed it right. The word principles has a stamp of agile paradigm. You could also say the thinking from which PMBOK comes now has been shifted. It has become much, much broader. Also, another marked change is a shift in scope to address project delivery in addition to project management. This idea seems to be more action focused or practitioner friendly. Also, the focus is on project outcomes than just the project deliverables. One could say that PMBOK scope is not widened to not just include the project management approaches, but also focus is also widened to include the project outcomes. So it's not just about delivery. It is also about the outcomes. There are two fundamental aspects influencing changes in the PMBOK seventh guide. The first one is value delivery system. Let's talk more about this. Okay, the value delivery system is the holistic system through which projects really deliver business value. Business value is the tangible and intangible benefits received by customers, employees, and even the partners of the business. And you must be aware that projects are basically the main vehicle that delivers business value by achieving business objectives of the organization. The seventh edition of standard for project management on which PMBOK is based shows how good strategy really leads to intended business value in the organization. This is done through defining organizational strategies that really help identify business objectives, which then turn into actionable initiatives such as portfolios, programs, projects, which produce deliverables and increase capabilities of the organization. This also produces tangible or intangible outcomes, thus creating benefits for the customers and end users which eventually turn business value produced by the organization. So what this system really does is it enables this flow in a very smooth and a very predictive manner 
that would be a very great value to the organization. And this is made possible by the efficient propagation of information and feedback through the predefined channels. The value delivery system comprises portfolios, programs, projects, operations, and also uses a system to manage several issues that you may encounter. It also enables workflows. It also allows you to make decisions. The second factor that is influencing is project delivery principles. Now, project delivery principles in short are the what's and why's of project management that guide the thinking and behavior of people involved in project delivery. So they can really apply their efforts towards a strong project outcome. The PMBOK 7 not only focuses on the delivery part, but it also focuses on the outcomes, right? So this is where the delivery principles comes into the picture. And there are 12 principles that are defined in the standard for project management. We'll be talking about each of these in detail. So now that we know what are the two factors that really influence the PMBOK guide, let's move ahead and talk about the primary change in the PMBOK 7. So firstly, the structure of PMBOK 7 has been changed completely. So in the seventh edition, the guide will focus mainly on the performance domains. So we have tailoring, we have models, methods and artifacts, and there are eight performance domains that have been put under the spotlight. So when you compare this to the sixth edition, the primary focus was just on 49 processes categorized under 10 knowledge areas. But now what they've done is they want you to really focus on these performance domains and work towards it. We'll be talking about tailoring models, methods and artifacts and also the eight performance domains in detail in the next part of the session. So before we move on and talk about the performance domains and models, methods and artifacts and tailoring, firstly, we will have to address the project principles in PMBOK 7. As I've already mentioned, there are 12 project principles. So by now you must know that the five changes that have been implemented is firstly principles will replace processes in the sixth edition you had processes in the seventh edition you'll have principles and then you have performance domains which will replace knowledge areas there'll be a whole new section on tailoring the seventh guide will also introduce models methods and artifacts and there will be a new section on the value delivery system okay so there are basically three general approaches that organizations like project management institute can use to document the standards. The first one is narrative based standards, which use storytelling and description. This is not very rigorous and it's not very informative. The second one is the process based standards, which is basically documents a set of processes that together deliver the desired outcomes. The third one is principle based standards that are built around a set of statements of fundamental principles. They aim to capture and summarize broadly agreed approaches to best practices within core areas. PMBOK 7 and all the previous editions have clearly taken a process based approach, but the seventh edition, which is a very special edition, will create a principle based standard. So let us understand firstly, what is principle based standard? Principles are basically statements of standards of morale and ethical conduct. And they are also statements of widely agreed assumptions or truths and fundamental laws of rules. Well, they will mostly be subjective matters of judgment. Useful principles will be those that gain wide near universal acceptance among a relevant community of practitioners. So finally, let us check out these 12 really, really important principles in the PMBOK 7. So the first one is stewardship which is to be diligent, respectful, and a caring steward. The second one is team, which means that you should build a culture of accountability and respect. The third one is stakeholders, which engage stakeholders to understand the interests and needs. The fourth one is value, which basically focuses on value. The fifth one is holistic thinking, which recognizes and responds to systems interactions. The sixth one is leadership, which means that motivate, influence, coach, and learn. The seventh one is tailoring, which means that tailor the delivery approach based on context. The eighth one is quality, build quality into processes and results. The ninth one is complexity, which means address complexity using knowledge, experience, and learning. The 10th one is opportunities and threats. That means that address opportunities and threats. The 11th one is adaptability and resilience. Be adaptable and resilient. 
and the 12th and the last principle is change management which means that you will have to enable change to achieve the envisioned future state so now that we have discussed the 12 project principles of pmbok 7 let's move ahead and talk about the eight project performance domains so firstly we will have to understand what the project management performance domains really mean they're just complementary groupings of related areas of activity or function that uniquely categorize and differentiate the activities found in one performance domain from the others within the full scope of program management work you can just think of performance domains as the broad areas that we must focus on they must necessarily overlap this is because projects are extremely complex and we need to integrate each of these parts but each represents a substantial element of our work that we will be focusing on so the first project domain is team the second one is stakeholders and we have the third one which is life cycle the fourth one is planning the fifth one is navigating uncertainty and ambiguity the sixth one is delivery the seventh one is performance and the last one is project work so now that we've also covered what are the eight important performance domains in pmbok 7 Let us understand this new reference that has been incorporated with the PMBOK Seventh, which is the Standards Plus. As a project management practitioner or someone with educational or research interest, Standards Plus is a way to quickly refer to project management institutes, standards, and guides. PMI states that Standards Plus was created specifically to help you apply the standard to your work. So, what this digital platform that is Standards Plus. really does is it connects pmbok to content specifically created to help practitioners implement standards at work standards plus has tons of content in the easy to consume format such as articles videos audios and downloadable templates you can search for areas that you need help with at your job or when you're working and find the relevant content the beauty of this is that you will be able to refer to a specific part of pmbok for every content you find and you will be able to put pmi standards to work this way you will have direct access to the best practices from the trenches and be sure of getting the best results at work you can also understand how these standards apply to the specific industry you work in and finally standard plus also gives you an opportunity to learn all about agile project management practices now let's move ahead to the next part of the session and understand tailoring methods So tailoring methods is outlined in the PMBOK guide 7th edition It has basically four steps. The first step is to select initial development approach. Here you will be able to choose a development approach best suited to the endeavor. The second step is tailor for organization. Here you will have to modify based on organizational requirements. The third step is to tailor for project that is you'll have to adjust based on size, criticality and other factors. the fourth one is implement ongoing improvement here you will inspect and adapt continuously okay now that we have also addressed what is tailoring methods let's move on and talk about models methods and artifacts so pmbok 7 will introduce a section that lists common models methods and artifacts available to project practitioners it will really give you a brief description of each model method or artifact and it will map them to one or more of the project performance domains where the author suggests it might be most applicable or useful the first one is model we'll understand each of these in detail so a model really describes a thinking strategy to explain a process framework or a phenomena examples may include situational readership tuckman and the process groups the second one is methods a method here means that you will have to achieve an outcome result or project deliverable examples include lessons learned planning poker risk matrix the third one is an artifact which is a template document output or project deliverable examples include risk register scope management plan stakeholder engagement plan models methods and artifacts explainer so this is something of an expansion of the ittos of earlier pmbok guides but it will take the idea far further contextualizing them to project type industry sector and development approach 
As a result, this is a very welcome upgrade. ITTOs will remain available through the PMI Standards Plus website and the modules will also include the process groups from former PMBOK guides. So let us start with the easy interview questions. So the first question is how will you define a project? Now as for the Project Management Institute, a project is known as a temporary endeavor with a definite beginning and a definite end. To explain this in simple terms, a project can be defined as a sequence or a series of tasks that should be completed to obtain the end result. A project could range from simple to complex. It could be handled by one team or many teams. But every project will have these listed characteristics. First, it will have a defined life cycle, which is a basically a start date and an end date. Next, it will have an iterative task which leads to a predefined action. The third characteristic is a project always creates a new end product. So this was about project. So now let us move on to the next question. Our next question is what is a project charter? Now a project charter is a document which includes all the details about the project. It mainly includes information about the scope, objectives and the individuals who are involved in the project. It also includes the roles and responsibilities of each project member. This project charter acts as a contract between the sponsors, key stakeholders and the project team. So I guess you have some idea about what is a project charter. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is what are the techniques that you use to collect project requirements? Now before we talk about the techniques used to collect project requirement, let us first understand what is project requirement. So project requirement can be defined as what stakeholder expect from a project or from the product of the project. So all these requirements should be collected in a project and also managed properly. Now some of the important techniques that you can use to collect project requirements are gathering the data, analyzing the data, observing the performance of individual team members and then organizing or grouping of requirements or ideas and then prioritizing the requirements and working on them first and last one is prototyping. So these were some of the techniques that you can use to collect project requirements. So now let us move on to the next question. Our next question is what is project management? Now this is a very basic question. You can answer this by saying project management is a discipline that helps in implementing various processes, methods, knowledge, skills and experience for achieving the objective of a unique project. Now project management is nothing like the usual management. One key factor would differentiate these two are that project management has a final deliverable and a definite timeline whereas the usual management is an ongoing process. Also a project manager must always follow the 6P rule of project management which is proper planning prevents poor project performance. So this was about project management. So now let us move on to the next question. So next question is explain the project management lifecycle process. This question can be asked right after the previous question. Now the project management lifecycle is a series of various activities that are crucial for accomplishing project objectives or targets. This helps in structuring the efforts and simplifying them into a series of logical and manageable steps. The project management life cycle consists of four simple phases. The first phase is initiation. It's the first and the most vital step in the life cycle of a project where the initial scope of the project gets defined and the resources are committed. This process group ensures the success of your project. The next phase is planning. In this process group, an appropriate level of detail is noted down for the project to plan time, cost and the resources needed. It estimates that work needed and to also manage the risk effectively. The next phase is executing. Now this process group consists of the processes which are used to complete the work defined in the project management plan. It's all about achieving the project's objective. It involves tracking, reviewing and regulating the performance of the project. Also, if you need to identify potential problem quickly and take corrective actions. And the final phase is closure. Now this process group is an important part of project management which is performed to finalize all the project activities to complete the project. This means finishing all activities across all processes group, disbanding the project team and signing off the project with the customer using the project closure report. So this was a life cycle of a project management process. Now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is what are the most important skills that a project manager should possess? So these are some of the skills that a project manager should have. So firstly, he or she should have good communication skill. Next leadership and then team management, negotiation power, personal organization and also risk management. So these are some important skills that every project manager should possess. With this said, let us move on to our next question. Our next question is what qualities should a project manager have? Now this question is kind of similar to the previous questions, but these talks about the quality that the project manager should have. 
So project managers should be good at listening, observing, and learning. They should understand the client's need and what they want. They should also know their team members and their personalities. They should take opportunities to learn some new skills and also help out around the workplace. And finally, they should try to master the tools that their company uses. So these were some of the qualities that every project manager should have. Now moving on to our next question. Our next question is explain the different types of leadership styles. Now leadership is a quality that every project manager should possess. Every leader has his own leadership style to guide the team. The leadership style refers to a leader's characteristics, behavior while directing, motivating, guiding and managing his team members to bring the best out of them. So in a project, they hold the responsibility to motivate others for better performance, creation and innovation. There are basically four types of leadership styles and your leadership style should be situational depending on the type of team you're working in and the importance of the task involved in the project. So the four types of leadership styles are delegate, supportive, directing and coaching. With this said, let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, how would you decide what is an ideal project? Now, before you decide on what is your ideal project, you must consider the following questions. These questions will help you narrowing down your choices while making sure that your productivity maximizes. So the first question is, what type of work do you enjoy the most? Next, ask yourself how much you want to and are allowed to show your creativity. After that, the next question is, under what type of deadlines do you work the best? Next, how comfortable are you with trying out new things on a project? Next, do you prefer to always receive full credit for your work? And if you are okay with working as a part of a team or you prefer to work alone? Now, based on this question, then you can decide what is your ideal project. So now moving on to our next question. Our next question is, when will you consider that your project is off track and what will be your steps to ensure that it finishes within the given timeline? So firstly, to detect whether your project is on track or falling behind the agreed timeline, you must check the following pointers. First, if the budget is under control or no. Next, you need to check if the project scope keeps on changing. And next, you should check if the original goals are still present or not. And if the answer for all these pointers are true, then your project is definitely off the track and you must take immediate action to bring it back on track. Few steps that you might take are, you can discover the root cause, you can put in more time and effort to catch up, then you can try to follow the original goal or vision. Next, you can readjust the resource management according to the project requirement. And finally, you can keep open communication with the client and the stakeholders. So these were some of the steps that will ensure you that you finish the work within the given timeline. So let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, what is the difference between risk and issues? Well, one of the most prominent differences, issues are more of present focused, whereas risks are more of future focused. Next, issues always tend to be negative in nature and risk could be either positive or negative. The next difference is, Issues are generally documented in issue register, whereas risks are generally documented in risk register. The last difference is the response to an issue will be issue workaround, whereas the response to risk is based on risk response planning. So these were some of the difference between risk and issues. Now let us move on to the next question. Our next question is, why does a project manager need to be proactive? Now a project manager has a higher chance of finding out the risk and implementing solution in order to minimize them. Being proactive lets them have more control over the project's tasks and resources. They can keep a better track of all the tasks and issues to work towards implementing small changes and improvements for higher productivity and efficiencies. They can organize frequent meetings for developers to talk about their problems, brainstorm solutions, share best practices, and so on. A project manager also has to compare the actual cost and the time spent on tasks on a weekly basis with a planned number. So these were some of the reasons that why a project manager needs to be proactive. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, what are the different communication styles used in the project? Now the type of communication used in a project will completely depend on the type of project you're working on and the type of team you have. But the types of communication styles that a project manager uses are return, electronic, face-to-face, -face, and responsive. These are some of the different communication styles used in the project. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, what do you understand by time and material contract? Now, this is a type of contract that is a hybrid contractual agreement containing aspects of both cost reimbursement and fixed price contract. Time and material contract resembles the cost reimbursable type arrangement where they have no definite end. This contract is generally used in projects whose accurate project size cannot be estimated or when it is expected that the project requirements would most likely change. So this was about the time and material contract. Now let us move on to the next question. Our next question is, what will you do if any of the customer are not happy with the quality or the result of the project by the end of the project? Now you can answer this question by saying to handle an unhappy customer, you must show the customers that you value them. 
Next, you need to understand why they are not happy and figure out what modification they need. You should also try to incorporate the modification as soon as possible. And if this does not work, then try to convince and explain the customers that the project fits in with the agreed scope. So these were some of the steps that you can take to handle any unhappy customer. So now let us move on to the next question. Our next question is, what are the steps that you will take to do risk planning? So there are five important steps in risk planning. The first one is, now these steps include identifying and describing all the possible risks that might affect your project and its result. So to avoid this, make a note of all the possible risks. And during this step, you can start to prepare a project risk registry, which is a register to keep all the details of all the possible risks. The next step is to analyze the risk. Once risks are identified, the next step you should take is to analyze the likelihood and consequences of each risk. Now, this is a very important step because you will understand the nature of the risk and its effects on the project goals and objective. We should also input all this information to your project risk registry. The next step is to prioritize your risk. Now, after analyzing all the possible risks, it is time for you to evaluate and prioritize the risk by determining the risk magnitude. Now, the risk magnitude can be calculated as a combination of likelihood and consequences. So, on top will be the risk which has the most chances of occurring and whose consequences are bad for the project and vice versa. You should also add this risk ranking to your project risk registry. The fourth step is to treat the risk. During this step, you analyze the highest rank risk and plan strategies to treat or avoid this. You can create risk prevention and reduction strategies and also plan for emergency in this step. You then add this risk treatment measure for the highest ranking or the most serious risk to your project risk registry. This step is also referred to as risk response planning. And finally, the fifth step is to monitor and review the risk. Now, this is a step where you review your project risk registry and with the help of it, track reviews and monitor the risk. So these were the steps that you will take to do risk planning. Now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is customer or development team. Which one is the most important for a project manager? Now you can answer this by saying both the teams are equally important as both of them are customer oriented. The development team works on developing product for the customers while the customer team works on helping the customers with the products. A project manager should invest equal time with both the team and understand the requirement, solve the problems in order to increase the chance of productivity. Both these teams are interdependent on each other. So a project manager should focus equally on both the teams. So now with this said, let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, what methods will you use to deliver the results you're looking for? Now the answer for this question will change for every individual. But before you go to the interview, learn about the company, understand how the company carries out its job. So according to that, answer this question. But some of the points you can use here is, first of all, analyze and plan all the work to be done. Next, clearly understand and communicate the work properly. Following that, you can use the project collaboration tool to increase the productivity of the task. Then you can conduct weekly meetings and take updates. And if there is any problem, you can solve it. And you can prioritize the higher priority task and complete them first. Next, you can come to the low priority task. So these were some of the methods that you can use to deliver the results. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, work from home has become the new normal in the post-COVID world. Now, how well are you prepared to manage a remote team? You can answer this question by saying you're very well prepared to manage a remote team. Then you can talk about a few points on how will you manage a remote team. Some of the pointers that will help you answer this question is you can have a well-organized workspace. You can have clear communication with your team members. You can conduct weekly meetings to discuss project updates and address any problems regarding the project. Then you can prioritize the important tasks first and work on them. Next, you can use project collaboration tools to improve the productivity of the task and also the teams. So these were the easy question. Now let us move on to our intermediate questions and answers. The first question here is, what is stakeholder analysis and power interest grid used for? Firstly, stakeholder analysis is a technique used for identifying, analyzing and prioritizing potential stakeholders who might be associated with the project in some way or another. It can also be defined as a process that should take place before the project begins where you identify or analyze the stakeholders and group them according to various factors like interest in the projects, the contribution to the project and their influence to the project. This helps in determining how to prioritize and communicate with different stakeholders. So this was stakeholder analysis. Now a power interest grid is used to classify the stakeholders according to the power over the projects and their interest on their results. And based on these two criteria, you can allocate a position for them in each of the power interest grid. So for stakeholders in the higher power and the higher interest grid, they should be managed very closely. And for stakeholders in the high power, low interest quadrant, we should put efforts to keep them satisfied. But as they have low interest, we should not always disturb or bother them. 
Next for stakeholders in the low power high interest quadrant, we should keep them informed about all the project updates. And for stakeholders in the low power low interest quadrants, they should just be given the least priority. You can just put minimum effort to them and just monitor them in case their position on the grid changes to something more significant. So this was about stakeholder analysis and power interest grid. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is how to prioritize task in a project. Now prioritizing task in a project is very important. It helps in ensuring successfully and timely completion of your project. Now in order to prioritize the task, you should follow the below pointers. The first one is you should list the task and responsibility. Next, you need to distinguish between urgent and important. Next, you need to access the values of each task. And according to them, order the task by estimated efforts. You should also stay flexible and you should be ready to adapt and also know when to say no. So these are some of the steps that will help you prioritize your task in a project. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is what is a WBS and how does it help in preparing a good plan? Now WBS stands for work breakdown structure, which is very important in preparing a good plan. Now, as the name suggests, WBS is breaking up a project work into smaller and manageable parts, which are known as work packages. WBS helps in preparing a good plan as it is integrated with cost, scope, and schedule baselines, which ensures that the project plans are going as planned. So instead of planning for the entire project, it will be easier and more efficient to break down the project into parts and then plan for those individual parts. So it will be easier to plan and even when there is a problem, it is easier to identify and solve the problem. A good WBS plan helps to achieve optimal results and leads to the development of a robust and accurate plan. So this was about WBS. Let us move on to our next question, which is how to handle a difficult stakeholder involved in a project. Since stakeholders hold a high authority and are an integral part of a project, having the consent is very important. But sometimes they can be a little difficult to handle. In such cases, you should accept the authority without fighting. You should remove all the negative emotion and understand the issues. You should ask for advice and listen to them. You should be tactful and honest with your decision and praise them and try to establish the connection. And finally, you should improve your communication with them. So these were some of the steps you can take to handle difficult stakeholders who are involved in your project. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, what are the tools mostly used for improving the process activities? So some of the majorly used tools in the industry are comparing and baselining a process. Next, flow charting followed by value stream mapping and then we have cause and effect analysis and last we have hypothesis testing. So these were some of the tools which are commonly used for improving the process activity. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is how will you manage the team members who are not working to their full potential? To bring the best out of your team members, you must try to avoid any type of emotional confrontation with the team and stakeholders. You should encourage them to think and act on their own ways. You should help your team members in developing their decision making abilities. Next, you should develop the performance tolerance threshold. Following that, you should strengthen the potential of the weak employees by surrounding them with stronger employees. Next, you should understand what motivates your employees and show your employees where they fit in the company's mission and visions. And then you should arrange a proper follow up process and reward and appreciate their improvement to encourage them more. And finally, you should be ready to let them go if there is no scope for improvement. So with this said, let us move on to our next question. The next question is being a project manager, how will you game your team agreements for results? Now trust and agreement is a key factor that facilitates proper communication and coordination in a team, which brings out the best outcome. So to gain agreement for your team members, you must keep an expectation clear from the very beginning. Next, you should build achievable milestones so that they don't feel pressurized. Next, you should collaborate and maintain team trust throughout the project and agree on terms with the team and ask their opinion as well. Next, you should schedule frequent accountable meetings and establish outcome results and consequences. And finally, you should clear out any conflicts among team members as soon as it arises. So these were some of the steps as a project manager you can take to gain your team agreements for results. So now let us move on to our next question. What is the formula for calculating the three point estimating method? Now there are two ways in which you can calculate the three point estimation. The first one is by triangular distribution where you can calculate E by adding P plus M plus O divided by three. Now P stands for pessimist, O stands for optimist and M for most likely. The second formula for calculating the three point estimating method is beta or Perth distribution, which is E is equal to pessimist plus four times of most likely plus optimist divided by six. So these were the two ways you can calculate the three point estimating method. So now let us move on to the next question. Our next question is what is the difference between risk impact and risk probability. Now risk probability is the chances that a risk will occur 
whereas risk impact is a cost when a risk does occur. So here's a table of risk probability versus risk impact, in which you can see there are four categories. The first one is high impact and low probability. Next, we have high impact and high probability. And third, we have low impact and low probability. And finally, we have low impact and high probability. Now, as a project manager, you should focus more on high impact and high probability risk and less on low impact and low probability risk. So this was a major difference between risk impact and responsibility and also tells you about how they are related. Now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is explain the triple constraint triangle in project management. Now the triple constraint triangle is a combination of three key components which acts as the most significant restriction of any project. So the three constraints in this models are time, cost and scope. Now each of these constraints forms the vertices of a triangle with quality as a center factor. So this was about the triple constraint triangle in project management. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, what are the major types of risks you might encounter in a project? So here's a list of the most frequently encountered risk in the project. First, we have cost risks, then schedule risk, performance risk, resource risk, technology risk, market risk, legal risk, strategic risk, governance risk, operational risk, and external risk. So these were some of the major types of risks you might encounter in a project. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, you'll be using quality assurance and quality control for ensuring the quality of your final deliverables. Now, what is the difference between them? This question can also be asked as, what is the difference between quality control and quality assurance? So, well, quality control is used to verify the quality of the output and quality control is done in the end with a check if the end product meets the expected standards and it is a strategy for detection. Whereas quality assurance is a process of managing the quality. It is done throughout the execution and the development process and it is a strategy for prevention. So you see, quality control is done at the end and quality assurance is done during the process. So this is the major difference between quality control and quality assurance. So with this said, let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, how does organizational structure influence resource acquisition? Well, an organization structure determines a lot of factors that influence resource acquisition, such as the level of project management, the organization's environment, the communication between the team members, and how the project manager works with the team, and many more factors. Now talking about a few points, how organization structure influence resource acquisition are, the first one is by project management. Now during the process of your project management, your organization structure can either be a tight structure where all the steps that you take are managed very closely or a loose structure where there are not many rules and a little liberty in performing the task. The next point is communication. Now the communication between the team members to complete a project is greatly impacted by the organization structure. There should be good communication between the team members and also interdepartment communication. It will create a friendly environment where people can share their ideas and suggestions, which in turn helps in the proper flow of the project. The next factor is chain of command impact. Now this means the hierarchy of an organization. The organization structure should be in such a way that when a high authority communicates a requirement, it should be well understood and followed by the project managers and their subordinate correctly. Also, the project manager should know its subordinates so that they can pick the right people for the particular task. So this was about how organization structure could influence resource acquisition. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is define plan value, actual cost and earned value. First talking about plan value. Plan value is a budget which is authorized to an activity or work breakdown structure. This plan value can be allocated in various phases over the lifetime of a project. So to calculate the plan value, use the relationship plan value is equal to BAC into plan percentage of complete. Next talking about earned value. Now, earned value is a measure of work performed or the budget authorized for that work. In simple words, it's the budget authorized for completion of the work. And to calculate the EV, you should use the relationship earned value is equal to total percentage of the work completed into BAC. And finally, talking about the actual cost. Now, actual cost is a cost which is incurred for the completion of work or the task during the specific time period. In simple words, the cost you incur while you're completing the work in which EV is measured. Now, actual cost can be measured as it is related to planned value, which is budgeted and earned value, which is measured. So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, what is effort variance? Effort variance in simple terms can be defined as the difference between the planned effort and the actual effort required to undertake the task. And to calculate the effort variance, you can follow this formula. Effort variance is equal to actual effort minus planned effort divided by planned effort into 100. So this was about effort variance. Now let us move on to the next question. What is the critical path method? Critical path method or CPM is a resource utilization algorithm which is used for scheduling project activities. 
So this algorithm is used to create a structure in which the tasks are executed. So to construct a CPM, you should include the following things. First, a list of all the tasks that have to be completed for the project. Next, the dependency between these tasks to understand which task is dependent on which task. And finally, the time estimated to complete these tasks. And based on these criteria, you can prioritize the task which has to be performed on priority. So these were the intermediate interview questions. So now let us move on to the advanced interview questions and answers. So the first question in advanced interview question is, what is the importance of maintaining a requirement traceability matrix? Requirement traceability matrix or RTM is a document which ensures that all the requirements that are defined for a particular system are linked to each and every point during the verification process. RTM also ensures that they are tested with respect to various test parameters and protocols. The importance of maintaining requirement traceability matrix is that RTM can be defined as a powerful planning tool which helps in determining various factors like the required number of tests, what are the type of tests required and whether this test can be automated then manually or whether an existing test can be reused. Also using the RTM you can get result in the most effective test execution which provides report of an overall defect status focusing major on business requirements. So this is why you should maintain a requirement traceability matrix. So now let us move on to the next question. The next question is what are the processes and process group in the project management framework? A process in the project management framework is defined as a way of doing tasks that are involved in successful completion of the project. These processes define the action to be taken along with the sequences. There are around 49 processes in the project management framework embedded in various processes group. Now processes group are a collection of processes that are applicable through various stages of a project. There are five processes group in which 10 knowledge areas and 49 processes are mapped into. The five processes group are initiation, planning, execution, monitoring and control and then closing. So with this said, let us move on to the next question. Our next question is, what is RAID in project management? Now RAID in project management stands for risk, assumption, issues and dependencies. These are very important items that a project manager must have knowledge about. So risk are the potential problems that can either have a positive or negative impact on the project resulting in a deviation of the final result from the original plan. Next actions. Actions are the last that you perform throughout the project. And then we have issues. Issues are the hurdles that you might face in the course of the project which must be successfully resolved or it might cause the project to fail. And finally, decisions are the choices of action or task in the project. Now let us move on to the next question. The next question is, what are the things you should track while managing a project? Now not a single methodology. Now some of the things you need to track while managing a project are strategic goals and core values of your organization, key business driven of your project, Next, any constraints in the project or any stakeholders involved in the project. We should also measure the risks that might occur and the level of complexity of the project. And finally, I should track and estimate the size and cost of the project. So now let us move on to our next question. The next question is, explain Ishikawa or Fishbone Diagram. Now Fishbone Diagram is also known as a cause and effect diagram or Ishikawa Diagram. It is a visualization tool that is used to categorize the potential causes of a problem in order to identify its root causes. A Japanese quality control expert named Kaoro Ishikawa invented this fishbone diagram in order to help employees to avoid solutions that will merely address the symptoms of a much larger problem. You can see the fishbone diagram over here. What will be the effect of the options? So now let us move on to our next question. Our next question is explain the entire team forming process you follow for your team. So there are development stages of a team which consists of forming, storming, performing and adjourning. So let us talk about the steps one by one. First we have forming. So in this stage, the entire group unites for the first time with the focus is to build relationship with the team members and to clarify the mission of the project. Next we have storming. Now in this stage, team members get more comfortable in sharing their opinions with the team and there is the possibility of internal conflicts within the group. After this we have performing. And by this stage, the team members learn to trust and accept each other. Each of the team members become competent, autonomous and is able to handle the decision making process without anyone's supervision. And finally, we have adjourning. Now this is the final step of the team forming process, which takes place after the project completion. In this stage, the team is broken up and resources are released. So this was the team forming process you should follow for your team. So now let us move on to the next question. The next question is, what is Pareto Principle Analysis? Pareto Principle Analysis is a strategic technique for decision making. It is basically used for the selection of a limited number of tasks which can bring a significant overall effect. This principle follows the Pareto principle also known as the 50-20 rule and states that 80% of the results should come from 20% of the actions. 
Now this helps in prioritizing the work, especially in large projects with a number of small tasks. So this was about Pareto principle analysis. Now let us move on to our next question, which is how does the RACI matrix helps in resource management? Every individual in a project should understand is and her responsibility. Each team member's role can be defined using a RACI matrix. Now RACI stands for four roles which stakeholders may portray in a project. It maps out to is responsible, is accountable, who must be consulted with, and who shall be informed. Just to explain this better, responsible defines who is completing the task, and accountable defines who is making decisions and taking actions on the task. And consulted means who will be communicated with regards to the decision and task. And informed defines who will be updated on decisions and actions taken during the project. With the RACI matrix, there will be no role or task related ambiguity among the team members. So this is how RACI matrix helps in resource management. So with this said, let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, what kind of bid documents can be used for procurement management? Now let us first understand what is a bid document. Now bid document is a document that comprises of a proposal which is often made through a bidding process. It can either be done by a person or a company and will include what are the important factors like delivery schedule, the availability of the product, the prices and so on. So the different types of bid documents that are used for procurement management are request for proposal or RFP. Now RFP is a document which is used by buyers to specify all their purchasing needs and any supporting requirements which will help the sellers understand what are the needs of the buyer. Next we have request for quotation. Now RFQ is a formal document used as a request for price quotation and to specify all the requirements for certain purchases clearly. But the major differences between RFQ and RFP is that RFQ is a relatively smaller document and it only provides the specification of the item to be purchased and the request for a quotation which is unlike RFP. The next bit document is request for information. Now RFI is used to seek information on various aspects from the future buyer. RFI can contain questions asking about information about the bidder such as the financial statement for the last 10 years, details of the process of the organization, details of the past accomplishment and so on. The next bid document is invitation for bid. Now this invitation for bid is a document which is used for inviting potential bidders to come and participate in the bidding process. And next we have request for bid. Now RFB is used to obtain financial bids for specific purchases from a selected group or set of suppliers. And next we have purchase order. A purchase order is an order raised for favoring a supplier for regular purchases. And finally we have contract or agreement. Now contract or agreement can be described as a mutual agreement between the two parties that is the buyer and the seller. So these were some of the types of bid documents that are used for procurement management. So now let us move on to the next question. The next question is what is decision support system and how many types of decision support systems are there? DSS or a decision support system is an information application which basically provides the user relevant information which it has collected from a variety of data sources. This DSS can help by providing information which leads to a better decision making. Now a decision support system is made up of three different parts. The first one is knowledge base. Now this contains all the information which are basically collected from both internal and external sources. Next we have software system. Now this is composed of model management system. Now a model is basically a simulation of a real world system with the goal of understanding how the system works and how it can be improved. And finally we have user interface. The primary goal of a decision support system's user interface is to make it easier for the user to change the data that is stored on it. So this was about decision support system. Now let us move on to the next question. Name the 10 key knowledge areas as mentioned in the PM book guide. Now all the project management processes in the PM book are divided into 10 areas which are project integration, project scope management, project time management, project cost management, project quality management, project human resource management, project communication management, project risk management, project procurement management and project stakeholder management. So these were the 10 key knowledge areas as mentioned in the PM book guide. So now let us move on to our next question. The next question is explain the principle of six thinking hats. Now the six thinking hats is a very interesting way of understanding an issue from a variety of perspective. You can only think from six different perspectives or you and your team members could do this. Now each of the six hats represent a different point of view. Let us talk about them one by one. First is the white hat. Now a person who has the white hat will only talk about the information. You have to consider it both from within and outside the scope of the discussion. Next we have the red hat. A person who has the red hat should express his thoughts or feelings. The red hat signifies emotion. You can express emotion and feelings and share likes, 
dislikes, loves and hate. The objective here is to address the credibility of an emotion that are a part of certain discussion. Next we have the black hat. A person who has a black hat is responsible for identifying any mistake or roadblocks. They can be judgmental. Think about everything that could go wrong. Think about the worst case scenarios so others can find a solution for it. And then we have the yellow hat. The yellow hat symbolizes brightness and optimism. A person who wears this hat should think of positive aspect related to a subject as much as possible. They should also encourage the other team members. And fifth we have the green hat. A person wearing the green hat should come up with new innovative ideas. They should be creative. They should know all the information, problems and come up with new ideas that will solve the problems and help in better productivity. The main purpose of wearing this hat is to generate as many new ideas as possible. And finally we have the blue hat. Now the blue hat is a thinking hat. It is all about thinking. It is the hat which ensures the six thinking hat guidance are observed. They decide the agenda and timeline. How long does the session last? When do you need to wear a particular hat and for how long? So basically the group's controller should wear the blue hat for that session. So this was the principle of six thinking hat. With this said, let us move on to our next question. Our next question is, what are the DMAIC and the DMADV methodologies? So firstly, the DMAIC and DMADV are methodologies which are designed so that our business processes will be more effective and efficient. First, talking about DMAIC, it stands for Define, Measure, Analyze, Improve and Control. DMAIC is limited to improving existing processes. It does not address anything regarding the design of new products, services or processes. D in DMAIC stands for defining a problem which all output has to be improved, customer and the processes are associated with that problem. Next, M stands for measuring the data to make a baseline for improvement. Next, A stands for analyzing the data to find the main cause for the defect. And then I stands for improving the process by trying out different ideas and solution. And finally, C stands for controlling process implementation to sustain the improvements. Now talking about DMADV, it stands for define, measure, analyze, design and verify. DMADV unlike DMAIC is majorly focused on the process of designing new products, services or processes. D in the DMADV stands for defining design goal. Next M stands for measure and identity of the characteristics that are critical for the quality. And then A stands for analyzing the data to find the best design. Then D stands for planning and designing the product, service or processes. And finally V stands for verifying if the design product works well as planned under real time and stimulated condition. So this was about DMAIC and DMADV methodology. So now let us move on to a final question. What is the PDCA cycle? PDCA cycle stands for plan, do, check, act cycle. It is a four step problem solving technique which is used to improve business processes. It was originally developed by an American physicist named Walter A. Stewart. It is a cycle which means it keeps iterating or repeating these four steps. The first step is plan. These steps include planning a project in such a way that it defines clearly what the project goals are and what are the best ways to work towards the goal. It is basically setting up framework for all the operation that should be done. The second step is do. These steps include executing the actions which are planned. This do stage can be broken down into parts. The first part includes assigning the task to the individual and training them. The second part includes the actual process of doing the work and the third part is noting down the progress and insights for future evaluation. Next, the third step is check. This step is used to check if the project objectives are met. It also includes checking if the completed project addresses both successes and failures. So if there are any failures, further changes have to be made. Next, the fourth step is to act. These steps include performing any corrective actions that were needed after the evaluation in the previous step. Now this cycle can be repeated until you get the optimal results. Let's get started with the first question. There are some basic questions. There are certain scenario based questions. On the top of that, we have also a few questions which are identified where we'll be solving some of the examples that will be asked in the PMP examination. So let's, let's get started with the first question. The first question to you all is define project scope. So when you define project scope, there are various options that we can think of. The first option is it is design of experiments that is used to complete the project work. It is the combination of cost and the schedule which is required to complete the project work. It is a description of the required work that is necessary to complete the project. It is a description of the required work and resources that are needed to complete the project. So if you talk about the scope of the project, when we define while working on the project, it's definitely the description of the required work that is necessary to complete the project. 
Now, please understand that sometimes these options could be a bit confusing. When you'll appear for the PMP examination, you will find out of the four options, two options are very, very close. Here also you'll find that the option number third and the option number fourth they appears to be very close. But here definitely there is a difference that if you see the fourth option, it says it is the description of the required work and resources that are needed to complete the project. But if you talk about project scope, doesn't talk about the resources needed. Project scope talk about only the work to be performed on the project. So resources needed will need to be determined based on the project scope. And that is definitely covered as a part of the scope management process. So the answer is the third answer here. Moving to the next question, it talks about what is a program. Now we did cover this as a part of the training as well. As you all know, we have options here program a very large and complex project, a collection of projects which have common resources, a collection of sub projects having a common goal and a collection of sub projects having a common customer. Now, if you remember what we discussed and learned about program, it basically talks about the collection of projects which have common resources. So if you take a look at the different levels that we talk about, so it all starts by having a clear cut strategy at the organization level, and that might be within some portfolio. Then your portfolio gets divided into various programs and within program, you will find different projects. So ultimately, it is a set or it is basically a collection of projects and these projects are basically segregated under the common goal under that portfolio that we talk about. So that's nothing but your program. So therefore the correct answer is a program is a collection of projects which have common resources. Let's move ahead to the next question. Which of the following comprises the project life cycle? So we discussed about project life cycle which comprises of various phases. I'm sure you will agree that here the answer is phases. The project life cycle and product life cycle is different. Within a product life cycle, you may be doing various projects. There are multiple projects that are involved. And to launch that product, you may have undertaken a project. Because as we saw in the definition of the project, by the end of the project, what we get is a product or service or some outcome that we get. So definitely we undertake a project in order to produce a product, but the product life cycle is different altogether. It's pretty longer life cycle and you may undertake various projects within a life cycle of a product, but project life cycle will have various phases. Phases like if you take example of software delivery life cycle, then you would agree that we start with initiation, then we start gathering requirements, then we analyze those requirements, we design them, we build them, we test them, and then we deploy. So there are various phases that are involved as a part of the project life cycle. Milestones are going to be part of the various phases. By the end of the phase, we achieve some milestone. And estimation is, is one of the activities that we perform when we break down our scope item into various activities and we estimate that activity in terms of duration, in terms of cost, and then that actually helps us in determining overall budget for the project and for that matter the duration as well and activities as we just discussed the phase can get split into various activities as we go on performing them all right so a project life cycle will have various phases into it let's move to the next question being the project manager of the abc project you have allowed subsequent project phase to begin even before the predecessor phase completes which of the following relates to this scenario now there are concepts like crashing and fast tracking while working on the project we have to take certain corrective decisions and certain preventive decisions so one of the decisions that we take considering the way progress has been going on on the project of course by analyzing various metric we take decisions like let's fast track the project or crash the project so when we say fast track we actually start activities in parallel and when we say crashing, we actually put more resources to the activity so that we can complete that activity fast. But of course, crashing has its own disadvantage and it actually increases a lot of project risk. Plus, most importantly, since in crashing, you're actually putting more resources, that means there is more cost involved. So apart from risk, the cost involvement is also on a higher side. And therefore, usually on the project, people go for fast tracking. So that's what exactly is mentioned in this scenario. 
So this covers the fast tracking scenario. Of course, risk management is definitely nowhere near and tandem scheduling is given just sometimes to confuse the uh, participants. So the correct answer is fast tracking. Moving to the next question then, the person or group providing the resources and support for the project, program or portfolio and is also responsible for enabling success is called as who is that person who is really involved into so many such activity is it the project manager but if you see project manager may not be involved at a portfolio level or may not be involved at a program level what about senior manager senior manager is just the designation right is that really the role that we are talking about here or is that really a, a person that we are talking about here what about the sponsor and the clients there are two other options that are given but if you see from the project point of view the appropriate answer here is the sponsor because sponsor is the one who is actually going to provide you all the resources and support that is required sponsor is the one who actually gives you the project charter and thereby empowers you to use the resources on the project and therefore it's the sponsor who is ultimately the one who is going to provide the resources and support for project program and portfolio the next question is which of the following cannot be the part of group activity techniques now there are various group activity techniques that are conducted and i'm sure some of you can recall the ones that we covered as a part of this training like brainstorming affinity diagram nominal group technique you may have already been a part of some brainstorming session so brainstorming session could be done to solve a problem or think creatively come up with various ideas etc and once we have list of ideas then what we do essentially we use affinity diagram right we just try to group the ideas whichever the ideas which belong to a particular category we try to group them by creating the affinity diagram nominal group technique builds on that a nominal group technique actually helps us in involving participants with more and getting votes from the participant in order to shortlist the best possible idea so these three things are definitely going hand in hand with the group creativity technique but one thing looks to be completely odd here which is vendor bid analysis and therefore it's very clear now that if this question if you read sometimes this question could be very confusing because i have seen people do not read it clearly and we might just miss that word not so if you read it carefully it says which of the following cannot be the part of the group activity technique so some of these questions are very tricky because i have seen sometimes if you miss that not then you may answer it strongly and because we're talking about here which is not a part of the group activity technique and that's now very clear after our discussion that it's the vendor bid analysis moving from here we'll go to another scenario based question being the project manager of the thermal power plant project you need to manage the construction of an administrative unit building which of the following technique will you use to quickly estimate and decide the use of historic estimate and expert judgment if you recall the estimation techniques that we had gone through we had gone through several estimation techniques like bottom up estimation or the pert formula etc another examples which are mentioned here on the screen like analogous estimation parametric historical expert judgment analogous estimation talks about basically building on the historical information that you already have in the organization maybe as a part of the organizational process assets every organization will have their process assets as a part of that they build a lot of information within the organization which is very useful when we do the estimation now expert judgment is asking some of the smes some experts about their opinion in terms of the estimation historical estimation we again compare it with the historical information about the project that is available similar kind of a project similar complexity similar size etc parametric estimation here is what we talk about the various parameters which are units and then we try to understand the number of units that are required like in software for example i've seen people using various levels of skill at a expert level in the team member for example if i have got expert skill so how long that expert skill member takes to code a particular complexity of the code so we divide a code complexity to low medium and high and we've got a different levels of skill levels right so these are the various parameters i'm taking into consideration and based on that i'm estimating how long would it take for that developer to complete the coding activity all right similarly analogous estimation this is where we factor in couple of things what is of course historical information that is available in the organization on the top of that we ask experts why do we ask expert because that historical information may not be enough to come up with a very clear estimation of course analogous estimation itself is a high level estimation and it's very useful when we have to go back to the client with some number and uh, in order to be bit better in terms of what we are estimating in analogous estimation what we do is historical estimation and the expert judgment is in a way combined 
So we try to gather information of the similar kind of a project that is done in the past and we also take opinion from the expert. So we combine that and uh, then we go back to the client with the estimation. So therefore the answer is the analog's estimation. Let's move on to the next question then. This question is about what is the acceptable range used for determining the realistic activity cost estimation? Now we are talking about cost estimation here and that is to at the activity level. So if you take a look at various techniques that we covered, one of the techniques that we saw was uh, the PERT technique that I mentioned to you. So which is done at an activity level and for each of the activities we try to understand the estimation based on the PERT formula which covers about your most likely estimation your optimistic estimation your pessimistic estimation and then you put it in a formula and then you kind of estimate it so in terms of level of accuracy because it's a bottom-up approach we are doing the activity level cost estimation definitely we are talking about getting a better level of accuracy here Right. So the answer is definitely the level of accuracy is what we try to arrive at when we try to understand the acceptable range used for determining the realistic activity cost estimate because we take into consideration optimistic, pessimistic, various such options. This is just one example if you are using a port or even there are other options that I have seen. For example, ballpark estimation or rough order of magnitude. So the range of estimation is very high. So that means we are just trying to find here the level of accuracy. It's not about the precision. So precision will come when we try to round up the estimation and that's where the precision will come in. So it's the level of accuracy is the right answer over here. Let's now take one example and try to solve that. So this question is about calculating the schedule performance index. So this question is what is the schedule performance index of a software development project where earned value is $6,000 Planned value is $5,000 and actual cost is $4,000. So to solve this, what we'll do is we'll take a quick look at the numbers and we'll of course use the formula just so that we can do it quickly. I have copied that entire question over here in the Excel sheet so that we can calculate it. And uh, what I would suggest is when you will actually do it in the examination, I would suggest to one thing when you enter into exam and when you will get the blank sheet of paper, the first thing that you will be doing is try to translate whatever you will remember all the formulas that you remember on that piece of paper and keep it ready so that during the sums when you actually solve these various examples then you should not struggle to recall the formula all right so let's presume that you have already jotted down all the formulas like this okay so all the key formula you have already jotted down something like this or it's like present value or for that matter various estimation formula like PERT or standard deviation variance etc or for that matter the other formula which will have be helpful to you in calculating the earned value analysis cost variance skill variance right or estimated completion estimate to complete so all these some of the key formulas that we are talking about variance at completion schedule performance index cost performance index sometimes there could be a question on tcpi which is to complete performance index Again, we need to understand which approach should I be using? Is it based on the estimate at completion or is it based on the budget at completion? So accordingly, we have to use the formula. Similarly, for total float, what is the formula? Communication channels, you can expect uh, one question on communication channels. Likewise, these are some of the key formulas which uh, are expected to be written down when you reach there. The first thing that you'll be doing is that you'll be actually putting these formulas down on a piece of paper so that uh, these formulas will be ready when you will try to solve the questions. So uh, this is the question where we are trying to calculate the SPI, which is scheduled performance index of a software development project. Now I just refer to this sheet where I have jotted down all the formulas and I pick up the formula which is required for uh, scheduled performance index, which is earned value divided by planned value. That means to get the scheduled performance index, I need to have earned value. I need to have planned value. So I first check into the question do I have these two values to calculate SPI so when I take a look at the question I see here this is pretty straightforward question that way so I have got earned value which is six thousand dollar and I have planned value which is five thousand dollar so that means calculating SPI will become just a straightforward affair so what do I do I just divide earned value by planned value so I get 1.2 so SPI of 1.2 that means my planned value my earned value is more than the planned value which is definitely a good situation to have. SPI and CPI, which is cost performance index and scheduled performance index should be more than one. If it is more than one, then it is good. That means we are ahead of schedule. So the answer to this question is 1.2 and we are ahead of schedule, which is definitely a good situation to be in when we are working on the project. 
So with that quick example, let's move on to some other topic now. The question on costing. The question is cost baseline is the output of which of the following. So there are various processes that we have to work through when we work on the PMP certification preparation. And just to let you know, just so that you know you would agree in terms of the number of processes that we have to understand and go through. So we have got various such processes, right? So we have process groups like initiating, planning, executing, monitoring and controlling, closing, and we have knowledge areas. There are 10 of them, starting with integration management to the stakeholder management. And a total of 49 processes within these process groups and the knowledge areas. So this particular question is referring to the cost baseline. So that means they should be a part of the cost management. So under cost management, if you take a look at, we have got certain processes that we have to work on, like plan cost management, estimate cost, determine budget, and control cost. These are the four processes which makes the project cost management. Now, what are the options given here? So cost baseline is output of what? So one is plan cost management. So plan cost management is the process in itself, right? So as we see here, plan cost management is one process option, which is fine. Second is estimate cost. Estimate cost is another option that is there. Determine budget, okay? That's another process. And control cost. That means the option contains all the four processes. So then confusion rises. Now, if you apply here logic, it's pretty straightforward that I'm talking here about cost baseline. So I will be doing baselining only when I will determine budget, which is based on the activity and the duration. If you remember, hence we are talking about cost here. So obviously we're talking about the money part. So we're talking about a cost estimation here based on the activities. So if you think logically, then obviously we don't do that as a part of the planning. So in plan cost management, we are just creating the plan. An estimate cost process will be focusing on estimating cost for each of the activities that we have divided our WBS into. Uh, determine budget. So control again, we don't do control part will not involve coming up with a cost baseline. So that means the, the option that I see correct here is determine budget. So I'll be able to work on the determined budget only when I have the cost for each of the activities and I just sum up them up the cost for each of the activities in order to determine budget and then I'll get cost baseline. So that means cost baseline output should come from determined budget. So that's how I look at it when I try to solve questions. So I hope that hint must have given you some idea about how we can go by. So we've got two options here. Either you know the exact answer or uh, we have to then go on eliminating the different options that are given. So if you just go on eliminating the options, then we arrive at the right option. So let's move on from there to the next question. The next question talks about, suppose you are the project manager on a thermal power plant project. How will you manage your team members if there is a difference in opinion over the design of turbine. So this is a thermal project and you're working on the design part. There are various options that are given. One is you will organize meeting to solve misunderstanding and agree on a common solution. Other is defer the decision to procure turbine components as much as possible because there is dispute. Copy the design of turbine from a similar past project. Procure the turbine parts from the nearest local vendor. Now, if you think logically again here, we are talking about the difference of opinion over design of turbine. So if I go by elimination, then obviously I can't just because there is a difference of opinion, I can't just go to some nearby vendor and procure it, right? Or if you take a look at copy the design of turbine from similar past project, just because of difference of opinion, I don't think I should be taking such extreme decision. Or defer the decision. Again, if you defer the decision, it's going to affect your schedule. It's going to affect your cost. And that is something which you will never like as a project manager. That means only relevant option here that I see is organize meeting to solve misunderstanding and agree to a common solution. And therefore, the best thing to do in such a scenario is confrontation. So we need to confront as a team. And constructive disagreements are good. Constructive disagreements only help us in arriving at the good solution. So when we confront to the disagreements of each other, I'm sure that it could be a consensus and you will see a common solution. You will see a common goal and collectively you might just uh, choose the best possible option out of the discussion and move ahead. The next question talks about if you find that an activity in your project is very risky, how will you estimate the duration of this activity when your team member has given the optimistic, most likely and pessimistic duration for the activity? So if you remember, I told you about the PERT formula. So PERT formula is all about determining the 
by taking into consideration the various uh, estimations so we talk about pessimistic optimistic and we talk about most likely so let's take a look at these formulas so there are a couple of formulas here from the put so one is of course the triangular distribution and the another is beta distribution so generally we use beta if in case it's not specifically mentioned so as per the beta distribution what we talk about is so we have pessimistic optimistic and most likely so formula is like this so we have pessimistic plus 4 into most likely plus optimistic divided by 6 so this is the port formula that i'll be using for each of the activities and then i just go on adding them up in order to get project duration since we're talking about duration here so that means i'm going to use the port formula here very clearly so this is pretty straightforward don't get into complications or don't get into any kind of a confusion here so if you remember the port formula you should be able to very straightforward answer this question so let's then move on to the next question here this is based on some other topic which we haven't touched yet so this talk about leadership theories etc which among the following is not valid according to McGregor's theory X. So if you remember our discussion about the various leadership theories, one of the theory that we covered as a part of this training was McGregor's theory X. So which focuses on few things. It focuses on employee self-motivation. And if you recall that discussion, so we have got theory X and we have theory Y. So if you talk about these two things here, you will agree that we are talking about the employee self motivation as a part of theory X. So again, this is pretty straightforward. And if you just recall some of the key points under the McGregor's theory, you should be able to answer this question very, very clearly. So here, the option, last option is the correct option. The theory X will talk about employee are self motivated. So if you take a look at McGregor's theory, in fact, let me just take a look at this. Some of the examples we have already taken as a part of this training, and some examples will be taking up as we go ahead all right so if you talk about the various theories that we covered as a part of the training you would agree that one of the theory that we spoke on is mcgregor's theory x so just recall the discussion that we had and uh, try to remember it by some techniques that what theory x talks about some of the key points and then that should certainly be able to help you in answering it i have seen that usually on the leadership theories the questions are very very straightforward the next question talks about you are the project manager on a software development project your cpi drops to 0.93 when one of your key developers suddenly fall ill to make up for your affected work you have decided to outsource it to a vendor what will be the most appropriate contract type in this case so if you talk about different contract types under the procurement knowledge area that we covered you'll realize that first of all you have to understand the fact the cpi is below one that means your cost performance index is not doing good you are actually utilizing more money than budgeted as simple as that so in this scenario which contract type will help you in order to make sure that you're controlling your cost so retainage is not certainly a contract type as such so retainage is uh, definitely so retainage is all about just retaining money so if you are the buyer and you're dealing with the seller so what typically happens as a buyer we retain some amount at times we do just don't pay everything upfront just so that as per the contract whatever is agreed the the seller will uh, perform that work and for that we don't release all the money so we retain some part of the money it's just the part of the contract it's not the contract in itself really the other option here which is given is fpepa so what is fpepa is another contract type so this talks about one of the contract that uh, we covered even as a part of the thing and uh, this particular contract we talk about the fixed price with economic price adjustment contract so in this particular contract, we talk about paying the fixed price and then adjusting the price based on the economic changes that are happening. So here, I don't think so this could be applicable if you agree with me because you are in a scenario wherein you need something very, very quickly. The last option is definitely not a contract, which is letter of intent, which is not a contract. So the only option that is option which is applicable here is cost reimbursable contract. And I'm sure you'll agree that cost reimbursable contract is the one which will help you in uh, working through this particular scenario because you're already spending more than the budgeted cost considering the current CPI. Moving from there, let's take a look at another scenario here. The next question is, who among the following said people will be interested in their safety needs only after their physiological needs have been fulfilled? So I think this thing you must have also learned if some of you have done MBAs, you must have learned about different theories. Even I've seen some of these theories are covered these days as a part of different leadership training programs. So you must have heard about this needs theory. The different levels of needs that we talk about physiological needs 
and then we ultimately talk about the need which will fulfill the nirvana stage wherein all, everything is kind of fulfilled so different levels of need and if you recall that's called as maslow's theory of needs hierarchy so there are various hierarchy of needs which are basically explained in this theory if you talk about macgregor so macgregor we just spoke about theory x and y so it's not related hensburg theory again talks about completely something else oichi is not really covered as part of uh, is, is i don't think so is going to be covered under any of the theories typically that we covered under pmp so the only thing that is left is maslow's needs of hierarchy theory so that's how we can go by the rejection of choices in order to arrive at the most appropriate option so moving from there let's take a look at another question here so this question talks about wbs is an excellent and most effective tool that is used for tracking how do we track really through wbs so do we track the resources i don't think so do we track the schedule wbs will not help in tracking schedule as such wbs can help you in determining schedule once we do the estimation etc what about uh, project risk i don't think so in tracking risk it will help you so the only option that is left is the scope so wbs will help you in coming up with the project scope so one of the thing that we make sure is that wbs contains only the scope item to be worked upon in that project and that is very very important so in a way it's kind of a traceability we make make sure that uh, whatever is in w wbs is delivered by the end of the project so that means your requirement specification document should be translated into wbs very very clearly because that's ultimately going to be the final scope which is factored in or considered in the project the another question talks about the organizational structure the question is the best project organization structure for a small but highly technical project will be which one so here we are talking about a small technical project a small organization which one would be better so if you remember if you remember the various structures that we had gone through like for example just to give you a very quick idea about the kind of structures that we had gone through as you can see here so we talk about the functional organization then we talk about uh, other organizations like weak matrix we talk about balanced matrix we covered about even the strong matrix organizations and uh, for that matter the projectized organization the structure is based on the projects and the staff is aligned to the project likewise the other structure that we covered was the composite organization so this is like mixture here as you can see the composite of both so we have project manager as well as we have staff here but uh, it's also project managers function itself is different so even this kind of structure we have covered as a part of this training so if you take a look at which one would be more suitable for this kind of environment the situation is the organization is small and it's highly technical project so because it's a technical project so if you take a look at the functional structure would be more suitable to this kind of organization because we're talking about arranging people with the different functions so we can have developer we can have so people who are working in designing people who are working in requirement so with a specific function in which the people are working in 
we can organize the organization so the correct option here is the functional structure because we're talking about the technical project we're talking about the expertise here and then of course once you have a functional structure then you can still execute the project right and we discussed about that how to go about doing it so from there now we'll move to the another question this is a scenario based question now in the examination you'll be asked a scenario based question straightforward question and of course there will be examples to solve as well so what we are taking here as a part of this session is combination of all this being a project manager is you need to manage a project where there will be a number of persons working together if you want to enhance the ability of team to work together and perform as a team which of the following things you would need to do maximum the ability of the team so you're talking about here team working together so in order to enhance the ability of the team to work together or maybe the high performance team or maybe the team which is able to deliver the better outcome so for that i'm sure you will agree that the collocation is the best option because work breakdown structure has nothing to do with the ability of the team here staffing plan is just about plan but we are expecting action over here cohabitation is too extreme i don't think so we need to get into that so here the straightforward answer is collocation when people when the team member are collocated sitting together talking to each other they'll be able to establish good rapport good bonding and they'll be able to start performing as a team they'll be able to go through the team formation phases of forming storming norming performing and finally adjourning so those techman's team formation phases they could able to go through and uh, the ability of the team could be then developed faster let's move to the next question what is the role of the change control board so one of the process that we talk about is the change control process and as a part of that there is a change control board which needs to be established so let's go through the options the first option talks about assessing the impact of the change on project objectives second is defining requirements for the customer doing performance appraisal for team members involved in implementing change encouraging team members to raise more change requests i think this is pretty straightforward i am sure you'll agree that change control board will be involved into assessing impact of change on the project objectives and that's the primary responsibility of the change control board they will understand the impact on cost impact on schedule impact on architecture impact on design impact on the other aspect of the project and based on that the decision will be made whether to accept that change or reject now let's take a look at the another question here this talks about being the project manager on a stp project you decide to respond to a identified risk by contracting out work which of the following will lead to the minimum risk of buyer now here we are talking about different contracts if you talk about various contracts you will agree that we have various contracts like let's take a look at some of the contracts that we covered as a part of this training and even for that matter from the risk point of view which contract will pose more risk so we have a buyer and and we have a seller so from the buyer point of view which now here the question is from the buyer point, point of view so if you are a buyer then which contract will pose more risk so as a buyer you'll find that risk is low here and risk is very very high when you go ahead so here if you read the question again you will realize being the project manager on a stp project you decide to respond to an identified risk by contracting out which of the following will lead to the minimum risk of buyer so if you see the minimum risk on buyer is going to be the firm fixed price contract there are other contracts also which we covered right cost plus percentage of cost or cost plus fixed fee or cost plus incentive fees but if there is a fixed fee or fixed price then obviously on the buyer the risk is very very low because risk is actually borne by the seller by developing whatever is the scope item within that fixed price so that's how you can look at this question so firm fixed price is the right answer here next question is for which process the stakeholder engagement assessment matrix is prepared as a part so which process will involve the stakeholder assessment matrix here there are various options the first is identify stakeholder second is manage stakeholder engagement third is control stakeholder engagement third is, and the last is plan stakeholder management now we are talking about here the stakeholder engagement assessment matrix so as a part of this if you see this can't be done during the first which is identify stakeholder this can't be done when we are managing the stakeholder it has to be ready before that this can't be done as a part of control again it has to be ready before that so the best way to develop that is during planning 
So when we are planning the stakeholder management, that time we should come up with the stakeholder engagement assessment metrics, right? So this assessment metrics will help me in identifying the as is state of a stakeholder, and then I can come up with the to be stage. So as is stage of the stakeholder could be he is resistant, he is not really pro change, and then I have to move from the resistant state to the state where he can start cooperating, he can start responding. He can start engaged. He can start involving in the project. So this particular assessment metric needs to be prepared as a part of the planning, the stakeholder management itself. So the correct answer is plan stakeholder management. Next question talks about being a project manager. You need to spend a significant amount of time in communications. Which of the following option contains the three basic elements of a communication model? Now think from the communication point of view. Another easy question to score. We have options like verbal, non-verbal, written. The another option is sender, receiver, message. Next is text, drawing, picture. The last is manager, worker, instruction. So obviously, as a project manager, if you talk about, I'm sure the last two options you can still easily eliminate. Out of the next two options, if we talk about here the communication mode. So when you talk about communication mode, we are talking about the sender. A receiver and the message so coding encoding and the actual message which is transmitted so we've already covered this as a part of the communication management itself so send the receiver and the message is the right answer over here next question is suppose you are assigned as the project manager of a 30 month project which is in the executing phase what will be the best way to resolve a conflict among the technical experts in your team so this question basically and focuses on the conflict resolution techniques, etc. So various options are there. You are resolving the conflict. The options are find the root cause of the disagreement, resolve the conflict in favor of the senior most technical expert, hire an external consultant to enforce this decision, remove this technical work from the scope of the project work. So I think some of the options we can easily eliminate, right? We can't remove the scope of the work. So that option has gone. Can we hire an external consultant for this really? I mean, people will not trust the external consultant to solve the conflict. So obviously that option is kind of ruled out. What about uh, resolving conflict in favor of technical expert? That's against the values of the organization and for that matter, the team and, you know, in general as well. So the only option that is left then to find the root cause of the disagreement and confront it. As we mentioned earlier, confrontation is the best technique to solve conflict and disagreements. Moving to the next question. What should be your primary concern while adding resources to your project? Now, when we, when we add resources to the project, obviously I need to understand its impact. So let's take a look at the options. The first option is effect of adding resources on project end date. So this takes care of only schedule. Second option is effect of adding resources on S curve. S curve is the cost curve, which we covered as a part of the cost management. The next option is effect of adding resources on RAM, which is the resource assignment metrics that we talk about and effect of adding resources on cost and schedule so if you take a look at when we add any resources now please understand from the pimbok 6 edition point of view resources are not just about people it's about any resources that are used on the project so it's going to be even the material resources machineries all of that and not just people so when we add resources the first thing that we need to take into consideration is how that resource is going to impact my cost how that resource is going to impact my schedule so that means the option which is correct is the last option here let's move to the next question if john is working with his team to decide the degree to which cost estimate should be rounded up or down then he is working to establish which of the following units of measure level of precision level of accuracy and controls threshold so if you remember i did mention this earlier when we were talking about the estimation range so that time I mentioned if we are doing the rounding off, we are talking about the precision because we are trying to be precise by doing the rounding off of the estimation. So this is again pretty straightforward. If you know the definition of precision and the accuracy, then you should be able to get this correct. So maybe try and read and understand the difference between precision and accuracy. Let's move to the next question then. Being a project manager, how will you deal with a stakeholder who has high power and high interest? So if you remember the stakeholder matrix, we prepare various stakeholder metric from the stakeholders point of view. You will agree that 
we take into consideration few things like we take into consideration power to interest we take into consideration interest to power so here we are talking about a stakeholder which has got high power and high interest so if you talk about power and interest and both are high that means we need to manage these stakeholders effectively so if you see the options here do i need to keep them satisfied or do i need to just keep them informed or monitor no because we are talking about a stakeholder with high power and high interest that means i need to manage the stakeholder closely so that's the right answer here next question is while estimating the cost of work in a very new technology being a project manager which of the following will concern you the most if you take a look at some of these options you are new to the technology and you are trying to estimate how long would it take so what will concern you the most first is of course lack of quality of policy i don't think so that's relevant really lack of communication management plan again doesn't seems to be relevant from estimation point of view internet connection not reliable all right so that's completely outlier here lack of historical information i agree the lack of historical information because uh, if i'm working on something which is completely new to me i rely on the organizational process assets and if there is similar kind of a project done in the past i might just use analogous estimation and based on that quickly estimate about the project let's take a example now a different question where we'll try to solve some example the example is like this a road project was planned to be completed in 8 month calculate the schedule variance when the earned value information at the end of 6 month is given as the budgeted completion which is $8000 actual cost was $12000 percentage completion was 100% now this is interesting let's try to solve this particular uh, example so i have already copied that into this excel sheet so that we'll be able to do the calculation now if you take a look at this we are trying to solve here what are we trying to solve here we are trying to identify the schedule variance so the first thing that i will do is i will refer to my list of formulas that i have written and try to come up with what is the formula for schedule variance the so schedule variance is earned value minus planned value right so what is earned value earned value is nothing but what is my actual completion percentage to the budgeted completion so my planned budget is here Eight thousand dollar, and what is my actual completion? Hundred percent. That means my earned value. Can I say that my earned value and actual completion is hundred percent? That means that my earned value is equal to BAC. So BAC is equal to my earned value. The another option is planned value. So how can I calculate my planned value? The planned value was planned completion percentage. So my planned completion percentage. How would I calculate that? so i supposed to complete this project in 8 months however i did it in just 6 months that means as per my original plan i supposed to be completing 75% of the project by now so 75% of the bac comes to 6000 so can i say that is my planned value 6000 so now i have got my planned value which is 6000 and i have got my earned value which is my budget at completion because i have completed the project 100% so i earned the value there so 8000 minus 6000 is 2000 so 2000 is my schedule variance so this is how i can calculate the schedule variance of in this scenario let's take another example what will be incentive amount for a contractor who is working on a cost plus incentive fee contract the project's target cost is $5000 with a target fee of $800 minimum fee is $500 and the maximum fee is $1000 also the buyer seller share ratio is 80 20 with an actual cost of $6000 so this is the number now if you recall the formula so again you will make sure that you will write down the formula in the beginning itself so that you would have the formula at least ready so what we are talking about here is calculating the incentive so this particular contract take a look at this contract this is cost plus incentive fee contract now in this particular contract what do we do so we have a buyer and a seller so buyer will get into this contract with the seller and the buyer will reimburse the cost to the seller whatever the actual cost that is involved on the top of that some incentives are paid now there are chances that seller might just take the advantage of this so in order to ensure that this contract is balanced up and to make sure that the project cost is controlled at the same time project is also completed within time or ahead of time there are certain elements that are attached to this and those elements are nothing but either we pay the incentives or we penalize the seller or at the same time if we complete the work ahead of schedule then we of course also pay the incentives so how the incentive calculation is done 
let's take a look at this so before that you must have realized here there are certain numbers already given so target cost is given target fee is given let's take a look at some of these numbers what are they basically so if you talk about sharing ratio 80 20 sharing ratio the sharing ratio is buyer to seller so 80 percent is for buyer 20 percent is for the seller it's always buyer to seller ratio remember that so this is how the ratio is shared between buyer and a seller target cost is the expected cost so how much the project would cost so that's the expected cost of the project target fees again the expected fees that the seller will get so seller is primary working to get the fee in doing the project plus there is expectation of an incentive fee now what is the maximum fee this is basically the maximum incentive the seller can expect to get of course it's going to be associated with the performance and the sharing ratio which is 80 20 in this case minimum fee is of course the minimum incentive fees the seller will get for meeting the requirements set in the contract and there is of course a formula which we just now covered so formula talks about so we have all these numbers so we have target cost we have target fee we have minimum fee maximum fee and we have got a buyer seller ratio as well as the actual cost so to calculate incentive what we have basically the formula is target cost minus actual cost into sellers sharing ratio to calculate the incentives what do we do so i have got a target cost which is 5000 and my actual cost is 6000 which is not a good scenario if you see what is my target cost the project is going to cost me 5000 that was expected in the beginning but what is actual cost actually it costed 6000 and if i minus this i'm getting of course minus thousand dollar and on the top of that the seller ratio is 20 percent what i get as a part of incentive is minus 200 in this case so the answer to this question is minus 200 because uh, my actual cost is more than the cost of the expected cost that i've put in the beginning of the contract now you could go ahead and try to arrive at the final fee also for for doing that you can just add the target fee so target fee which is 800 so if you add that then you can give final fee of 600 or you can also come up with a final reimbursed cost how much would it be so from the contract point of view i will have to give seller the actual cost plus the incentive fee the final incentive fee actually incentives are minus 200 dollars but the final incentives are coming to 600 by adding the target fee so that's 600 plus i have to pay the actual cost that means the final reimbursement cost will be 6600 dollar but the incentives are actually minus 200 so that's how i look at things in this case so what is important here is understanding these terms and of course you need to have the formula handy so that you can solve this question moving from there to the next question this question is about which of the following resource histogram shows but a responsibility assignment matrix does not so if you talk about resource histogram and the responsibility assignment matrix so there are a few options that are given here but the correct answer is time because you'll find that the responsibility assignment matrix will not cover up the time it will talk about activities its interrelationships and uh, whom that activity is assigned to the histogram will talk about the time so that's the difference you'll find here moving to the next question which of the following is used to display sensitivity analysis now when you do the sensitivity analysis we need to do this we, when we work on the project risks etc so when we do the sensitivity analysis one of the thing that we use is a tornado diagram and tornado diagram actually helps us in doing the sensitivity analysis so when we do the tornado diagram that is more relevant i'm just going to give you a brief idea about this one so when you work on the risk one of the diagrams or one of the thing that we work on is the tornado diagram so if you compare the other options the more relevant is the tornado but you could get confused with the sensitivity diagram there is nothing like a sensitivity diagram as such that we draw here data flow are definitely not relevant because data flow diagram objective is different altogether that's not for sensitivity decision tree is again the objective is different so those two options are ruled out very clearly there could be a confusion between sensitivity diagram and a tornado diagram but sensitivity diagram as i mentioned there is nothing like a sensitivity diagram as such so the only correct option is tornado diagram here when we do the sensitivity analysis so you can read more on this and we did cover this as part of training as well let's take another example here to solve this example helps in calculating spi now if you take this example a bit closely you'll find that what all things are given here so if spi is 0.75 cpi is 0.8 that means you are actually spending more money than budgeted and you're also behind the schedule on this project then which of the following report is correct so schedule variance cost variance tcpi now if you take a look at schedule variance example cost variance example the one option is to calculate schedule variance 
cost variance, right? So we, we need to also take a look at whether we have enough information or not. So SPI is nothing but earned value divided by the planned value. The CPI is nothing but earned value divided by the actual cost. So you can put them into these formulas and try and calculate that. And the TCPI is another option over here. But if you take a look at the example of the TCPI, we might not have everything to calculate the TCPI. I have already told you about TCPI. So there are two options to calculate that. So based on the BAC and based on the estimated completion. But here we are talking about not having enough data. And therefore, the option is the last one, which is the project is likely need more money than planned to complete. So as I mentioned, considering this particular progress, definitely project needs more money because none of these outputs will be correct when you will calculate it actually. All right, so sometimes you'll find this kind of a confusing option that are given. And uh, if you don't get your calculations right, sometimes those calculations are not relevant, not, not required. Sometimes enough information is not given in the example itself in order to calculate some of these uh, variances. So in that scenario, we need to apply our mind and see what else is it there. Let's move to the next question then. According to Pimbok, project management process are organized into which of the following order of process groups? So I had taken you through the process groups already. So I'm sure you must have been very clear now. The answer is the third one. We talk about initiating, planning, executing, monitoring and controlling and closing. So I did cover the process group, processes and the knowledge areas. So you can relate to that. The other things are very clear cut, the ones that we need to eliminate. So such a questions, you should get it right in order to score in the exam. We can't afford to miss on these questions actually. Let's move on then. Which of the following statements is true regarding negative float? So we have positive float, we have negative float. So we talk about negative float, that means of course we are, as you can see float is that much of time we get to complete the activity, extra time that we get. But we're talking about negative float, that means we are actually behind the time here. So if we are behind the time, so let's see what options would then be best suitable here. The first is the project manager should try to recover negative float by crashing or fast track. Next is there cannot be any negative float in the project. The project manager should try to remove negative float by reducing scope. It is desirable to have negative float in the project. So some of these couple of options cannot have a float or desirable that can be ruled out very clearly here. And project managers should try to remove negative float by reducing scope. Again, we can't reduce scope. The project manager doesn't have authority to remove scope. So the only option that is available here is the crashing and fast tracking. So if you remember, we discussed about crashing and fast tracking. So fast tracking is where we actually start working parallelly and crashing is where we put more resources. So since we are talking about negative float, we are actually behind the schedule. That means we should crash the project or fast track in order to move faster on the project. Let's move to the next question. Which of the following represent a set of conditions that should be satisfied before deliverables are accepted? I'm sure this question you should again get it very right. We're talking about fulfilling the set of conditions before we deploy or before we deliver to the customer. So first, of course, deliverable list, which doesn't talk about the setup condition as such. Test plan has nothing to do with it. Punch list, again, is completely different outlier here in terms of the options that are given. So in terms of setup conditions to be fulfilled before we deliver is the acceptance criteria. And hence, that's the correct answer. So that's how we can go by eliminating the incorrect options in order to arrive at the right answer. If you know straightforward, then you can save time and straightforward you can select and move ahead. Let's move on to the next question then. How will a Pareto chart will help in project with lot of identified action items? Now, if you remember Pareto chart, it covers about 80-20 rule. So as we say that 20% reasons are responsible for 80% problems. So if you know those 20% reasons, then that will definitely help you. For what? Understand the trend of deviations. Again, I see that completely different reason. Prioritization, complete all activities on time, identify root cause. So identify root cause is definitely one thing. Another thing is the prioritization. But here we're talking about identified actions. Pareto charts are also used for identifying root cause, but we're not talking about here problems. We're talking about here, we have list of actions that are identified. So that means the correct answer is prioritization. So if we have list of actions that are identified, that means what is more relevant now is to prioritize these actions so that we can perform and we can uh, get started with it. Let's move to the next question then. 
the activity relationship between the start of cleaning and start of digging is represented by which of the following so we have various activity relationships let's take a quick look at some of these activity relationships how do they look like we did cover this as a part of training i'm sure you'll recall it but just so that we can just for this particular question if you take a look at the activity relationships we have finished to start okay so here we can talk about finish to start so unless we finish the first activity we can't start the second one so here we have finished to finish activity so we can finish the first and we can also finish the second activity here we have got the start to finish right so you can start working on the first activity you can start the second activity before we finish the second one and uh, the another one is start to start so we can actually start both activities together so if you take a look at this cleaning and digging it's pretty straightforward now all right so we can certainly think of start to start relationships over here let's talk about schedule variance schedule variance is what i think we did cover this multiple times so schedule variance is this always affect the cost variance never affects cost variance a negative value means that project will likely to be delayed now we'll talk about variance a positive value means that the project will likely to be delayed so if you talk about schedule variance it covers about the earned value minus the planned value so if the planned value is more than the earned value is less that means you're negative so that means you're behind the schedule so negative value means that the project will likely to be delayed is the right answer here if you take a look at some of these options so if you know the formula you can certainly arrive at the right option that means okay let's move on to the next question you are currently working as project manager in reality logistics you have been given responsibility for moving infrastructure of abc software limited to a new location for that you need to identify the stakeholders of your project based on the power interest grid that you have created which of the following types of stakeholders expectation should be managed closely now we did cover this earlier as well if you remember the stakeholder matrix we spoke about we need to manage closely those stakeholders who have got high power and high interest so you can recall that and you should be able to then answer this question very clearly moving to the next question then what is the company wide policy which mandates all project quality known as if you talk about company wide policy you know iso 9000 is not a company wide policy or quality planning is an you know we talk about planning the quality in the project quality control is again something which we do at a project level but when we talk about quality policy that is at the organization level so you will find here clear cut difference between the company wide policy and something that is done at a project level or something that is just the generic standard like iso so quality policy is definitely at a company wide level next question is which one of the following describes the difference between a standard and a deviation accurately we are talking about here standards and a deviation accurately so standards are optional but regulations are not so we are talking about here difference between regulation and the standards standards are mandatory but regulations are not regulations are mandatory but standards may be seen as guidelines regulations and standards are essentially the same so in this question we are essentially talking about standards and the regulations now standards if you talk about standards i don't think so standards are mandatory no it's always good to follow standards therefore you must have seen examples like cmmi standards so your company is mmi level 5 or level 3 or level 4 that is something which is done voluntarily it's good to follow or we follow coding standards good to do or we follow the different standards like iso standards which are good to do but what about regulations i don't think so it's something which is mandatory if you're working in banking there are certain regulations like sox compliance or bcbs regulations if you are in uh, healthcare there are certain regulations that are uh, to be followed as part of the healthcare if you are in insurance there are certain regulations that are needs to be followed from irda point of view etc so that means regulations are mandatory but standards are not mandatory that's pretty clear here let's move on to another setup example here what will be the bac which is budget at completion of your project if it has a cpi cost performance index of 0.80 and uh, estimated completion of the number that is given okay so that's in dollar so uh, let's talk about this particular example so what i have done basically is that i have copied this example here so that we can calculate it so we are talking about here the budget at completion so for budget at completion what can we do so bac so we have few numbers here very clearly 
So we have got the CPI of 0.8 and we have got the EAC as well. So when we calculate the budget at completion, what you have to do is I just have to multiply 0.8 by the EAC, which is estimated completion. And what I get is the budget at completion. So in this case, the budget at completion will come to the option, second option, right? So if you multiply 0.8 by the EAC, what you will get is the budget at completion. So if you remember that formula, then it's pretty straightforward for you to calculate the budget at completion. Let's move to the next question then. The best way of making an accurate forecasting of ETC, which is estimate to complete, is now this question we need to discuss a bit more in terms of the options that are given so we have got various options one is how can we arrive at estimate to complete so we have budget at completion which is planned at the beginning we can just minus whatever the cost that is incurred at that given point in time and whatever is remaining is your estimate to complete or we can have estimate at completion minus the actual cost or we can use the straightforward formula which is given in the last option so all these are based on the trends, you know, based on the actual cost and the trends. But in terms of getting accurate estimation, we can't just rely on the trend. So we have to also factor in various aspects and we can play around with those options. And therefore, the manual way of doing it will give you much accurate number here from ETC point of view. And therefore, that's the option here. Moving to the next question, how will you assess a situation where six observations are within the upper control limit and control line where the seventh observation is observed within upper control limit and control line so here i think it's pretty straightforward if you remember the control chart control chart is something that we covered as a part of this training and control charts talks about if anything is outlier anything is outside of the control limits then the process is out of control so we talk about the various causes here assignable causes or normal causes or rule of seven so some of those concepts are basically covered as a part of the control chart so this is something which is used even for the root cause analysis or uh, when we work on the problems etc even in six sigma process improvement also we use the control charts the other question is about some different topic which of the following can be used for trend analysis so we have control charts we have cause and effect diagram we have run charts and we have pareto so pareto we spoke about that's 80 20 used for identifying the root cause or prioritization etc cause and effect is used mainly for the root cause analysis control charts i just spoke about is used for uh, the uh, root cause analysis as well as for the process improvement etc now here we're talking about trend analysis so trend analysis then the only option is run charts run charts are the ones that are used for trend analysis for example what is the uh, server capacity utilization trend over the past six months okay so we can easily do the trend analysis based on the data that is gathered next question talks about in which of theory douglas mcgregor has defined two models of worker behavior and i'm sure you'll agree here that theory x and theory y is what we talk about so theory x and theory y which is defined by the uh, mcgregor's theory and i would like you to read about theory x and theory y in order to understand what is the belief of the theory X managers and what is the belief of the theory Y managers? Moving from there, something which we did cover a bit, what are the three eyes of stakeholder? So I did cover that when we were speaking about the stakeholder metrics. So we talk about interest, we talk about influence, we talk about impact. So very clearly, the option number two is correct here. Interest, influence, and impact. And based on that, we decide the response strategy in order to manage the stakeholders effectively. The next question talks about which of the following is the objective of conducting bidder conference. So when we conduct bidder conference, why do we do that? If you take a look at some of these options, it's like to make sure that all questions from potential sellers are answered privately. I don't think so we do that for uh, answering questions privately. It's a conference, so everybody is there, so that is ruled out. To make sure that potential sellers are treated as per the type of questions asked. So again, I don't, I don't see this is completely relevant at all. Okay, so this talks about something else completely. The last is to ensure that all parties get answers to their questions. So that is definitely good. But the other option is to make sure that all potential sellers are treated equally and have access to the same information. So sometimes the last option and the third option may look a bit close, but the third option talks about few other objectives and therefore that is the correct option here. Let's move to the next question then. 
What is the Japanese method of modern quality management called, which relies on continuing small improvements involving everyone from the top management to the lowest level of worker in the organization? Now, if you talk about Kanban, Kanban really talks about making things visible, big visible charts, making process explicit, all of that. So it's about signboards. It doesn't talk about the small improvements. If you talk about Deming cycle, which is PDCA, Plan, Do, Check, Act. So that's another uh, way altogether. And PDCA is nothing but Deming cycle only. So the only option that is left is the Kaizen. And Kaizen is nothing but the small improvements. Okay, so moving on then. Hensburg divided motivation factors into two classes. Satisfiers and dissatisfiers. Which of the following are example of satisfiers? So if you take a look at some of these options, you'll find that from Hensburg theory point of view, sense of personal achievement and work satisfaction is what will satisfy the workers more. It's not about plush office space or performance based salary. It's not about work satisfaction or fringe benefits. It's not about vacation time, assignment of personal staff assistance, etc. It's about the personal achievement and the work satisfaction as per Hensburg. So with this, I wish you all the best for your PMP certification examination and thank you for participating in the training. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!